Part 2. The War Mark. Chapter 11. War Council. Heil Troy was sure of one thing. Despite whatever Covenant said, the land was no dream. He perceived this with an acuteness which made his heart ache. In the real world, he had not been simply blind. He had been eyeless from birth. He lacked even the organs of sight which could have given him a conception of what vision was. Until the mysterious event which had snatched him from between opposing deaths and had dropped him on the sunlit grass of Trothgard, light and dark had been equally incomprehensible to him. He had not known that he lived in immitigable midnight. The tools with which he had handled his physical surroundings had been hearing and touch and language. His sense of ambience, his sensitivity to the auras of objects and the resonances of space, was translated by words until it became his sole measure of the concrete world. He had been a good strategist precisely because his perceptions of space and interacting force were pure, undistracted by any knowledge of day or night, or color, or brilliance, or illusion. Therefore, he could not be imagining the land. His former mind had not contained the raw materials out of which such dreams were made. When he appeared in the land, when Lord Elena taught him that the rush of sensations which confused him was sight, the experience was altogether new. It did not restore to him something that he had lost. It opened in front of him like an oracle. He knew that the land was real and he knew that its future hung by the thread of his strategy in this war. If he made a mistake, then more brightness and color than he could ever take into account were doomed. So, when Ruel, the blood guard assigned to watch over him, came to him in his quarters and informed him that a Raman main thrall had arrived from the plains of Ra, bringing word of Lord Fowl's army, Troy felt an instant of panic. It had begun, the test of all his training, planning, hopes. If he had believed Moram's tales of a creator, he would have dropped to his knees to pray. But he had never learned to rely on anyone but himself. The war ward and the strategy were his. He was in command. He paused just long enough to strap the traditional ebony sword of the war mark to his waist and don his headband. Then he followed Rule toward the close. As he moved, he was grateful for the brightness of the torches in the hallways. Even with their help, his sight was dim. In daylight, he could see clearly, with more grasp of detail and more distance than the far-eyed giants. The sun brought distant things close to him. At times he felt that he possessed more of the land than anyone else. But night restored his blindness, like an insistent reminder of where he had come from. When the sun was down, he was lost without torches or fires. Starlight did not touch his private darkness, and even a full moon cast no more than a grey smudge across his mind. Sometimes in the middle of the night, his sightlessness scared him like a repudiation of sunlight and vision. By force of habit, he adjusted his sunglasses. He had worn them for so long, out of consideration for the people with eyes who had to look at him, that they felt like a part of his face. But he never saw them. They had no effect on his vision. Nothing that came within six inches of his orbless sockets blocked his mental sight at all. To control his tension, he strode toward the close without hurrying. At one point, a group of hafts, the commanders of Eoward, saluted him, and then jogged ahead with their swords clattering. And later Lord Veerment came, hawk-like, down a broad staircase, and rushed past him. But he did not vary his step until he reached the high doors of the council chamber. There he found Quan waiting for him. The sight of the old stalwart hilt mark gave him a pang. In this dim light, Quan's thin white hair made him look frail. But he saluted Troy briskly and reported that all fifty hafts were now in the close. 
50. Troy recited the numbers to himself as if he were repeating a rite of command. 50 Eoward, 1,000 Eoman, a total of 21,050 warriors. First half Armourine, Hiltmark Quan, and himself. He nodded as if to assure Quan that they would be enough. Then he marched down into the close to take his seat at the Lord's table. Around him the chamber was almost filled, and most of the leaders were in their chairs. The space was so well lit that now he could see clearly. The High Lord sat with quiet intensity at the head of the table, and between her and him were Colandrill, Trevor, Loria, and Amatin, each keeping a private silence. But Troy knew them and could guess something of their thoughts. Lord Loria hoped, despite the demands of her lordship, that she and Trevor would not be chosen to leave Revelstone and her daughters, and her husband seemed to be remembering that he had fallen under the strain of fighting the ill in Dukau Wainhim, remembering and wondering if he had the strength for this war. About Elena, Troy did not speculate. Her beauty confused him. He did not want to think that something might happen to her in this war. Deliberately he kept his gaze away from her. On her left, beyond Moram's empty chair, was Lord Veerment and two more unoccupied seats, places for the Lord Shitra and Hiram. For a moment Troy paused to wonder how Korik's mission was doing. Four days after their departure, where it had been brought to Revelstone by some of the scouts, that they had passed into glimmered hoar forest. But after that, of course, Troy knew he could not expect to hear any more news until long days after the mission was over, for good or ill. In the privacy of his heart, he dreamed that sometime during the course of this war he would have the joy of seeing giants march to his aid, led by Hiram and Shitra. He missed them all, Shitra as much as Korik. Hear him as much as the giants. He feared that he would need them. Above and behind the high lord, the hearthrolls, Torm and Borilar, sat in their places with Hiltmark Quan and First Mark Morin. And behind the lords, spaced around the first rows of seats in the gallery, were other blood guard, Morl, Ban, Haor, Korol, and Ruhl on Troy's side, Terrell, Tomin, and Bonor opposite him. Most of the remaining people in the close were his hafts. As a group, they were restless, tense. Most of them had no experience of war, and they had been training rigorously under his demanding gaze. He found himself hoping that what they saw and heard at this council would galvanize their courage, turn their tightness into fortitude, they had such an ordeal ahead of them. The few lore wardens visiting Revelstone were all present, as were the most skilled of the keeps Radamel and Lillianril. But Troy noticed that the Gravelingus Trell was not among them. He felt vaguely relieved, more for Trell's sake than for Covenants. Shortly, Lord Moram entered the close, bringing the unbeliever with him. Covenant was tired. His hunger and weakness were plainly visible in the gaunt pallor of his face, but Troy could see that he had suffered no real harm, and his reliance upon Moram's support expressed how little he was a threat to the lords at this moment. Troy frowned behind his sunglasses, tried not to let his indignation at Covenant surge back up again. As Moram seated Covenant, and then walked around to take his own place at Elena's left, Troy turned his attention to the High Lord. She was ready to begin now, and as always her every movement, her every inflection, fascinated him. Slowly she looked around the table, meeting the eyes of each of the lords. Then, in a clear, stately voice, she said, My friends, Lords and lore wardens and servers of the land, our time has come. For good or ill, weal or woe, the trial is upon us.
the word of war is here. In our hands now is the fate of the land, to keep or to lose, as our strength permits. The time of preparation is ended. No longer do we build or plan against the future. Now we go to war. If our might is not potent to preserve the land, then we fall, and whatever world is to come will be of the despisers' making, not ours. Hear me, my friends. I do not speak to darken your hearts, but to warn against false hope and wishful dreams which could unbind the thews of purpose. We are the chance of the land. We have striven for worth. Now our worthiness meets its test. Hearken, and make no mistake. This is the test which determines. For a moment she paused to gaze over all the attentive faces in the close. When she had seen the resolution in their eyes, she gave a smile of approval and said quietly, I am not afraid. Troy nodded to himself. If his warriors felt as he did, she had nothing to fear. Now, said High Lord Elena, let us hear the bearer of these tidings. Admit the main thrall. At her command, two blood guard opened the doors and made way for the ramen. The woman wore a deep brown shift which left her arms and legs free, and her long black hair was knotted at her neck by a cord. This cord and the small woven garland of yellow flowers around her neck, sadly wilted now after long days of wear, marked her as a main thrall, a member of the highest rank of her people. She was escorted by an honor guard of four blood guard, but she moved ahead of them down the stairs, bearing the fatigue of her great journey proudly. Yet, despite her brave spirit, Troy saw that she could barely stand. The slim grace of her movements was dull, blunted. She was not young. Her eyes, long familiar with open sky and distance, nested in fine wrinkles of age, and the weariness of several hundred leagues lay like lead in the marrow of her bones, giving a pallid underhue to the dark suntan of her limbs. With a sudden rush of anxiety, Troy hoped that she had not come too late. As she descended to the lowest level of the close and stopped before the graveling pit, High Lord Elena rose to greet her. Hail, main thrall, highest of the ramen, the selfless tenders of the Ranihin. Be welcome in Lord's keep, welcome and true. Be welcome, whole or hurt, in boon or bane, ask or give. To any requiring name we will not fail while we have life or power to meet the need. I am High Lord Elena. I speak in the presence of Revelstone itself. Troy recognized the ritual greeting of friends, but the main thrall gazed up at Elena darkly, as if unwilling to respond. Then she turned to her right and said in a low, bitter voice, unlike the usual nickering tones of the ramen, I know you, Lord Moram. Without waiting for a response, she moved on. And I know you, Covenant Ringthane. As she looked at him, the quality of her bitterness changed markedly. Now it was not weariness and defeat, and old Ramen resentment of the lords for presuming to ride the Ranihin, but something else. You demanded the Ranihin at night, when no mortal may demand them at all. Yet they answered, one hundred proud manes, more than most ramen have ever seen in one place. They reared to you in homage to the ring thane, and you did not ride. Her voice made clear her respect for such an act, her awe at the honor which the Ranihin had done this man. Covenant ring thane, do you know me? Covenant stared at her intensely, with a look of pain, 
as if his forehead were splitting. Several moments passed before he said thickly, Gay, you're, you were Winholm Gay. You waited on, you were at Manholm. The main thrall returned his stare. Yes, but you have not changed. Forty-one summers have ridden past me since you visited the plains of Ra and Manholm, and would not eat the food I brought to you. But you are changeless. I was a child then, a Winholm then, barely near my cording, and now I am a tired old woman, far from home, and you are young. Ah, Covenant Ringthane, you treated me roughly. He faced her with a bruised expression. The memories she called up were sore in him. After another moment, she raised her hands until her palms were turned outward level with her head, and bowed to him in the traditional ramen gesture of greeting. Covenant Ringthane, I know you, but you do not know me. I am not Winholm Gay, who passed her cording and studied the Rani Hin in the days when Manholm was full of tales of your quest, when Mainthrall Lithe returned from the dark underground and from seeing the fire lions of Mount Thunder. And I am not Cord Gay, who became a Mainthrall and later heard the word of the lords asking for Raman scouts to search the spoiled plains between Landsdrop and the Shattered Hills. This requesting word was heard, though these same lords knew that all the life of the Ramen is on the plains of Ra, in the tending of the Ranihin, yes, heard and accepted by main thrall Gay with the cords in her watch. She undertook the task of scouting because she hated Fang Thane the Render, and because she admired main thrall Lithe, who dared to leave sunlight for the sake of the lords, and because she honoured Covenant Ringthane, the bearer of white gold, who did not ride when the Ranihins reared to him. Now that Mainthrall Gay is no more. As she said this, her fingers hooked into claws, and her exhausted legs bent into the semblance of a fighting crouch. I am Mainthrall Rue. Old bearer of the flesh of her who was named Gay. I have seen Fang Thane marching, and all the cords in my watch are dead. Then she sagged, and her proud head dropped low. And I have come here, I, who should never have left the plains of home. I have come here to the lords who are said to be the friends of the Ranihin, in no other name but grief. While she spoke, the lords kept silence, and all the close watched her in anxious suspense, torn between respect for her fatigue and desire to hear what she had to say. But Troy heard dangerous vibrations in her voice. Her tone carried a pitch of recrimination which she had not yet articulated clearly, he was familiar with the grim, suppressed outrage that filled all the ramen when any human had the insolence, the almost blasphemous audacity, to ride a Ranahin. But he did not understand it, and he was impatient for the main thrall's news. Rue seemed to sense the increasing tension around her. She stepped warily away from Covenant and addressed all her audience for the first time. Yes. It is said that the lords are our friends. It is said. But I do not know it. You come to the plains of Ra and give us tasks without thought for the pain we feel on hills which are not our home. You come to the plains of Ra and offer yourselves to the generosity of the Ranihin as if you were an honor for some main to accept. And when you are accepted, as the Bloodguard are accepted, Five hundred mains thralled like chattel to purposes not their own. You call the Ranihin away from us into danger where none can protect, where the flesh is rent and the blood spilt, with no Amanibhavam to stem the pain or forestall death. 
Ah, Rani Hin, do not flex your distrust at me. I know you all. In a soft, careful voice, containing neither protest nor apology, the High Lord said, Yet you have come. Yes, main thrall Rue returned in tired bitterness. I have come. I have fled and endured and come. I know we are united against Fang Thane, though you have betrayed us. Lord Veerment stiffened angrily, but Elena controlled him with a glance and said still softly and carefully to Rue, In what way betrayed? Ah, the Ramen do not forget. In tales preserved in Manholm from the age of mighty Kellen Brabanal, we know Fang Thane and the wars of the old lords. Always, when Fang Thane built his armies in the lower land, the old lords came to the ancient battleground north of the plains of Ra and the Rome Sedge River, and fought at Landsdrop to forbid Fang Thane from the upper land. So the Rani Hin were preserved, for the enemy could not turn his teeth to the plains of Ra while fighting the lords. And in recognition, the Ra men left their hills to fight with the lords. But you, Fang Thane marches, and your army is here. The plains of Ra are left without defense or help. That was my idea. His impatience made Troy sound sharper than he intended. For what reason? A dangerous challenge pulsed in her quiet tone. I think they were good reasons, he responded. Impelled by an inner need to reassure himself that he had not been wrong, he spoke swiftly. Think about it. You're right. Every time in the past that Fowl has built up an army, the lords have gone to fight him at Landsdrop. And every time they've lost. They've been pushed back. There are too many different ways up from the lower land, and the lords have been too far from their supplies and support. Sure, they put up a good fight, and that takes some of the pressure off the plains of Ra because Fowl is occupied elsewhere. But the lords lose. Whole Eoward get hacked to pieces, and the war ward has to retreat on the run just to stay alive long enough to regroup and fight the same fight all over again, farther west, closer to Revelstone. And that's not all. This time Fowl might be building his army farther north, in Sauron Grave Flat, north of the Defile's course. He's never done that before. But back then the giants always kept the north Sauron Grave clear. This time, he winced at the thought of the giants, this time it's different. If we marched an army down to you while Fowl was on his way north to Mount Thunder toward Revelstone, we'd be helpless to stop him from attacking the keep. Revelstone might fall. So I made the decision. We wait here. Don't get me wrong. We're not abandoning you. The fact is, I don't think you're in that much danger. Look, suppose Fowl has an army of 50,000 or even a 100,000. How long is it going to take him to conquer the plains of Ra? He will not, Rue breathed between her teeth. The Warmark nodded. And even if he does, it'll take him years. You're too good at hunting. He can't beat you on your own ground. You and the Ranihin will run circles around his troops, and every time they turn their backs, you'll throttle a few score of them. Even if he outnumbers you fifty to one, you'll just send the Ranihin into the mountains and keep chipping away at him for God knows how long. He'll need years to do it even assuming we are not attacking his rear. No, until he's got the lords beaten, he can't afford to tackle you. That's why I've been thinking all along that he would come north. He stopped, and faced Drew squarely with his argument. The recital of his reasoning calmed him. He knew that his logic was sound, and the main thrall was forced to acknowledge it. After considering his explanation for a time, she sighed, Ah, very well. I see your reasons, but I do not like such ideas. You juggle risk for the Rani Hin too freely. Tiredly, she turned back toward Elena. Hear me, High Lord, she said in a grey, empty voice. 
I will speak my message, for I am weary and must rest, come what may. I have journeyed here from the shattered hills which surround and defend Fowl's Cresh. I left that maimed place when I saw a great army issuing from the hills. It marched as straight as the eye sees toward Landsdrop and the fall of the river Landrider. It was an army dire and numberless. I could not guess its size and did not wait to count. With the four cords in my watch, I fled so that I might keep my word to the lords. The south way, Troy breathed to himself. At once his brain took hold of the information. Concrete images of the spoiled plains and lands drop filled his mind. He began to calculate Lord Fowl's progress. But some enemy knew my purpose. We were pursued. A black wind came upon us and from it fearsome, abominable creatures fell like birds of prey. My cords were lost, so that I might escape. Yet I was driven far from my way, north, into the marge of the Sauron grave. I knew that the peril was great, yet I knew that there was no waiting army of friends or lords on the upper land to help the Ranihin. A shadow came over my heart. Almost I turned aside from my purpose and left the lords to a fate of their own devising. But I contended with the Sauron grave so that the lives of my cords would not have been lost in vain. Over the ancient battleground, through the rich joy of Andelaine, then across the stern plains south of a great forest like unto Morin Moss, but darker and more slumberous, thus I made my way so that your idea might have its chance. That is my message. Ask what questions you will, and then release me, for I must rest. With quiet dignity the High Lord arose, holding the staff of law before her. Main thrall rule, the land is measureless in your debt. You have paid a grim price to bring your word to us and we will do our uttermost to honor that cost. Please hear me. We could not turn away from the Ranihin and their Amen. To do so, we would cease to be what we are. Only one belief has kept us from your side. It is in our hearts that this is the final war against Fang Thane. If we fall, there will be none left to fight again, and we have not the strength of the old lords. What force we have, we must use cunningly. Please do not harden your heart against us. We will pay many prices to match your own. Holding the staff at the level of her eyes, she bent forward in a ramen bow. A faint smile flickered across Rue's lips, amusement at Elena's approximation of the fluid ramen salute, and she returned it to show how it should be done. It is also said among the Ramen that the lords are courteous. Now I know it. Ask your questions. I will answer as I can. The High Lord reseated herself. Troy was eager to speak, but she did not give him permission. To main thrall Rue, she said, One question is first in my heart. What of Andalane? Our scouts report no evil there, but they have not your eyes. Are the hills free of wrong? A surge of frustration bunched the muscles of Troy's shoulders. He was eager, urgent, to begin probing the main thrall, but he recognized the tact of Aelina's inquiry. The Andalanian hills rode through Raman legend like an image of paradise. It would ease Rue's heart to speak of them. In response, her grim bitterness relaxed for a moment, her eyes filled with tears that ran down over the slight smile on her lips. The hills are free, she said simply. A glad murmur ran through the close, and several of the lords nodded in satisfaction. This was not something about which a main thrall could be mistaken. The high lord sighed her gratitude. When she freed the war mark to begin his questions, she did so with a look that urged him to be gentle. All right, 
Troy said, rising to his feet. His heart labored with anxiety, but he ignored it. I understand that you don't know the size of Fowl's army. I accept that. But I've got to know how much head start he has. Exactly how many days ago did you see his army leave the Shattered Hills? The main thrall did not need to count back. She replied promptly, Twenty days. For an instant the war mark regarded her eyelessly from behind his sunglasses, stunned into silence. Then he whispered, Twenty days. His brain reeled. Twenty! With a violence that wrenched his heart, his image of the despiser's army surged forward thirty-five leagues, five days. He had counted on receiving word of Lord Fowl's movements in fifteen days. He had studied the ramen. He knew to a league how far a main thrall could travel in a day. Oh, my God! Brew should have been able to reach Revelstone in fifteen days. He was five days short, five days less in which to march over three hundred leagues, and Lord Fowl's army would be in the center plains ten days from now. Without knowing how he had reached that position, he found himself sitting with his face in his hands, as if he could not bear to look at the ruin of all his fine strategy. Numbly, as if it were a matter of no consequence, he realized that he had been right about one thing. Covenant summons coincided with the start of Lord Fowl's army. That ploy had triggered the despiser's attack. Or did it work the other way around? Had Lord Fowl somehow anticipated the call? How? For a moment he could not find what he wanted to ask, and he repeated stupidly, How? Ask, Rue demanded softly. He heard the warning in her voice, the danger of offending her pride after an exhausting ordeal. It made him raise his head, look at her. She was glaring at him, and her hands twitched as if they yearned to snatch the fighting cord from her hair. But he had to ask the question, had to be sure. What happened to you? Why did it take so long? His voice sounded small and lorn to himself. I was driven from my way, she said through her teeth, north into the marge of the Sauron grave. Dear God, Troy breathed weakly. He felt the way Rue looked at him, felt all the eyes in the close on him, but he could not think. His brain was inert. Lord Fowl was only a three-day march from Moran Moss. The main thrall snorted disdainfully and turned away toward the High Lord. Is this the man who leads your warriors? she asked sourly. Please pardon him, Helena replied. He is young in the land, and in some matters does not see clearly. But he has been chosen by the Ranihin. In time he will show his true value. Rue shrugged. Do you have other questions? She said wearily. I would end this. You have told us much. We have no more doubt of Lord Fowl's movements and can guess his speed. Only one question remains. It concerns the composition of Fang Thane's army. What manner of beings comprise it? Bitterness stiffened Rue's stance, and she said harshly, I have spoken of the wind and the evil in the air which felled my cords. In the army I saw Irviles, cave whites, a mighty host of Kreesh, great lion-like beasts with wings, which both ran and flew, and many other ill creatures. They wore shapes like dogs or horses or men, yet they were not what they seemed. They shone with great wrong. To my heart they appeared as the people and beasts of the land, made evil by Fang Thane. That is the work of the ill earth stone, the High Lord murmured. But Main Thrall Rue was not done. One other thing I saw. 
I could not be mistaken, for it marched near the forefront, commanding the movements of the horde. It controlled the creatures with a baleful green light, and called itself Flesh Harrower. It was a giant. For an instant the silence, like a thunderclap, broke over the close. It snatched Troy's attention erect, lit a fire of dread in his chest. The giants! Had Lord Fowl conquered them? Already? Then first Mark Morin came to his feet and said in a voice flat with certainty, Impossible! Rock Brother is another name for fealty and faith! Do you rave? At once the chamber clamored in protest against the very idea that a giant could join the despiser. The thought was too shocking to be admitted. It cast fundamental beliefs into hysteria. The hafts burst out lividly, and several of them shouted through the general uproar that Rue was lying. Two lore wardens took up Morin's question and made it an accusation. Rue was in the grip of a raver. Confusion overcame even the lords. Trevor and Loria paled with fear. Fearment barked at Morom. Elena and Colindril were staggered, and the Amatin burst into tears. The noise aggravated swiftly in the clear acoustics of the close, exacerbated itself, forced each voice to become rawer and wilder. There was panic in the din. If the giants could be made to serve despite, then nothing was safe, sure. Betrayal lurked everywhere. Even the bloodguard had an aspect of dismay in their flat faces. Yet, under the protesting and the abuse, main thrall Rue stood firmly, holding up her head with a blaze of pride and fury in her eyes. The next moment Covenant reached her side. Shaking his fists at the assembly, he howled, Hellfire! Can't you see that she's telling the truth? His voice had no effect, but something in his yell penetrated Hilt Marquan. The old veteran knew the ramen well. He had known Rue during her youth. He jumped to his feet and shouted, Order! Caught in their trained military reactions, the half sprang to attention. Then High Lord Elena seemed to realize what was happening around her. She reasserted her control with a blast of blue fire from the staff, and one hot cry, I am ashamed! A stung silence writhing with fear and indignation burned in answer to her shout. But she met it passionately, sternly, as if something precious were in danger. Melancurian Abatha! Have we come to this? Does fear so belittle us? Look, look at her. If you have not heard the truth in her voice, then look at her now. Remember your oath of peace, and look at her. By the seven, what evil do you see? No, I will hear no protestations that ill can be disguised. We are in the close of Revelstone. This is the Council of Lords. No raver could utter falsehood and betrayal here. If there were any wrong in the main thrall, you would have known it. When she saw that she had mastered the assembly, she continued more quietly. My friends, we are more than this. I do not know the meaning of main thrall Rue's tidings. Perhaps the despiser has captured and broken a giant through the power of the ill earth stone. Perhaps he can create ill whites in any semblance he desires, and showed a false giant to Rue, knowing how the tale of a betraying rock brother would harm us. We must gain answers to these questions. But here stands main thrall Rue of the Ramen, exhausted in the accomplishment of a help which we can neither match nor repay. Cleanse your hearts of all thought against her. We must not do such injustice. Right! Troy heaved himself to his feet. His brain was working again. He was ashamed of his weakness, and, by extension, ashamed of his hats as well. Belatedly, he remembered that the Lords Colindril and Armiton had been unable to breach Sarengrave flat, and yet Rue had survived it. 
so that she could come to warn Revelstone, and he did not like to think that Covenant had behaved better than he. You're right. He faced the ramen squarely. Main thrall, my hafts and I owe you an apology. You deserve better, especially from us. He put acid in his tone for the years of the hafts. War puts burdens on people without caring whether they are ready for them or not. He did not wait for any reply. Turning toward Quan, he said, Hiltmark, my thanks for keeping your head. Let's make sure that nothing like this happens again. Then he sat down and withdrew behind his sunglasses to try to think of some way to salvage his battle plans. Quan commanded, Rest! The hafts reseated themselves, looking abashed, and yet in some way more determined than before. That seemed to mark the end of an ugliness. Mainthrall Rue and Erlord Covenant sagged, leaned tiredly toward each other, as if for support. The High Lord started to speak, but Rue interrupted her in a low voice. I want no more apologies. Release me. I must rest. Elena nodded sadly. Main thrall rule. Go in peace. All the hospitality Revelstone can provide is yours for as long as you choose to stay. We do not take the service you have done us lightly. But please hear me. We have never taken the ramen lightly. And the value of the Ranihin to all the land is beyond any measure. We do not forget. Hail, main thrall. May the bloom of Abanibhavam never fail. Hail, Ramen. May the plains of Ra be forever swift under your feet. Hail, Ranihin, tail of the sky, mane of the world. Once again she bowed to Ru in the Ramen fashion. Main thrall Ru returned the gesture and added the traditional salute of farewell. Touching the heels of her hands to her forehead, she bent forward and spread her arms wide as if bearing her heart. Together the lords answered her bow. Then she turned and started up toward the high doors. Covenant went with her, walking at her side awkwardly, as if he wanted and feared to take her arm. At the top of the stairs they stopped and faced each other. Covenant looked at her with emotions that seemed to make the bone between his eyes bulge. He had to strain to speak. What can I? Is there anything I can do to make you gay again? You are young and I am old. This journey has taken much from me. I have few summers left. There is nothing. My time has a different speed. Don't covet my life. You are Covenant Ringthane. You have power. How should I not covet? He ducked away from her gaze, and after a short pause she added, The Ronihin still await your command. Nothing is ended. They served you at Mount Thunder, and will serve you again until you release them. When she passed through the doors, away from him, he was left staring down at his hands, as if their emptiness pained him. But after a moment he pulled himself up and came back down the stairs to take his seat again. For a time there was silence in the close. The gathered people watched the lords, and the lords sat still, bending their minds in toward each other to meld their purpose and strength. This had a calming effect on the assembly. It was part of the mystery of being a lord, and all the people of the land, Stone Downer and Wood Helvenin, trusted the lords. As long as the council was capable of melding and leadership, Revelstone would not be without hope. Even Warmark Troy gained a glimpse of encouragement from this communion he could not share. At last the contact broke with an almost audible snap from Lord Veerment, and the High Lord raised her head to the assembly. My friends, warriors, servants of the land, she said, 
Now is the time of decision. Deliberation and preparation are at an end. War marches toward us, and we must meet it. In this matter, the chief choice of action is upon war mark Heil Troy. He will command the war ward, and we will supply it with our best strength, as the need of the land demands. But one matter compels us first. This giant named Flesh Harrower. The question of this must be answered. Roughly, Veerment said, The stone does not explain. It is not enough. The giants are strong, yes, strong and wise. They would resist the stone or evade it. I agree, said Loria. The sea-reach giants understand the peril of the ill-earth stone. It is easier to believe that they have left the land in search of their lost home. Without the golden load? Trevor countered uncomfortably. That is unlikely, and it is not, it is not what Moram saw. The other lords turned to Moram, and after a moment he said, No, it is not what I have seen. Let us pray that I have seen wrongly, or wrongly understood what I have seen. But for good or ill, this matter is beyond us at present. We know that Korik and the lords Hiram and Shitra will do their uttermost for the giants, and we cannot send more of our strength to Sea Reach now to ask how a giant has been made to lead Lord Fowl's army. It is in my heart that we will learn that answer sooner than any of us would wish. Very well, the High Lord sighed. I hear you. Then let us now divide among ourselves the burdens of this war. She looked around the council, measuring each member against the responsibilities which lay ahead. Then she said, Lord Trevor, Lord Loria, to you I commit the keeping of Revelstone. It will be your task to care for the people made homeless by this war, to lay up stores and strengthen defenses against any siege that may come, to fight the last battle of the land if we fail. My friends, hear me. It is a grim burden I give you. Those who remain here may in the end require more strength than all others. For if we fall, then you must fight to the last without surrender or despair. You will be in a straight place, like that which drove High Lord Kevin to his desecration. I trust you to resist. The land must not be doomed in that way again. Troy nodded to himself. Her choice was a good one. Lord Loria would fight extravagantly, and yet would never take any action that would imperil her daughters, and Lord Trevor would work far beyond his strength in the conviction that he did not do as much as others could. They accepted the High Lord's charge quietly, and she went on to other matters. After the defense of Revelstone, our concern must be for the Law's Rot and Trothgard. The Law's Rot must be preserved and Trothgard must be held for as long as may be as a sanctuary for the homeless, men or beasts, and as a sign that in no way do we bow to the despiser. Within the valley of two rivers, Trothgard is defensible, though it will not be easy. Lord Colendril, Lord Amatin, this burden I place upon your shoulders. Preserve Trothgard, so that the ancient name of Kurash Planethor, stricken stone, will not become the new name of our promise to the land. Just a minute, Warmark Troy interrupted hesitantly. That leaves just you, Moram, and Veerman to go with me. I think I'm going to need more than that. Elena considered for a moment. Then she said, Lord Amatin, Will you accept the burden of Trothgard alone? Trevor and Loria will give you all possible aid. We fight a war, Amatin replied simply. It is bootless to protest that I do not suffice. I must learn to suffice. The law wardens will support me. You will be enough, responded the High Lord with a smile. Very well. 
those lords who remain, Colin Drill, Veerment, Moram, and myself, will march with the war ward. Two other matters, and then the war mark will speak. First, Mark Morin. High Lord, Morin stood to receive her requests. Morin, you are the first mark. You will command the blood guard as your vow requires. Please assign to Warmark Troy every blood guard who can be spared from the defense of Revelstone. Yes, High Lord. Two hundred will join the Warmark's command. That is well. Now I have another task for you. Riders must be sent to every stone down and woodhelven in the center and south plains, and in the hills beyond. All the people who may live in the despiser's path must be warned and offered sanctuary at Trothgard, if they choose to leave their homes. And all who dwell along the southward march of the war ward must be asked for aid, food for the warriors, so that they may march more easily, carrying less. Aliantha alone will not suffice for so many. It will be done. The blood guard will depart before moonset. Elena nodded her approval. No thanks can repay the blood guard. You give a new name to unflawed service. While people endure in the land, you will be remembered for faithfulness. Bowing slightly, the first mark sat down. The High Lord set the staff of law on the table before her, took her seat, and signed to Warmark Troy. He took a deep breath, then got stiffly to his feet. He was still groping, juggling. But he had regained a grip on his situation. He was thinking clearly again. Even as he started to speak, new ideas were coming into focus. I'm not going to waste time apologizing for this mess I've gotten us into. I built my strategy on the idea that we would get word of where Fowl was marching in fifteen days. Now we're five days short. That's all there is to it. Most of you know generally what I had in mind. As far as I can learn, the old lords had two problems fighting Fowl. The simple attrition of doing battle all the way from Landsdrop, and the terrain. The center plains favor whichever army is fresher and larger. My idea was to let Fowl get halfway here on his own and meet him at the west end of the Mithill Valley, where the Mithill River forms the south border of Andalane. Then we would retreat southwest, luring Fowl after us across the Doom's Retreat. In all the legends, that's the place armies run to when they're routed. But in fact, it's a hell of a place to take on armies that are bigger and faster than you are. The terrain, that bottleneck between the mountains, gives a tremendous advantage to the side that gets there first. If it gets there in time to dig in before the enemy arrives. Well, it was a nice idea. Now we're in a different war. We're five days short. Fowl will be through the Mithill Valley ten days from now, and he'll turn north, forcing us to fight him wherever he wants in the center plains. If we have to retreat at all, we'll end up in Trothgard. He paused for a moment, half expecting groans of dismay. But most of the people simply watched him closely, and several of the lords had confidence in their eyes. Their trust touched him. He had to swallow down a sudden lump in his throat before he could continue. There's one way we can still do it. It's going to be hell, but it's just about possible. Then for an instant he faltered. Hell was a mild word for what his warriors would have to endure. How could he ask them to do it when he was to blame for the miscalculation which made it necessary? How? but Elena was watching him steadily. From the beginning she had supported his desire to command the war ward, and now he was the war mark. He, Heil Troy. In a tone of anger at the extremity of what he was asking, he said, Here it is. First, we have nine days. I absolutely guarantee that Fowl will hit the western end of the Mithill Valley by the end of the ninth day from now. That's one of the things not having any eyes is good for. 
I can measure things like this. All right. Nine days. We've got to get there before that and block the valley. Morin, your two hundred blood guard have got to leave tonight. Call and drill, you go with them. On Ronihin, you can get there in seven days. You've got to stop foul right there. Borolar, how many of those big rafts have you got in the lake? Surprised, Hearthroll Borolar answered, Three, Warmark. How many warriors and horses can they carry? Borolar glanced helplessly over at Quan. The Hiltmark replied, Each raft will carry two Eoman and their war hafts, forty-two warriors and horses. But the crowding will be dangerous. If you ride a raft as far as Andelaine, how fast can you get those Eoman to the Mithil Valley? If there is no mishap, in ten days, four days may be saved through the use of rafts. All right. We have twelve horse-mounted Eoward, two hundred forty Eoman. Borolar, I need one hundred twenty of those rafts. Quan, you're in command of this. You've got to get all twelve mounted Eoward and Veerment down to the Mithill Valley as fast as possible to help Colindril and the Blood Guard keep Fowl from coming through. You've got to buy us the time we need. Get on it. Hiltmar Quan spoke a word to the hafts and twelve of them jumped up to form ranks behind him as he hastened out of the close. Borilar looked at the High Lord with an expression of indecision, but she nodded to him. Rubbing his hands nervously as if to warm them, he left the chamber, taking all the Lillian Rill with him. Second, Troy said, the rest of the war ward will march straight south from here to Doom's Retreat. That's something less than three hundred leagues. He called the remaining hafts to their feet and addressed them directly. I think you should explain this to your commands. We've got to get to Doom's retreat in twenty-eight days, and that's only enough if the Hiltmark can do everything I've got in mind for him. Tell your Eoward, ten leagues a day. That's going to be the easy part of this war. In the back of his mind he was thinking, Ten leagues a day for twenty-eight days. Good God! Half of them will be dead before we reach the South Plains. For a moment he studied the hafts, trying to judge their metal. Then he said, First half armorine. The first half stepped forward and responded, Warmark. She was a short, broad, dour woman with blunt features which appeared to have been moulded in a clay too hard and dry for detailed handiwork. But she was a seasoned veteran of the war ward, one of the few survivors of the Eoman which Quan had commanded on the quest for the Staff of Law. Ready the war ward. We march at dawn. Pay special attention to the packs. Make them as light as possible. Use all the rest of the horses for cartage if you have to. If we don't make it to Doom's retreat in time, Revelstone won't have any use for the last few hundred horses. Get started. First half Armorine gave a stern command to the hafts. Saluting the lords together, they moved out of the close behind her. Troy watched until they were gone, and the doors were shut after them. Then he turned to the High Lord. With an effort, he forced himself to say, You know I've never commanded a war before. In fact, I've never commanded anything. All I know is theory, just mental exercises. You're putting a lot of faith in me. If she felt the importance of what he said, she gave no sign. Do not fear, Warmark, she replied firmly. We see your value to the land. You have given us no cause to doubt the rightness of your command. A rush of gratitude took Troy's voice away from him. He saluted her, then sat down and braced his arms on the table to keep himself from trembling. A moment later, High Lord Elena said to the remaining assembly, Ah, my friends, there is much to be done, and the night will be all too short for our need. This is not the time for long talk or exhortation. Let us all go about our work at once. 
I will speak to the keep and to the war ward at dawn. Hothrall Torm. Hi, Lord, Torm responded with alacrity. I think that there are ways in which you may make the rafts more stable, safer for horses. Please do so, and send any of your people who may be spared to assist Hothrall Borolar in the building. My friends, this war is upon us. Give your best strength to the land now. If mortal flesh may do it, we must prevail. She drew herself erect and flourished the staff. Be of good heart. I am Elena, daughter of Lena, high lord by the choice of the council, and wielder of the staff of law. My will commands. I speak in the presence of Revelstone itself. Bowing to the assembly, she swept from the close through one of the private doors, followed variously by the other lords. The chamber emptied rapidly as the people hurried away to their tasks. Troy stood and started toward the stairs. But on the way, Covenant accosted him. Actually, Covenant said as if he were telling Troy a secret, it isn't you they've got faith in at all, just as they don't have faith in me. It's the student who summoned you. That's whom they've staked their faith on. I'm busy, Troy said stiffly. I've got things to do. Let me go. Listen, Covenant demanded. I'm trying to warn you. If you could hear it. It's going to happen to you, too. One of these days you're going to run out of people who'll march their hearts out to make your ideas work. And then you'll see that you put them through all that for nothing. Three hundred league marches, blocked valleys, your ideas, paid for and wasted. All your fine tactics won't be worth a rusty dam. Ah, Troy, he sighed wearily. All this responsibility is going to make another Kevin Land waster out of you. Instead of meeting Troy's taut stare, he turned away and wandered out of the close, as if he hardly knew or cared where he was going. Chapter 12 Fourth to War Just before dawn, Troy rode away from the gates of Revelstone in the direction of the lake at the foot of Furl Falls. The pre-dawn dimness obscured his sight, blinded him like a mist in his mind. He could not see where he was going, could hardly discern the ears of his mount. But he was in no danger. He was riding Merrill, the Rani Hin that had chosen to bear him. Yet as he trotted westward under the high south wall of the keep, he had a precarious aspect, like a man trying to balance himself on a tree limb that was too small. He had spent a good part of the night reviewing the decisions he had made in the war council, and they scared him. He had committed the lords and the war ward to a path as narrow and fatal as a swaying tightrope. But he had no choice. He had either to go ahead or to abandon his command, leave the war in Quan's worthy but unimaginative hands. So in spite of his anxiety, he did not hesitate. He intended to show all the land that he was the war mark for good reason. Time was urgent. The war ward had to begin its southward march as soon as possible, so he trusted Merrill to carry him through his inward fog. Letting the Ranihin pick their way, he hastened toward the blue lake where the rafts were being built. Before he rounded the last wide foothill, he moved among scattered ranks of warriors, holding horses. Men and women saluted him as he passed, but he could recognize none of them. He held up his right hand in blank acknowledgment and rode down the thronged road without speaking. If his strategy failed, these warriors and the two hundred bloodguard who had already followed Lord Colindrill toward the Midhill Valley would be the first to pay for his mistake. He found the edge of the lake by the roar of the falls and the working sounds of the raft builders and slipped immediately off Merrill's back. The first shadowy figure that came near him he sent in search of Hiltmark Quan. Moments later, Quan's solid form appeared out of the fog, 
accompanied by a lean man carrying a staff. Lord Veerment. Troy spoke directly to the hiltmark. He felt uneasy about giving orders to a lord. How many rafts are ready? Three and twenty are now in the water, Juan replied. Five yet lack the Radamel rudders, but that task will be accomplished by sunrise. And the rest? Hothrol Borilar and the raft builders promised that all 120 will be complete by dawn tomorrow. Damn! Another day gone. Well, you can't wait for them. Lord Colandrill is going to need help faster than that. He calculated swiftly, then went on. Send the rafts downriver in groups of twenty. Two eoman at a time. If there's any trouble, I want them to be able to defend themselves. You go first. And, Lord Veerment, will you go with Quan? Veerment answered with a sharp nod. Good. Now, Quan, get your group going right away. Put whomever you want in command of the other Eoward. Tell them to follow you in turn, just as soon as another twenty rafts are ready to go. Have the warriors who are going last try to help the raft builders. Speed this job up! His private fog was clearing now as the sun started to rise. Quan's age-lined bulwark of a face drifted into better focus, and Troy fell silent for a moment, half dismayed by what he was asking his friend to do. Then he shook his head roughly, forced himself to continue. Quan, you've got the worst job in this whole damn business. You and those bloodguard with Colandrill. You have got to make this plan of mine work. If it can be done, we will do it. Quan spoke steadily, almost easily, but his experience with grim, desperate undertakings gave his statement conviction. Troy went on hurriedly. You've got to hold Fowl's army in that valley. Even after you get your whole force there, you're going to be outnumbered ten to one. You've got to hold Fowl back and still keep enough of your force alive to lead him down to Doom's retreat. I understand. No, you don't. I haven't told you the worst of it yet. You have got to hold Fowl back for eight days. Eight? Fearman snapped. You jest. Controlling himself sternly, Troy said, Figure it out for yourself. We've got to march all the way to Doom's retreat. We need that much time just to get there. Eight days will hardly give us time to get in position. You ask much, Quan said slowly. You're the man who can do it, Troy replied. And the truth is, the warriors will follow you better in a situation like that than they would me. You have two lords working with you, plus all the bloodguard Colandrill has left. There's nobody who can take your place. Juan met this in silence. Despite the square set of his shoulders, he appeared to be hesitating. Troy leaned close to him, whispered intently through the noise of Furl Falls. Hildmark, if you accomplish what I ask, I swear that I will win this war. Swear? Beermant cut in again. Does the despiser know that you bind him with your oaths? Troy ignored the Lord. I mean it. If you get that chance for me, I won't waste it. A low, war-ready grin touched Quan's lips. I hear you, he said. I felt the door hand of your skill when you won the command of the war ward from me. Warmark, you will be given your eight days if they lie within the reach of human thew and will. Good. Juan's promise gave Troy an obscure feeling of relief, as if he were no longer alone on his narrow limb. Now, when you engage Fowl in the Mithill Valley, what you've got to do is force him southward, push him down into the southern hills, the farther the better. Hold the valley closed until he has enough of his army in the hills to attack you from that side. Then run like hell straight toward Doom's retreat. That will be costly. Not as costly as letting that army go north when we're in the south. Juan nodded grimly, and Troy went on. 
and not as costly as letting Fowl get to the retreat ahead of us. Whatever else happens, we've got to avoid that. If you can't hold him back eight days' worth, you'll have to figure out where we are and lead him to us instead of to the retreat. We'll try to pull him the last way south ourselves. Quan nodded again, and the lines of his face clenched. To relax him, Troy said dryly, Of course it would be better if you just defeated him yourself and saved us the trouble. The hiltmark started to reply, but Lord Veerment interrupted him. If that is your desire, you should choose someone other than an old warrior and a Ranihinless lord to do your bidding. Troy was about to respond when he heard hooves coming toward him from the direction of Revelstone. Now the sun had started to rise, night danced on the blue water pouring over the top of the falls, and the fog over his vision had begun to fade. When he turned, he made out the bloodguard Rule riding toward him. Rule stopped his Rani Hin with a touch of his hand, and said without dismounting, Warmark, the war ward is ready. High Lord Aelina awaits you. On my way, Troy answered, and swung back to Quan. For a moment the hilt mark's gaze replied firmly to his. Torn between affection and resolve, he muttered, My God, I will earn what you do for me. Springing onto Merrill's back, he started away. He moved so suddenly that he almost ran into Mainthrall Rue. She had been standing a short distance away, regarding Merrill as if she expected to find that Troy had injured the Rani Hin. Unintentionally, he urged his mount straight toward her, but she stepped aside just as he halted the Rani Hin. Her presence surprised him. He acknowledged her, then waited for her to speak. He felt that she deserved any courtesy he could give her. While she stroked Merrill's nose with loving hands, she said as if she were explaining something, I have done my part in your war. I will do no more. I am old and need rest. I will ride your rafts to Anderlane, and from there make my own way homeward. Very well. He could not deny her permission to ride a raft, but he sensed that this was only a preparation for what she meant to say. After a heavy pause she went on. I will have no further use for this. With a brusque movement she twitched the fighting cord from her hair, hesitated, then handed it to Troy. Softly she said, Let there be peace between us. Because he could think of no fit response, he accepted the cord, but it gave him a pang, as if he were not worthy of it. He tucked it into his belt, and with his hands free, he gave the main thrall his best approximation of a Raman bow. She bowed in turn, gestured for him to move on. But as he started away, she called after him, Tell Covenant Ring Thane that he must defeat Fang Thane. The Rani Hin have reared to him. They require him. He must not let them fall. Then she was gone, out of sight in the mist. The thought of Covenant gave him a bitter taste in his mouth, but he forced it down. With Rule at his side, he left Quan shouting orders and urged Merrill into a brisk trot up the road toward the gate of Revelstone. As he moved, the sunrise began to burn away the last dimness of his vision. The great wrought wall of the keep became visible. It shone in the new light with a vivid glory that made him feel at once both small and resolute. In it, he caught a glimpse of the true depth of his willingness to sacrifice himself for the land. Now he could only hope that what he had to offer would be enough. There was only one thing for which he could not forgive Covenant. That was the unbeliever's refusal to fight. Then he topped the last rise and found the lords assembled before the gates, above the long, ranked massing of the war ward. The sight of the war ward gave him a surge of pride. This army was his, a tool of his own shaping, 
a weapon which he had sharpened himself and knew how to wield. Each warrior stood in place in an eoman. Each eoman held its position around the fluttering standard of its eoward, and the thirty-eight eowards spread out around the foot of Lord's Keep like a human mantle. More than fifteen thousand metal breastplates caught the rising fire of the sun. All the warriors were on foot except the hafts and a third of the war hafts. These officers were mounted to bear the standards and the marching drums, and to carry messages and commands through the war ward. Troy was acutely aware that the one thing his army lacked was some instantaneous means of communication. Without such a resource, he felt more vulnerable than he liked to admit. To make up for it, he had developed a network of riders who could shuttle from place to place in battle, and he had trained his officers in complex codes of signals and flares and banners, so that under at least some circumstances messages could be communicated by sight. But he was not satisfied. Thousands upon thousands of lives were in his hands. As he gazed out over his command, his tree limbs seemed to be shaking in the wind. He swung away from the war board and scanned the mounted gathering before the gates. Only Trevor and Loria were absent. The lords Amatin and Moram were there, with twenty bloodguard, a handful of higher brands and gravelinguses, all the visiting lore wardens, and first half Amarin. Covenant sat on a Klingor saddle astride one of the rebel stone mustangs, and at his side was the high lord. Mirha, her golden Ranihin mare, made her look more than ever like a concentrated heroine, a noble figure like that legended queen for whom Beric had fought his great war. She was leaning toward a covenant, listening to him with interest, almost with deference, in every line of her form. The sight galled Troy. His own feelings for the High Lord were confused. He could not fit them into any easy categories. She was the Lord who had taught him the meaning of sight. And as he had learned to see, she had taught him the land, introduced him to it with such gentle delight that he always thought of her and the land together, as if she herself summarized it. When he came to understand the peril of the land, when he began to search for a way to serve what he saw, she was the one who breathed life into his ideas. She recognized the potential value of his tactical skill, put faith in it. She gave his voice the power of command. Because of her, he was now giving orders of great risk and leading the war ward in a cause for which he would not be ashamed to die. Yet Covenant appeared insensitive to her, immune to her, he wore an aura of weary bitterness. His beard darkened his whole face, as if to assert that he had not one jot or tittle of belief to his name. He looked like an unbeliever, an infidel, and his presence seemed to demean the High Lord, sully her land-like beauty. Various sour thoughts crossed Troy's mind, but one was uppermost. There was still something he had to say to Covenant, not because Covenant would or could profit from it, but because he, Troy, wanted to leave no doubt in Covenant's mind. The warmark waited until Elena had turned away to speak with Moram. Then he pulled Meryl up to Covenant's side. Without preamble, he said bluntly, There's something I've got to tell you before we leave. I want you to know that I spoke against you to the Council. I told them what you did to Trell's daughter. Covenant cocked an eyebrow. After a pause, he said, And then you found out that they already knew all about it. Yes. For an instant, he wondered how Covenant had known this. Then he went on. So I demanded to know why they put up with you. I told them they can't afford to waste their time and strength rehabilitating people like you when they've got foul to worry about. What did they say? They made excuses for you. They told me that not all crimes are committed by evil people. 
They told me that sometimes a good man does ill because of the pain in his soul, like Trell. And Moram told me that the blade of your unbelief cuts both ways. And that surprises you? Yes, I told them. You should have expected it. Oh, what did you think this oath of peace is about? It's a commitment to the forgiving of lepers, of Kevin and Trell. As if forgiveness weren't the one thing no leper or criminal either could ever have any use for. Troy stared into Covenant's grey, gaunt face. Covenant's tone confused him. The words seemed to be bitter, even cynical. But behind them was a timbre of pain, a hint of self-judgment, which he had not expected to hear. Once again he was torn between anger at the folly of the unbeliever's stubbornness and amazement at the extent of Covenant's injury. An obscure shame made him feel that he should apologize, but he could not force himself to go that far. Instead he gave a relenting sigh and said, Moram also suggested that I should be patient with you. Patience. I wish I had some, but the fact is, I know. Covenant murmured. The fact is that you're starting to find out just how terrible all this responsibility is. Let me know when you start to feel like a failure. We'll commiserate together. That stung Troy. I'm not going to fail, he snapped. Covenant grimaced ambiguously. Then let me know when you succeed and I'll congratulate you. With an effort, Troy swallowed his anger. He was in no mood to be tolerant of Covenant, but for his own sake, and Elena's, rather than for the unbelievers, he said, Covenant, I really don't understand what your trouble is. If there's ever anything I can do for you, I'll do it. Covenant did not meet his gaze. Self-sarcastically, the unbeliever muttered, I'll probably need it. Troy shrugged. He leaned his weight to send Merrill toward first half Amarine, but then he saw Hartrall Torm striding briskly toward them from the gate of the keep. He held Merrill back and waited for the Gravelingus. When Torm stepped between their mounts, he saluted them both, then turned to Covenant. The usual playfulness of his expression was cloaked in sobriety as he said, "'Er, Lord, may I speak?' Covenant glowered at him from under his eyebrows, but did not refuse. After a brief pause, Torm said, You will soon depart from Revelstone, and it may be that yet another forty years will pass before you return again. Perhaps I will live forty years more, but the chance is uncertain, and I am still in your debt. Er Lord Covenant, may I give you a gift? Reaching into his robe, he pulled out and held up a smooth, lopsided stone no larger than his palm. Its appearance struck the war mark. It gave the impression of being transparent, but he could not see through it. It seemed to open into unglimpsed depths, like a hole in the visible fabric of Torm's hand, and the air, and the ground. Startled, Covenant asked, What is it? It is Orcrest, a rare piece of the one rock which is the heart of the earth. The earth power is abundant in it, and it may serve you in many ways. Will you accept it? Covenant stared at the Orcrest as if there were something cruel in Torm's offer. I don't want it. I do not offer it for any want, said Torm. You have the white gold and need no gifts of mine. No, I offer it out of respect for my old friend Biranair, whom you released from the fire which consumed him. I offer it in gratitude for a brave deed. Brave? Covenant muttered thickly. I didn't do it for him. Don't you know that? The deed was done by your hand. No one in the land could do such a thing. Will you accept it? Slowly Covenant reached out and took the stone. As his left hand closed around it, it changed color, took on an argent gleam from his wedding ring. Seeing this, he quickly shoved it into the pocket of his pants. 
Then he cleared his throat and said, If I ever, if I ever get a chance, I'll give it back to you. Torm grinned. Courtesy is like a drink at a mountain stream. Er, Lord, it is in my heart that behind the thunder of your brow you are a strangely courteous man. Now you're making fun of me, Covenant replied glumly. The hearthrall laughed at this, as if it were a high jest. With a sprightly step, he moved away to re-enter the keep. Bormark Troy frowned. Everyone in Revelstone seemed to see something in Covenant that he himself could not perceive. To escape that thought, he sent Merrill trotting from Covenant's side toward his army. First half Armorine joined him a short way down the hill, and together they spent a brief time speaking with the mounted war hafts who carried the drums. Troy counted out the pace he wanted them to set, and made sure that they knew it by heart. It was faster than the beat he had trained into them, and he did not want the army to lag. In the back of his mind he chafed at the delay which kept the march from starting. The sun was well up now. The war ward had already lost the dawn. He was discussing the terrain ahead with his first haft, when a murmur ran through the army. All the warriors turned toward the great keep. The lords Trevor and Gloria had finally arrived. They stood atop the tower which guarded Revelstone's gates. Between them they held a bundle of blue cloth. As the lords took their places, the inhabitants of the keep began to appear at the south wall. In a rush they thronged the balconies and ramparts, filled the windows, crowded out onto the edge of the plateau. Their voices rolled expectantly. Leaving Armorine with the army, Warmark Kyle Troy rode back up the hill to take his place with the lords, while Trevor and Loria busied themselves around the tall flagpole atop the tower. His blood suddenly stirred with eagerness, and he wanted to shout some kind of war cry, hurl some fierce defiance at the despiser. When Trevor and Loria were ready, they waved to High Lord Elena. At their signal she clapped Mira with her heels and galloped away from her mounted companions. A short distance away, between the wall of the keep and the main body of the war ward, she halted. Swinging Mira in a tight circle with the staff of law raised high over her head, she shouted to the warriors and the inhabitants of Revelstone, Hail! Her clear cry echoed off the cliff like a tantara, and was answered at once by one thrilling shout from a myriad of voices, Hail! My friends, people of the land, she called out to them, the time has come. War is upon us, and we march to meet it. Hear me all. I am the High Lord, holder of the staff of law, sworn and dedicate to the services of the land. At my will we march to do battle with the Grey Slayer, to pit our strength against him for the sake of the earth. Hear me. It is I, Elena, daughter of Lena, who say it. Do not fear. Be of strong heart and bold hand. If it lies within our power, we will prevail. As she held high the staff, she caught the early sunlight. Her hair shone about her like an anadem, and the gold Ranihin bore her up like an offering to the wide day. For a moment she had a look of immolation, and Troy almost choked on the fear of losing her. But there was nothing sacrificial in the upright peal of her voice as she addressed the people of Revelstone. Do not mistake. This peril is severe, the gravest danger of our age. It may be that all we have ever seen or heard or felt will be lost. If we are to live, if the land is to live, we must wrest life from the despiser. It is a task that surpassed the old lords who came before us. But I say to you, do not fear. The coming battle is our great test our sole measure. It is our opportunity to repudiate utterly the desecration which destroys what it loves. 
It is our opportunity to shape courage and service and faith out of the very rock of doom. Even if we fall, we will not despair. Yet I do not believe that we shall fall. Taking the staff in one hand, she thrust it straight toward the heavens, and a bright flame burst from its end. Hear me all, she cried. Hear the dedication in time of war. Then she opened her throat and began to sing a song that pulsed like the stalking of drums. Friends, comrades, proud people of the land, there is war upon us. Blood and pain and killing are at hand. Together we confront the test of death. Friends and comrades, remember peace. Repeat the oath with every breath. Until the end and time's release, we bring no fury or despair, no passion of hatred, spite, or slaughter, no desecration to the service of the land. We fight to mend, anneal, repair, to free the earth of detestation, for health and home and wood and stone, for beauty's fragrant bloom and gleam, and rivers clear and fair we strike. Nor will we cease, let fall our heads to ash and dust, lose faith and heart and hope and bone. We strike until the land is clean of wrong and pain, and we have kept our trust. Let no great whelm of evil wreak despair. Remember peace, brave death. We are the proud preservers of the land. As she finished, she turned Mirha, faced the watchtower. From the staff of law she sent crackling into the sky a great branched lightning tree. At this sign, Lord Loria threw her bundle into the air, and Lord Trevor pulled strongly on the lines of the flagpole. The defiant war flag of Revelstone sprang open and snapped in the mountain wind. It was a huge oriflame, twice as tall as the lords who raised it, and it was clear blue, the color of High Lord's furl, with one stark black streak across it. As it flapped and fluttered, a mighty cheer rose up from the war ward and was repeated on the thronged wall of Revelstone. For a moment, High Lord Elena kept the staff blazing, then she silenced her display of power. As the shouting subsided, she looked at the group of riders and called firmly, Warmark Heil Troy, let us begin. At once Troy sent Merrill prancing toward the war ward. When he was alone in front of the riders, he saluted his second in command and said quietly to control his excitement, First half, Amorine. You may begin. She returned his salute, swung her mount toward the army. War ward, she shouted. Order. With a wide surge, the warriors came to attention. Drummers ready. The pace beaters raised their sticks. When she thrust her right fist into the air, they began their beat, pounding out together the rhythm Troy had taught them. Warriors, march. As she gave the command, she pulled down her fist. Nearly sixteen thousand warriors started forward to the cadence of the drums. Troy watched their precision with a lump of pride in his throat. At Amorine's side, he moved with his army down the road toward the river. The rest of the riders followed close behind him. Together they kept pace with the war ward as it marched westward under the high south wall of Revelstone. Chapter 13 The Rock Gardens of the Mail Together the riders and the marching war ward passed down the road to the wide stone bridge which crossed the White River a short distance south of the lake. As they mounted the bridge, they received a chorus of encouraging shouts from the horsemen and raft builders at the lake. But Warmark Troy did not look that way. From the top of the span he gazed down river. There he could see the last rafts of Hiltmark Kwan's first two Eoward moving around a curve and out of sight. They were only a small portion of Troy's army, but they were crucial. They were risking their lives in accordance with his commands, and the fate of the land went with them. 
In pride and trepidation he watched until they were gone, on their way to receive the measure of bloodshed he had assigned to them. Then he rode on precariously across the bridge. Beyond it, the road turned southward and began winding down, away from the Keep's Plateau, toward the rough grasslands which lay between Revelstone and Trothgard. As he moved through the foothills, Troy counted the accompanying higher brands and gravelinguses to be sure that the war board had its full complement of support from the Lillian Rill and Rodemail. In the process he caught a glimpse of an extra gravelingus mounted and travelling behind the group of riders. Trell. The powerful gravelingus kept to the back of the group, but he made no attempt to hide his face or his presence. The sight of him gave Troy a twinge of anxiety. He stopped and waited for the High Lord. Motioning the other riders past him, he said to Aileen in a low voice, Did you know that he's coming with us? Is it all right with you? High Lord Elena met him with a questioning look, which he answered by nodding toward Trell. Covenant had stopped with Elena, and at Troy's nod he turned to look behind him. When he saw the gravelingus, he groaned. Most of the riders were past Elena, Troy, and Covenant now, and Trell could clearly see the three watching him. He halted where he was, still twenty-five yards away, and returned Covenant's gaze with a raw, bruised stare. For a moment they all held their positions, regarded each other intently. Then Covenant cursed under his breath, gripped the reins of his horse, and moved up the road toward Trell. Bonor started after the unbeliever, but High Lord Elena stopped him with a quick gesture. He needs no protection, she said quietly. Do not affront Trell with your doubt. Covenant faced Trell, and the two men glared at each other. Then Covenant said something. Troy could not hear what he said, but the gravelingus answered it with a red-rimmed stare. Under his tunic his broad chest heaved as if he were panting. His reply was inaudible also. There was violence in Trell's limbs, struggling for action. Troy could see it. He did not understand Elena's assertion that Covenant was safe. As he watched, he whispered to her, What did Covenant say? Elena responded as if she could not be wrong. The Ur Lord promises that he will not harm me. This surprised Troy. He wanted to know why Covenant would try to reassure Trell in that way. But he could not think of a way to ask Elena what the connection was between her and Trell. Instead, he asked, What's Trell's answer? Trell does not believe the promise. Silently, Troy congratulated Trell's common sense. A moment later, Covenant jerked his horse into motion and came trotting back down the road. His free hand pulled insistently at his beard. Without looking at Elena, he shrugged his shoulders defensively as he said, Well, he has a good point. Then he urged his mount into a canter to catch up with the rest of the riders. Troy wanted to wait for Trell, but the High Lord firmly took him with her as she followed Covenant. Out of respect for the gravelingus, Troy did not look back. But when the war ward broke march at midday for food and rest, Troy saw Trell eating with the other Rodemail. By that time the army had wound out of the foothills, into the more relaxed grasslands west of the White River. Troy gauged the distance they had covered and used it as a preliminary measure of the pace he had set for the march. So far the pace seemed right, but many factors influenced today's march. The war mark spent part of the afternoon with first half Damarine, discussing how to match the frequency and duration of rest halts with such variables as the terrain, the distance already traversed, and the state of the supplies. He wanted to prepare her for his absences. He was glad to talk about his battle plan. He felt proud of it, as if it were a work of objective beauty. Traditionally, beaten people fled to Doom's retreat, but he meant to remake it into a place of victory. His plan was the kind of daring strategic stroke that only a blind man could create. 
but after a time Amarine responded by gesturing over the war ward and saying dourly, One day of such a pace is no great matter. Even five days may give no distress to a good warrior, but twenty days, or thirty, in that time this pace may kill. I know, Troy replied carefully. His trepidation returned in a rush. But we haven't got any choice. Even at this pace, too many warriors and bloodguard are going to get killed buying us the time we need. I hear you, Amarine grated. We will keep the pace. When the army stopped for the night, Mora, Melina, and Amatin moved among the bright campfires, singing songs and telling gleeful giantish stories to buttress the hearts of the warriors. As he watched them, Troy felt a keen regret that long days would pass before the lords could again help Amarine maintain the war ward spirit. But the separation was necessary. High Lord Aelina had several reasons for visiting the Lord's Rot. But Revelwood was out of the way. The added distance was prohibitive for the marching warriors. So the lords and the war ward parted company the next afternoon. The three lords, accompanied by Covenant and Troy, the twenty blood guard and the lore wardens, turned with the road southwest toward Trothgard and Revelwood, and first half Amarine led the war ward, with its mounted higher brands and gravelinguses, almost due south, in a direct line toward Doom's retreat. Troy had business of his own at the Lord's Rot, and he was forced to leave Amarine alone in command of his army. That afternoon the autumn sky turned dim as rain clouds moved heavily eastward. When he gave the first half to his final instructions, his vision was blurred. He had to peer through an ominous haze. Keep the pace, he said curtly. Push it even faster when you reach easier ground past the Grey River. If you can gain a little time, we won't have to drive so hard around the last hills. If those blood guard the High Lord sent out were able to do their jobs, there should be plenty of supplies along the way. We'll catch up to you in the center plains. His voice was stiff with awareness of the difficulty she faced. Amarine responded with a nod that expressed her seasoned resolve. A light rain started to fall. Troy's vision became so clouded that he could no longer make out individual figures in the massed war ward. He gave the first half a tight salute, and she turned to lead the warriors angling away from the road. The lords and lore wardens gave a shout of encouragement, but Troy did not join it. He took Merrill to the top of a bare knoll and stood there with his ebony sword raised against the drizzle while the whole length of his army passed by like a shadow in the fog below him. He told himself that the war ward was not going into battle without him that his warriors would only march until he rejoined them. But the thought did not ease him. The war ward was his tool, his means of serving the land, and when he returned to the other riders he felt awkward, disjointed, almost dismembered, as if only the skill of the Rani Hin kept him on balance. He rode on through the rest of the day, wrapped in the familiar loneliness of the blind, the drizzle continued throughout the remainder of the afternoon, all that night, and most of the next day. Despite the piled thickness of the clouds, the rain did not come down hard. But it kept out the sunlight, tormented Troy by obscuring his vision. In the middle of the night, sleeping in wet blankets that seemed to cling to him like winding sheets, he was snatched awake by a wild, inchoate conviction that the weather would be overcast when he went into battle at Doom's retreat. He needed sunlight, clarity. If he could not see... He arose depressed, and did not recover his usual confidence until the rain clouds finally blew away to the east, letting the sun return to him. Before mid-morning the next day, the company of the lords came in sight of the Merrill River. They had been traveling faster since they had left the war ward, and when they reached the river, the northern boundary of Trothgard, they were halfway to Revelwood. The Merrill flowed out of high places in the western mountains and ran first northeast, 
then southeast until it joined the Grey, became part of the Grey, and went eastward to the Solzees. Beyond the Merrill was the region where the Lords concentrated their efforts to heal the ravages of desecration and war. Trothgard had borne the name Kurosh Planthor, stricken stone, from the last years of Kevin Landwaster, until it was rechristened when the new lords first swore their oath of service after the desecration. At that time the region had been completely blasted and barren. The last great battle between the lords and the despiser had taken place there, and had left it burned, ruined, soaked in scorched blood, almost soilless. Some of the old tales said that Kurosh Plenthor had smoked and groaned for a hundred years after that last battle, and forty years ago the Merle River had still run thick with eroded and unfertile mud. But now there was only a trace of silt left in the current. For all the limitations of their comprehension, the lords had learned much about the nurturing of damaged earth from the second ward, and on this day the Merrill carried only a slight haze of impurity. Because of centuries of past erosion, it lay in a ravine like a crack across the land. But the sides of the ravine were gentle and deep-rooted grasses and shrubs, and healthy trees lifted their boughs high out of the gully. The Merrill was a vital river again. Looking down into it from the edge of the ravine, the company paused for a moment of gladness. Together, Elena, Moram, and Amatin sang softly part of the Lord's Oath. Then they galloped down the slope and across the road ford, so that the hooves of the Ranihin and the horses made a gay, loud splashing as they passed into Trothgard. This region lay between the western mountains and the Merl, Grey, and Rill rivers. Within these borders the effects of the Lord's care were everywhere, in everything. Generations of lords had made stricken stone into a hail woodland, a wide hilly country of forests and glades and dales. Whole grassy hillsides were vivid with small blue and yellow flowers. For scores of leagues south and west of the riders, profuse oleantha and deep grass were full of gold-leaved gildan and other trees, cherry and apple and white linden, prodigious oaks and elms and maples, anademed in autumn glory. The air that for decades after the battle had still echoed with the blasts and shrieks of war was now so clear and clean that it seemed to glisten with bird calls. This was what Troy had first seen when his vision began. This was what Elena had used to teach him the meaning of sight. Riding now on Merrill's back under brilliant sun in Trothgard's luminous ambience, he felt more free of care than he had for a long time. As the company of the lords moved through the early part of the afternoon, the country around them changed. Piles of tumbled rock began to appear among the trees and through the greensward. Rugged boulders, several times taller than the riders, thrust their heads out of the ground, and smaller stones overgrown with moss and lichen lay everywhere. Soon the company seemed to be riding within the ancient rubble of a shattered mountain, a tall incongruous peak which had risen out of the hills of Kurosh Plenthor until some immense force had blasted it to bits. They were approaching the rock gardens of the Merl. Troy had never taken the time to study the gardens, but he knew that they were said to be the place where the best Surupa Merl craftmasters of the Rada Merl did their boldest work. Though in the past few years he had ridden along this road through the bristling rocks many times, he could not say where the gardens themselves began, except for a steady increase in the amount of rubble lying on or sticking through the grass. He could locate no specific changes or boundaries until the company crested a hill above a wide valley. Then, at least, he was sure that he was in one of the gardens. Most of the long, high hillside facing the valley was thickly covered with stones, as if it had once been the heart of an ancient shattered peak. The rocks clustered and bulged on all sides, raising themselves up in huge piles or massive single boulders, 
so that virtually the only clear ground on the steep slope was the roadway. None of these rocks and boulders was polished or chipped or shaped in any way, though scattered individual stones and clusters of stones appeared to have had their moss and lichen cleaned away, and they all seemed to have been chosen for their natural grotesquerie. Instead of sitting or resting on the ground, they jutted and splintered and scowled and squatted and gaped, reared and cowered and blustered like a mad packed throng of troglodytes, terrified or ecstatic to be breathing open air. On its way to the valley, the road wandered among the weird shapes as if it were lost in a garish forest, so that as they moved downward, the riders were constantly in the shadow of one tormented form or another. Troy knew that the jumbled amazement of that hillside was not natural. It had been made by men for some reason which he did not grasp. On past journeys, he had never been interested enough in it to ask about its significance. But now he did not object when High Lord Elena suggested that the company go to look at the work from a distance. Across the grassy bottom of the valley was another hill, even steeper and higher than the one it faced. The road turned left and went away along the bottom of the valley, ignoring the plainer hill. Elena suggested that the riders climb this hill to look back at the gardens. She spoke to her companions generally, but her gaze was on Covenant. When he acquiesced with a vague shrug, she responded as if he had expressed the willingness of all the riders. The front of the hill was too steep for the horses, so they turned right and cantered up the valley until they found a place where they could swing around and mount the hill from behind. As they rode, Troy began to feel mildly expectant. The High Lord's eagerness to show the view to Covenant invested it with interest. He remembered other surprises, like the Hall of Gifts, which had not interested him until Moram had practically dragged him to it. At the top, the hill bulged into a bare knoll. The riders left their mounts behind and climbed the last distance on foot. They moved quickly, sharing Elena's mood, and soon reached the crest. Across the valley, the rock garden lay open below them, displayed like a bar-relief. From this distance they could easily see that all its jumbled rock formed a single pattern. Out of tortured stone, the makers of the garden had designed a wide face, a broad countenance with lumped, gnarled, and twisted features. The unevenness of the rock made the face appear bruised and contorted. Its eyes were as ragged as deep wounds, and the roadway cut through it like an aimless scar. But despite all this, the face was stretched with a grin of immense cheerfulness. The unexpectedness of it startled Troy into a low, glad burst of laughter. Though the lords and lore wardens were obviously familiar with the garden, all their faces shared a look of joy, as if the displayed hilarious grin were contagious. My Lord Elena clasped her hands together to contain a surge of happiness, and Lord Moram's eyes glittered with keen pleasure. Only Covenant did not smile or nod, or show any other sign of gladness. His face was as gaunt as a shipwreck. His eyes held a restless, haggard look of their own, and his right hand fumbled at his ring in a way that emphasized his two missing fingers. After a moment he muttered through the company's murmuring, Well, the giant certainly must be proud of you. His tone was ambiguous, as if he were trying to say two contradictory things at once, but his reference to the giants overshadowed anything else he might have meant. Lord Amatin's smile faltered, and a sudden scrutinizing gleam sprang from under Moram's brows. Elena moved toward him, intending to speak, but before she could begin he went on. I knew a woman like that once. He was striving to sound casual, but his voice was awkward. At the leprosarium. Troy groaned inwardly, but held himself still. She was beautiful. Of course, I didn't know her then. 
and she didn't have any pictures of herself, or if she did, she didn't show them. I don't think she could even stand to look in the mirror any more. But the doctors told me that she used to be beautiful. She had a smile. Even when I knew her, she could still smile. It looked just like that. He nodded in the direction of the rock garden, but he did not look at it. He was concentrating on his memory. She was a classic case. As he continued, his tone became harsher and more bitter. He articulated each word distinctly, as if it had jagged edges. She was exposed to leprosy as a kid in the Philippines or somewhere. Her parents were stationed there in the military, I suppose. And it caught up with her right after she got married. Her toes went numb. She should have gone to a doctor right then, but she didn't. She was one of those people whom you can't interrupt. She couldn't take time away from her husband and friends to worry about cold toes. So she lost her toes. She finally went to a doctor when her feet began to cramp so badly that she could hardly walk. And eventually he figured out what was wrong with her and sent her to the leprosarium. And the doctors there had to amputate. That gave her some trouble. It's hard to walk when you don't have any toes. But she was irrepressible. Before long she was back with her husband. But she couldn't have any kids. It's just criminal folly for lepers who know better to have any kids. Her husband understood that, but he still wanted children. And so in due course he divorced her. That hurt her, but she survived it. Before long she had a job and new friends and a new life. And she was back in the leprosarium. She was just too full of vitality and optimism to take care of herself. This time, two of her fingers were numb. That cost her her job. She was a secretary and needed her fingers. And, of course, her boss didn't want any lepers working for him. But once her disease was arrested again, she learned how to type without using those dead fingers. Then she moved to a new area, got another job, more new friends and went right on living as if absolutely nothing had happened. At about this time, or so they told me, she conceived a passion for folk dancing. She'd learned something about it in her travels as a kid, and now it became her hobby, her way of making new friends and telling them that she loved them. With her bright clothes and her smile, she was... He faltered then went on almost at once. But she was back in the leprosarium two years later. She didn't have very good footing, and she took too many falls, and not enough medication. This time she lost her right leg below the knee. Her sight was starting to blur, and her right hand was pretty much crippled. Lumps were growing in her face, and her hair was falling out. As soon as she learned how to hobble around on her artificial limb, she started folk dancing lessons for the lepers. The doctors kept her a long time, but finally she convinced them to let her out. She swore she was going to take better care of herself this time. She'd learned her lesson, she said, and she wasn't ever coming back. For a long time she didn't come back. But it wasn't because she didn't need to. Bit by bit, she was whittling herself away. When I met her, she was back at the leprosarium because a nursing home had thrown her out. She didn't have anything left except her smile. I spent a lot of time in her room, watching her lie there in bed, listening to her talk. I was trying to get used to the stench. Her face looked as if the doctors hit her with clubs every morning but she still had that smile. Of course, most of her teeth were gone, but her smile hadn't changed. She tried to teach me to dance. She'd make me stand where she could see me, and then she'd tell me where to put my feet, when to jump, how to move my legs. 
Again he faltered. And in between. She used to take hours telling me what a full life she'd had. She must have been all of forty years old. Abruptly he stooped to the ground, snatched up a stone, and hurled it with all his strength at the grinning face of the rock garden. His throw fell far short, but he did not stop to watch the stone roll into the valley. Turning away from it, he rasped thickly. If I ever get my hands on her husband, I'll wring his bloody neck. Then he strode down off the knoll toward the horses. In a moment he was astride his mount and galloping away to rejoin the road. Bonor was close behind him. Troy took a deep breath, trying to shake off the effect of Covenant's tale, but he could think of nothing to say. When he looked over to Elena, he saw that she was melding with Moram and Amatin, as if she needed their support to bear what she had heard. After a moment, Moram said aloud, Er Lord Covenant is a prophet. Does he foretell the fate of the land? Amatin asked painfully. No! Elena's denial was fierce, and Moram breathed also. No. But Troy could hear that Moram meant something different. Then the melding ended, and the lords returned to their mounts. Soon the company was back on the road riding after Covenant in the direction of Revelwood. For the rest of the afternoon, Troy was too disturbed by the Lord's reaction to Covenant to relax and enjoy the journey. But the next day he found a way to soothe his vague distress. He envisioned in detail the separate progresses of the war ward, the blood guard riding with Lord Colandrill, the mounted ear ward rafting and galloping, the warriors marching behind Amarine. On his mental map of the land, these various thrusts had a deliberate symmetry that pleased him in some fundamental way. Before long he began to feel better. And Trothgard helped him also. South of the rock gardens, the land's mantle of soil became thicker and more fertile, so that the hills through which the company rode had no bare stone jutting up among the grass and flowers. Instead, Copses and broad swaths of woodland grew everywhere, punctuating the slopes and unfurling oratorically across the vales and valleys. Under the bright sky and the autumn balm of Trothgard, Troy put his uncertainty about Covenant behind him like a bad dream. At that point, even the problem of communications did not bother him. Ordinarily, he was even more concerned by his inability to convey messages to Quan than by his ignorance of what was happening to Korik's mission. But he was on his way to Revelwood. High Lord Elena had promised him that the Lord's Rot was working on his problem. He looked forward hopefully to the chance that the students of the staff had found a solution for him. That evening he enjoyed the singing and talk of the Lords around the campfire. Moram was withdrawn and silent, with a strange look of foreboding in his eyes and Covenant glowered glum and taciturn into the coals of the fire. But High Lord Elena was in vibrant good spirits. With Armitin, she spread a mood of humor and gaiety over the company, until even the somberest of the lore wardens seemed to effervesce. Troy thought that she had never looked more lovely. Yet he went to the blindness of his bed with an ache in his heart. He could not help knowing that Elena exerted her brilliance for Covenant's sake, not for his. He fell at once into sleep, as if to escape his sightlessness. But in the darkest part of the moonless night, sharp voices and the stamping of hooves roused him. Through the obscure illumination of the fire embers, he saw a blood guard on a Ranihin standing in the center of the camp. The Ranihin steamed in the cold air. It had galloped hotly to reach the lords. First Mark Moran and Lord Moram already stood by the Rani Hin, and the High Lord was hurrying from her blankets with Lord Amatin behind her. Troy threw an armful of kindling on the fire. The sudden blaze gave him a better view of the blood guard. 
The grime of hard fighting streaked his face, and among the rents there were patches of dried blood on his robe. He dismounted slowly, as if he were tired or reluctant. Troy felt his balance suddenly waver, as if the tree limb of his efforts for the land had jumped under his feet. He recognized the blood guard. He was Runnick, one of the members of Korik's mission to Sea Reach. Chapter 14 Runnick's Tale For a moment, Troy groped around him, trying to regain his balance. Runnick should not be here. It was too soon. Only twenty-three days had passed since the departure of Korik's mission. Even the mightiest Ronikin could not gallop to Sea Reach and back in that time. So Ronik's arrival here meant... meant... Even before the High Lord could speak, Troy found himself demanding in a constricted voice, What happened? What happened? But Elena stopped him with a sharp word. He could see that the implications of Ronik's presence were not lost on her. She stood with the staff of law planted firmly on the ground, and her face was full of fire. At her side, Covenant had a look of nausea, as if he were already sickened by what he expected to hear. He had the aspect of a man who wanted to know whether or not he had a terminal illness as he rasped at the blood guard. Are they dead? Runnick ignored both Covenant and Troy. He nodded to First Mark Moran, then bowed slightly to the High Lord. Despite its flatness, his countenance had a reluctant cast, an angle of unwillingness that made Troy groan in anticipation. Speak, Runnick, Elena said sternly. What word have you brought to us? And after her, Morin said, Speak, so that the lords may hear you. Yet Runnick did not begin. Barely visible in the background of his unblinking gaze, there was an ache a pang that Troy had never expected to see in any blood guard. Sweet Jesus, he breathed. How bad is it? Then Lord Moram spoke. Runnick, he said softly, the mission to Sea Reach was given into the hands of the blood guard. This is a difficult burden, for you are vowed to the preservation of the Lords above all things. There is no blame for you if your vow and the mission have come into conflict, requiring that one or the other must be set aside. There can be no doubt of the blood guard, whatever the doom that brings you to us thus battle-rent at the dark of the moon. For a moment longer, Runnick hesitated. Then he said, High Lord, I have come from the depths of Saren Grave Flat from the defiles course and the mission to sea reach to me and to pren and porib with me korik said return to the high lord tell her all all the words of warhaft herken all the struggles of the ranihin all the attacks of the lurker tell her of the fall of lord shitra Amatin moaned in her throat, and Moram stiffened. But Elena held Runnick with the intensity of her face. She will know how to hear this tale of giants and ravers. Tell her that the mission will not fail. Fist and faith, we three responded. We will not fail. But for four days we strove with the Saren grave and Pren fell to the lurker that has awakened. Then we won our way to the west of the flat, and there regained our Ranihin. With our best speed we rode toward Revelstone, but when we entered Grimmardhor, we were beset by wolves and Irviles, though we saw no sign of them when we passed eastward. Porib and his Ranihin fell, so that I might escape, and I rode onward. Then, on the west of Grimmadhor, I met with scouts of the War Ward, and learned that corruption was marching, and that the High Lord had ridden toward Revelwood. 
So I turned aside from Revelstone and came in pursuit to find you here. High Lord, there is much that I must say. We will hear you, Elena said. Come. Turning, she moved to the campfire. There she seated herself with Moram and Amatin beside her. At a sign from her, Vanik sat down opposite her and allowed one of the lore wardens who had skill as a healer to clean his cuts. Troy piled wood on the fire so that he could see better, then positioned himself near the lords on the far side from Covenant. In a moment, Rannick began to speak. At first, his narration was brief and awkward. The blood guard lacked the giant's gift for storytelling. He skimmed crucial subjects and ignored things his hearers needed to know. But the lords questioned him carefully, and Covenant repeatedly insisted on details. At times he seemed to be trying to stall the narrative, postpone the moment when he would have to hear its outcome. Gradually, the events of the mission began to emerge in a coherent form. Troy listened intensely. He could see nothing beyond the immediate light of the campfire. Nothing distracted his attention. Despite the flatness of Runnick's tone, the war mark seemed to see what he was hearing, as if the mission were taking place in the air before him. The mission had made its way eastward through Grimmard Hoare, and then for three days had ridden in rain. But no rain could halt the Rani Hin, and this was no great storm. On the eighth day of the mission, when the clouds broke and let sunlight return to the earth, Horik and his party were within sight of Mount Thunder. It grew steadily against the sky as they rode through the sunshine. They passed twenty-five leagues to the north of it and reached the great cliff of Landsdrop late that afternoon. They were at one of its highest points and could look out over the lower land from a vantage of more than four thousand feet. Here Landsdrop was as sheer as if the lower land had been cut away with an axe, and below it, beyond a hilly strip of grassland less than five leagues wide, lay Saren Grey Flat. It was a wetland, latticed with waterways like exposed veins in the flesh of the ground, overgrown with fervid luxuriance and full of subtle dangers. Strange, treacherous, water-bred, and man-shy animals. Cunning old, half-rotten willows and cypresses that sang quiet songs which could bind the unwary. Stagnant, poisonous pools, so covered with slime and mud and shallow plants, that they looked like solid ground. Lush flowers, beautifully bedewed with clear liquids that could drive humans mad. Deceptive stretches of dry ground that turned suddenly to quicksand. All this was familiar to the blood guard, however ominous to human eyes or unsuited to human life. Sauron Grey Flat was not naturally evil. Rather, because of the darknesses which slumbered beneath it, it was simply dangerous, a wild haven for the misborn of the land, the warped fruit of evils long past. The giants, who knew how to be wary, had always been able to travel freely through the flat, and they had kept paths open for others, so that the crossing of the Sauron Grave was not normally a great risk. But now something else met the gaze of the mission. Slumbering evil stirred. The hand of corruption was at work, awakening old wrongs. The peril was severe, and Lord Hiram was dismayed, but neither the lords nor the bloodguard were surprised. The lords Colindril and Amatin, the bloodguard Morrill and Coral had spoken of this danger, and though he was dismayed, Lord Hiram did not propose that the mission should evade the danger by riding north and around Sauron Grave Flat, a hundred leagues from their way. Therefore, in the dawn of the ninth day, the mission descended Landsdrop, using a horse trail which the old lords had made in the great cliff and rode eastward across the grassland foothills toward the main giant way through the Sauron Grave. The air was noticeably warmer and thicker than it had been above Landsdrop. It breathed as if it were clogged with invisible, damp fibers, 
and it seemed to leave something behind in the lungs when it was exhaled. Then shrubs and low, twisted bushes began to appear through the grass, and the grass itself grew longer, wetter. At odd intervals, stray, hidden puddles of water splashed under the hooves of the Ranihin. Soon gnarled, lichenous trees appeared, spread out moss-draped limbs. They grew thicker and taller as the mission passed into the Sarin grave. In moments, the riders entered a grassy avenue that lay between two unrippling pools and angled away just north of eastward into a jungle which already appeared impenetrable. The Ranihin slowed to a more cautious pace. Abruptly, they found themselves plunging through chest-deep elephant grass. When the riders looked behind them, they could see no trace of the giant way. The flat had closed like jaws. But the blood guard knew that that was the way of the Sauron grave. Only the path ahead was visible. The Ranihin moved on, thrusting their broad chests through the grass. As the jungle tightened, the giant way narrowed until they could ride no more than three abreast, each of the lords flanked by blood guard. But the elephant grass receded, allowing them to move with better speed. Their progress was loud. They disturbed the flat, and as they traveled they set waves and wakes and noise on both sides. Birds and monkeys gibbered at them. Small furry animals that yipped like hyenas broke out of the grass in front of them and scurried away. And when the jungle gave way on either side for dark, rancid pools or sluggish streams, waterfowl with iridescent plumage clattered fearfully into the air. Sudden splashes echoed across still ponds. Pale, vaguely human forms darted away under the ripples. Throughout the morning, the mission followed the winding trail which careful giants had made in times long past. No danger threatened, but still the Ranihin grew tense. When the riders stopped beside a shallow lake to rest and eat, their mounts became increasingly restive. Several of them made low, blowing noises. Their ears were up and alert, shifting directions in sharp jerks, almost quivering. One of them, the youngest stallion bearing the blood-guard tull, stamped a hoof irrhythmically. The horses and the blood-guard increased their caution and rode on down the giant way. They had covered only two more leagues when Sill called the blood-guard to observe Lord Hiram. The Lord's face was flushed as if he had a high fever. Sweat rolled down his cheeks, and he was panting hoarsely, almost gasping for breath. His eyes glittered. But he was not alone. Lord Sheetra, too, was flushed and panting. Then even the blood guard found that they were having trouble breathing. The air felt turgid. It resisted being drawn into their lungs, and once within them it clung there with miry fingers, like the grasp of quicksand. The sensation grew rapidly worse. Suddenly all the noise of the flat ceased. It was as Lord Colandrill had said. But the Lord Armiton's mount had not been a Ranihin. Trusting to the great horses, the mission continued on its way. The riders moved slowly. The Ranihin walked with their heads straining forward, ears cocked, nostrils flared. They were sweating, though the air was not warm. They covered a few hundred yards this way, forcing passage through the stubborn, mucky air and the silence. After that, the jungle fell away on both sides. The giant way lay along a grassy ridge like a dam between two still pools. One of them was blue and bright, reflecting the sky and the afternoon sunlight. But the other was dark and rank. The mission was halfway down the ridge when the sound began. It started, low, wet and weak, like the groan of a dying man. But it seemed to come from the dark pool. It transfixed the riders. As they listened to it, it slowly swelled. It scaled upward in pitch and volume, became a ragged scream echoed across the pools. Higher and louder it went on. 
Through it, the lords shouted together, Melancurian Abatha, Duroc Minas Mil Cabal. But they could hardly make themselves heard. Then the young Rani Hin bearing Tull lost control. It whinnied in fear, whirled and sprang toward the blue pool. As it leaped, Tull threw himself to the safety of the grass. The Rani Hin crashed into the chest-deep water. At once it gave a squeal of pain that almost matched the screaming in the air. Plunging frantically, it heaved itself out of the pool and fled westward, back down the giant way. The howling mounted eagerly higher. The other Rani Hin broke and bolted. They reared, spun, pounded away after their fleeing brother. The jerk of their start unhorsed Lord Hiram, and he only saved himself from the dark pool by a thrust of his staff. Immediately Lord Sheetra dropped off her mount to join him. Sill, Karen, and Corrick also dismounted. As he jumped, Corrick ordered the other blood guard to protect the Rani Hin. Ronick and his comrades clung to their horses. The Rani Hin followed the injured stallion. As they raced, the howling behind them faded and the air began to thin. But for some distance, the blood guard could not regain control of their mounts. The Rani Hin plunged along a wide path which was unfamiliar. The blood guard knew that they had missed the giant way. Then the leading Rani Hin crested a knoll and blundered without warning into a quagmire. But the rest of the great horses were able to stop safely. The blood guard dismounted and took clinger lines from their packs. By the time Corrick, Karen, Sill, Tull, and the lords reached them, the free Rani Hin were busy pulling their trapped kindred from the quagmire. Seeing that the other Rani Hin were uninjured, the lords turned to the stallion which had jumped into the pool. It stood to one side, champed its teeth, and jerked its head from side to side in agony, under its coat all the flesh of its limbs and belly was covered with blisters and boils. Blood streamed from its sores. Through some of them the bone was visible. Despite the determination in its eyes, it whimpered at the pain. The lords were deeply moved. There were tears in Hiram's eyes, and Sheetra cursed bitterly. But they could do nothing. They were not ramen and they could find no Amanibhavam, that potent yellow-flowered grass which could heal horses, but which drove humans mad. They could only close their ears to the stallion's pain and try to consider what course the mission should take. Soon all the other Rani Hin were safe on solid ground. They shed the mud of the quagmire easily, but they could not rid themselves of the shame of their panic. Their eyes showed that they felt they had disgraced themselves. But when they heard the whimpering of their injured brother, they pricked up their ears. They shuffled their feet and nudged each other. Slowly, their eldest went to face Tull's mount. For a moment the two spoke together, nose to nose. Several times the younger Rani Hin nodded its head. Then the old Rani Hin reared, he stretched high in the ancient Ranihin expression of homage. When he descended, he struck the head of his injured brother powerfully with both four hooves. The younger horse shuddered once under the force of the blow and fell dead. The rest of the Ranihin watched in silence. When their eldest turned away from the fallen horse, they nickered their approval and sorrow softly. In their own way the blood guard were not unmoved, but High Lord Elena had given the need of the giants into their hands. To the lords, Corrick said, We must go. The mission waits. Tal may ride with Doar. No, Lord Chitra cried. We will take the Rani Hin no deeper into Sarangrave Flat. And Lord Hiram said, Friend Corrick, Surely you know as much as we of this force which forbids us to cross the flat. Surely you know that to stop us, this force must first see us. It must perceive us and know where we are. Corrick nodded. Then you must also know that it is no easy matter to sense the presence of human beings. We are mere ordinary life amid the multitudes of the Sarangrave. 
but the Rani Hin are unordinary. They are stronger than we. The power of life burns more brightly in them. Their presence here is more easily seen than ours. It may be that the force against us is attuned to them. The despiser is wise enough for such strategy. For this reason, we must travel without the Rani Hin. The mission requires their speed, Korik said. We lack the time to walk. I know, Hiram sighed. Without mishap, we would spend at least one full cycle of the moon at that journey. But to ride around the Saran grave would take too long also. Therefore we must ride through. We must fight. Ride through forsooth, Sheetra snapped. We do not know how to fight such a thing, or we would have given it battle already. I tell you plainly, Korik, if we encounter that forbidding again, we will lose more than Ranihin. No, we must go another way. What way? For a moment the lords gazed into each other. Then Lord Sheetra said, We will build a raft and ride the defile's course. The bloodguard was surprised. Even the boat-loving giants chose to walk Sauron Grave Flat rather than to put themselves in the hands of that river. Korik said, Can it be done? We will do it, Sheetra replied. Seeing the strength of her purpose, the bloodguard responded to themselves, We will do it. And Korik said, Then we must make great haste while the Rani Hin are yet with us. So began the great run of the Rani Hin, in which the horses of Ra redeemed their shame. When all the riders had remounted, they moved cautiously back to the true path of the giant way. But then the Rani Hin cast all but the simplest caution to the wind. First at a canter, then galloping, they ran westward out of the peril of the Sauron grave. This was no gait for distance, no easy, strength-conserving pace. It was a gallop to surpass the best fleetness of ordinary horses, and it did not slow or falter. At full stretch the Rani Hin came out of Sauron Grave Flat under the eaves of Landsdrop before moonrise. Then they veered away just east of southward along the line of the cliff. On the open ground their running became harder. The rough foothills of lands drop, cut across their way like rumpled folds in the earth, forced them to plummet down and then labor up on certain slopes twenty times a league. And southward the terrain worsened. The grass slowly failed from the hillsides, so that the Rani Hin pounded over bare rock and shale and scree. The moon was nearly full, and in its light Mount Thunder, Ancient Graven Threndor was visible against the sky. Already it dominated the southern horizon, and as the mission travelled, it lifted its crown higher and higher. Under its shadow, the Rani Hin mastered both the night and the foothills. Breathing hoarsely, blowing foam, sweating and straining extremely, but never faltering, they struck daylight no more than five leagues from the defile's course. Now they began to stumble and slip on the hillsides, scattering froth from their lips, tearing the skin of their knees. Yet they refused to fail. In the middle of the morning on the tenth day, they lumbered over the crest of one ankle and dropped down into the narrow valley between Mount Thunder's legs, the valley of the defile's course. To their right, at the base of the mountain, was the head of the river, there, rank black water erupted, roaring from under a sheer cliff. This was the Solzies River of Andelaine transformed. That fair river entered Mount Thunder through Treacher's Gorge, then plunged into the depths of the earth, where it ran through abandoned white warrens and demon-dim breeding dens, cave whitish slag and refuse pits, charnels and offal grounds and lakes of acid, the excreta of the buried banes. When it broke out, thick, oily, and fetid, at the base of Graven Threndor, 
It carried the sewage of the catacombs, the pollution of ages of filthy use. From Mount Thunder to Life Swallower, the Great Swamp, nothing lived along the banks of the defile's course except Sauron Grave Flat, which grew thickest on either side of the course, flourishing on the black water. But high in the sides of the valley were two or three thin streams of clean water, which nourished grass and shrubs and some trees, so that only the bottom of the valley was barren. There the Rani Hin rested at last. Quivering and blowing, they put their noses in a stream to drink. The lords disregarded their own weariness, went immediately in search of Amanibhavam. Shortly Shitra returned with a double handful of the horse-healing grass. With it she tended the Rani Hin, while Hiram brought more of it to her. Only when all the great horses had eaten some of the Amanibhavam did the lords allow themselves to rest. Then the blood guard turned their attention to the task of building a raft. The only trees hardy enough to grow in the valley were teaks, and in one stand nearby three of the tallest were dead. Their ironwood trunks showed what had happened to them. When they had grown above a certain size, their roots had reached down deep enough to touch soil soaked by the river, and so they had died. Using hatchets and clingor ropes, the blood guard were able to bring down these three trees. Each they sectioned into four logs of roughly equal length. When they had rolled the logs down to the dead bank of the course, they began lashing them together with clingor thongs. The task was slow because of the size and weight of the ironwood logs, and the blood guard worked carefully to make sure that the raft was secure. But they were fifteen, and made steady progress. Shortly after noon the raft was complete. After they had prepared several steering poles, they were ready to continue on their way. The lords readied themselves also. After a moment of melding, they bid ceremonious farewell to the Rani Hin. Then they came down to the banks of the defile's course, and bid Korik launch the raft. Two of the blood guard fastened ropes to the raft, while the others positioned themselves along its sides. Together they lifted the massive ironwood logs, heaved the raft into the river. It bucked in the stiff current, but the two ropes secured it. Karen and Sill leaped out onto it to see how it held together. When they gave their approval, Korik signed for the lords to precede him. Lord Sheetra sprang down to the raft and at once set about wedging her staff between the center logs so that she could use its power for a rudder. Lord Hiram followed her, as did the other blood guard, until only the two who held the ropes remained on the bank. Lord Sheetra began to sing quietly, calling up the earth power through her staff. When she was ready, she nodded to Korik. At his command, the last two blood guards sprang for the raft as the current ripped it away. The raft plunged, swirled, the boiling water spun it out into the middle of the river. But then Lord Sheetra caught her balance. The power of her staff took hold like a gilded load rudder in the hands of a giant. The raft resisted her, but slowly it became steady. She piloted it down the torrent of the stream, and in moments the mission rushed out of the valley back into the grasp of Sauron Grave Flat. Free of the constriction of the valley, the defile's course gradually widened, slowed. Then it began to wind and spill out into the waterways of the Sauron Grave, and the worst of the current was past. For the rest of the afternoon, Lord Sheetra remained in the stern of the raft, guided it along the black water. The riverbed bent and twisted as the defile's course became more and more woven into the fabric of Sauron Grave Flat. Side currents ran into and away from the main stream, and rocky aits topped with tufts of jungle began to dot the river. When the pace of the course grew sluggish, she used her staff to propel the raft. She needed headway to navigate the channels. By evening she was greatly weary. Then four of the blood guard took up the poles and began thrusting the raft through the twilight into night, 
for only their dark familiar eyes could see well enough to keep the raft moving safely. Lord Sheetra ate the meal Hiram prepared for her over a small Lillian Will fire, then dropped into slumber despite the stink and spreading dampness of the river. But at dawn she returned to work, plying the defile's course with her staff. However, Lord Hiram soon came to her aid. Alternately, they propelled the raft throughout the day, and at night they rested while the blood guard used their poles. In this way, the mission traveled down the defile's course until the evening of the twelfth day. During the days, the sky was clear, and the sunlight was full of butterflies. The raft made good progress. But that night, dark clouds hid the moon, and rain soaked the lords, damaging their sleep. When Corrick called to them in the last blackness before dawn, they both threw off their blankets at once and came to their feet. Corrick pointed into the night. In the darkness of a jungled islet ahead of the raft, there was a faint light. It flickered and waned like a weak fire on wet wood, but revealed nothing. As the raft approached the Aet, the Lord stared at it. Then Sheetra whispered, That is a maid light. It is not natural to the Sauron grave. The blood guard agreed. None of the flats light bearing animals or insects were abroad in the rain. Pull into the islet, Sheetra breathed. We must see the maker of this light. Corrick gave the orders. The blood guard at the poles moved the raft so that it floated toward the head of the islet. When it was within ten yards of the edge, Doar and Pren slipped into the water. They swam to the ayat, then faded up into the underbrush. The steersman swung the raft so that it floated downstream within jumping distance of the bank. The islet was long and narrow. As the mission floated by, almost within reach of the low-hanging branches, the light came into clearer view. It was a thin flame, a weak flickering like the burn of a torch, but it revealed nothing around it except the tree shadows which passed between it and the raft. When the raft was some distance past it, the light went out. Both the lords started, raised their staffs, but they said nothing. The steering blood guard leaned on their poles until one side of the raft nudged the bank. Almost at once, Doar and Pren leaped out onto the logs, bearing between them the battered form of a man. Immediately, the steersman sent the raft swinging out into the main channel. Lord Hiram bent to light a Lillian Will rod. In the rain, the torch shone dimly, but it revealed the man. His face and limbs were streaked with dirt and grime, clotted with the blood of numerous small wounds, cuts and scratches. Surrounded by dirt and blood, the whites of his eyes glistened. His clothes, like the wounds and mud on him, spoke of a long struggle to survive the flat. The remains of a uniform hung about him in shreds. Only one piece of his apparel was intact. He wore a scarred metal breastplate, yellow under the filth, with one black diagonal insignia across it. By the seven, Lord Sheetra said, a war haft! She caught hold of the man's shoulders, but then she recoiled as if the man had burned her. Melancurion! War haft! she cried. What has been done to you? Your flesh is ice! The man gave no sign that he heard her. He stood where Doar and Pren had placed him, and his head hung to one side. His breathing was shallow. He did not move in any way except to blink his eyes at long intervals. But Sheetra did not wait for answers. Hear him, she said. This man is freezing. She snatched up her blanket, threw it over him. Lord Hiram built his torch into a fire. There he boiled a stoneware pot of water until it was clean, while Sheetra seated the man by the fire. 
she took hold of his head to force some spring wine between his lips. The cold of his flesh blistered her fingers. She and Hiram wrapped their hands in blankets for protection, then laid the man down by the fire and stripped him of his rags. They washed him with boiling water. When he was clean, Lord Sheetra drew a stone vial of hurt loam from her robe and spread some of the healing mud over the worst of his wounds. Dawn came through the rain. In the light, the blood guard saw the result of the Lord's work. The man's skin looked like the flesh of a corpse. On his wounds the hurt loam lay impotent. The cold in him was uneased. Yet he breathed and blinked. When the lords covered him and lifted him into a sitting posture, he squeezed his eyes, and water began to run from them like tears. It spread out over his cheeks and formed beads of ice in his beard. By the seven, by the seven, Lord Sheetra moaned, he is dead, and yet he lives. What has been done to him? Lord Hiram made no answer. After a time, Corrick spoke for the blood guard. He is Herkin, a warhaft of the war ward. He commanded the first Eoman of the tenth Eoward. The High Lord sent his command to seek out the giants in Sea Reach. Yes, Hiram murmured. I remember. When his Eoman did not return, the High Lord sent Colindril and Amatin to attempt the Sauron grave. Twenty-one warriors. War haft Herkin and his command. All lost. Colindril and Amatin found no trace. Lord Sheetra addressed herself to the man. Herkin, War haft Herkin, do you hear me? Speak. I am Sheetra Veerment, mate. Lord of the Council of Revelstone, I adjure you to speak. At first, Herkin did not respond. Then his jaw moved, and a low noise came from his mouth. I am Ahamkara, the door. I am sent. His voice trailed off into the flow of his tears. Sent! Door, Sheetra said. Herkin, speak. The war half did not seem to hear. He sat in silence while his tears formed clusters of ice in his beard. Then Lord Hiram commanded, Ahamkara, answer. Herkin swallowed and spoke. I am Ahamkara, the door. I am sent to bear witness to... To... He faltered, but resumed a moment later. I am sent to bear witness to the downfall of giants. For all the blood guard, Corrick said, You lie! And Lord Sheetra sprang on Herkin. Regardless of the pain, she gripped his face between her hands and shouted, Despiser! He gave a cry and tore himself from her grasp. Huddling with his face against the logs of the raft, he sobbed like a child. Appalled, Sheetra backed away from him. At Lord Hiram's side, she stopped and waited. Long moments passed before Herkin moved. Then he pushed himself up into his former posture. Still his tears ran down into his beard. The downfall of giants. There were three, brothers of one birth, omen of the end. They serve Satan's heart's soul crusher. He stopped again. After a moment, Corrick said, This cannot be. It is impossible. The giants of Sea Reach are the rock brothers of the land. Herkin did not respond. Staring at the logs of the raft, he sat like dead clay. But soon he spoke again. Crusher, they are named Flesh Harrower, Satan's Fist. 
and one other not to be named. He swallowed once more. They are three ravers. For a time, all the mission was silent. Then both Hiram and Sheetra strove to compel Hurkin to say more, but he remained beyond their reach, unspeaking. At last, Lord Sheetra said to Hiram, How do you hear his words? What meaning do you see? I hear truth, Lord Hiram said, omen of the end. Korik said, No, by the vow, it is impossible. Quickly, Lord Hiram said, Do not swear by your vow here. His reproof was just. The blood guard was not ignorant of his meaning. Korik did not speak again, but Lord Sheetra said, I agree with Korik. It surpasses belief to think that a raver could master any giant. If the despiser's power extended so far, why did he not enslave giants in the past? Lord Hiram answered her, That is true. The ravers do not suffice. They do not explain. But now Lord Fowl has possession of the ill-earth stone. That was not so in the age of the old lords. Perhaps the ravers and the stone together? Hiram, we are speaking of the giants. If such an ill had come upon them, they would have sent word to us. Yes, Lord Hiram said. How is it done? Done? How were they prevented? What has been done to them? To them, said Lord Sheetra, ask a more immediate question. What has been done to Hurkin? What has been done to us? It is the despiser's way. In the Battle of Soaring Woodhelven, we are told, he damaged the Heer Laura and the child Pietan so that they would help destroy what they loved. They were used to bait a trap. Hear him? We are baited. She did not wait for an answer. She sprang to the rear of the raft, jammed her staff between the logs, began her song. Strength ran through the iron wood. The raft moved forward through the rain. Join me, she called to Lord Hiram. We must flee this place. Lord Hiram climbed wearily to his feet. At Soaring Woodhelven, the trap was complete without Laura and Pietan. They were an arrogance, a taunt, unnecessary. As he spoke, his breath began to labor in his chest. The muscles of his neck corded with the strain of inhaling. The blood guard, too, could not breathe easily. In moments, Hiram fell to his knees, clutching at his chest. Lord Sheetra gasped at the effort of each breath. The rain falling on the river seemed to make no sound. Then Warhaft Hurkin leaped to his feet. From between his lips came a low moan of pain. The sound was terrible. His head bent back, and his cry rose until it became a scream. It was the same scream which had caused the Ranihin to panic. Korik was the first of the blood guard to recover his strength. At once he knocked the war haft from the raft. Hurkin sank like a stone. The voice was immediately silent. Yet the thickness of the air only increased. It tightened around the mission like a fist. Lord Hiram struggled to his feet. To Doar he panted, Did you put out his fire? Hurkin's fire? No, Doar said. It fell when we laid hands upon him. By the seven, Hiram said. It was you, the blood guard, not the Ranihin. This ill force listens to you, to the power of the vow. The blood guard had no answer. The vow was not something which could be concealed or denied. But Lord Sheetra was surprised. Her strength dropped away from the raft. At Korik's command, the four steersmen took up their poles and thrust the raft toward the north bank of the course. He wished to meet the attack on land if he could. He made the steersmen responsible for the raft, then called the other blood guard to the defense of the lords. In that instant, the river erupted. Silently, water blasted upward, hurling the raft into the air, overturning it. Behind the burst, 
a black tentacle flicked out of the water. It twisted, coiled, caught Lord Sheetra. Most of the blood guard dove clear of the fall of the raft, but Sill and Lord Hiram were directly under it. With Pren and Tull, Corrick swam for the place where Lord Sheetra had been taken, but the dark water blinded them. They could see nothing, find nothing. The river seemed to have no bottom. Corrick made his decision. The mission to Sea Reach was in his hands. In a tone that allowed no refusal, he ordered the blood guard out of the course. Soon he stood on the north bank in the fringe of the jungle. Most of the other blood guard were with him. Sill and Lord Hiram had preceded them. The Lord was uninjured. Sill had protected him from the raft. Downriver, two of the steersmen were tying up the raft, while the other two dove for the company's supplies. There was no sign of Karen and Lord Sheetra. Hiram was coughing severely. He had swallowed some of the rank water, but he struggled to his feet and gasped, Save her! But the blood guard made no move to obey. The mission to Sea Reach was in their hands, and they knew that Karen was still alive. He could call to them if their aid would be worth the cost. I tried, Hiram panted, but I cannot swim. Oh, worthless! A convulsion came over him. He threw his arms wide and cried out into the rain, Sheetra! A bolt of power struck from his staff down through the water toward the river bottom. Then he collapsed into Sill's arms. His blast seemed to have an effect. The river around the point of Lord Sheetra's disappearance started to boil. A turmoil in the water sent up gouts of blood and hunks of black flesh. Steam arose from the current. Deep down in the defile's course, a flash of blue was briefly visible. Then a noise like a thunderclap shook the ground. The river hissed like a torment, and the thickness of the air broke. It was swept away as if it had been washed off the Sarin grave. The blood guard knew that Karen was dead. Only one sign came back from Lord Sheetra's struggle. Porib saw it first, dove into the river to retrieve it. Silently, he put it into Lord Hiram's hands, Lord Sheetra's staff. Between its metal shod ends, it was completely burned and brittle. It snapped like kindling in Hiram's grasp. The Lord pulled away from Sill and seated himself against a tree. With tears running openly down his cheeks, he hugged the pieces of Sheetra's staff to his chest. But the peril was not ended. For the sake of his vow, Korik said to the Lord, The lurker is not dead. It has only been cut back here. We must go on. Go, Hiram said. Go on? Sheetra is dead. How can I go on? I feared from the first that your vow was a voice which the evil in the Sarin grave could hear. But I said nothing. There was bitterness in him. I believed that you would speak of it if my fear were justified. Again the blood guard had no answer. They had not known beyond doubt or possibility of error that the lurker was alert to their presence, and so many manifestations of power were not what they appeared to be. In respect for the Lord's grief, the blood guard left him alone while they readied the raft to go on their way. The steersmen had been able to salvage the poles and food, most of the Klingor and Lillian Rill rods, but none of the clothes or blankets. The raft itself was intact. Then Korik spoke to Runnick, Pren, and Porib, charged them to bear word of the mission to High Lord Elena. The three accepted without question, but waited for the mission's departure before starting their westward trek. When all things were prepared, Korik and Sill lifted Lord Hiram between them and guided him like a child down the bank onto the raft. He appeared to be unwell. Perhaps the river water he had swallowed was sickening him. 
As the steersman thrust the raft out into the center of the defile's course, he murmured to himself, This is not the end. There will be pain and death to humble this. Hiram, son of Hul, you are a coward. Then the mission was gone. Together, Runic, Pren, and Porib started into the jungle of Sauron Grey Flat. The fire had died down to coals, and without its light Troy could see nothing, nothing to counteract the images of death and grief in his mind. He knew that there were questions he should ask Runic, but in the darkness they did not seem important. He was dismayed to think that Sheetra's fall had taken place ten days ago. It felt too immediate for such a lapse of time. The lords beside him sat still, as if they were stunned or melding, and Covenant was silent, too moved for speech. But after a time, Helena said with a shudder of emotion in her voice, Ah, vehement, how will you bear it? Her eyes were only visible as embers. In the darkness they had an aspect of focus and unendurable virulence. Softly, Lord Moram sang, Death is passing on, The making way of life and time for life, Hate dying and killing, not death. Be still, heart. Make no expostulation. Hold peace and grief, and be still. Chapter 15 Revel Wood The High Lord's company reached the Lord's Rot by nightfall of the sixth day. During the last leagues, the road worked gradually down into the lowlands of Trothgard, and just as the sun started to dip into the western mountains, the riders entered the wide valley of two rivers. There the Rill and Luralin came together in a broad V, joined each other in the narrow end of the valley, to the left of the riders. The Luralin River, which flowed almost due east below them, arose from clear springs high in the raw rock of the mountains beyond Guard's Gap, and had a power of purity that had rendered it inviolate to all the blood and hacked flesh and blasted earth which had ruined Kurash Plenthor. Now, generations after the desecration, it ran with the same crystal taintlessness which had given it its ancient name, the Luralin. Across the valley was the Rill River, the southern boundary of Trothgard. Like the Merle, the Rill had been greatly improved by the long work of the lords, and the water which flowed from the valley of two rivers no longer deserved the name Grey. In the center of the valley, within the broad middle of the River V, was Revelwood, the tree city of the Lors Rot. It was an immense and expansive banyan, invoked and strengthened by the new knowledge of the Second Ward and by the staff of law. It grew to the height of a mighty oak, sent down roots as thick as hawsers from boughs as broad as walkways, roots which formed new trunks with new boughs and new roots, and spread out in the valley until the central core of the first tree was surrounded by six others, all intergrown, part of each other, the fruit of one seed. Once these seven trunks were established, the shapers of the tree prevented any more of the hanging roots from reaching the ground, and instead wove the thick bundles into chambers and rooms, homes and places of study for the students and teachers of the Lors Rot. Three of the otter trees had been similarly woven before their roots found the soil, and so now their trunks contained cavities large enough for meeting holes and libraries. On the sheltered acres of ground beneath the trees were gardens and practice fields, training areas for the students of both staff and sword. And above the main massive limbs of the trees, the lesser branches had been trained and shaped for leaf-roofed dwellings and open platforms. Revelwood was a thriving city, amply supplied by the fertile lowlands of Trothgard, and the Lors Rot was busier now than at any other time in its history. 
the lore wardens and apprentices of the sword and staff did all the work of the city, all the cooking, farming, herding, cleaning. But they were not its only inhabitants. A band of Lillianrill lived there to care for the tree itself. Visitors came from all over the land. Villages sent emissaries to seek knowledge from the lore wardens. Higher brands came to study the tree, and Gravelinguses used Revelwood as a dwelling from which to visit the rock gardens, and the lords worked there to keep their promises to the land. As the riders looked down at it, its broad, glossy leaves caught the orange-red fire of the sun, so that it appeared to burn proudly above the shadows spreading down the valley. The company responded to the sight with a glad hail. Clapping their heels to their mounts, they galloped down the slope toward the ford of the Luralin. In the time when Revelwood was being grown, the lords had been mindful of its defense. They had made only two fords for the valley, one across each river, and the ford beds were submerged. They had to be raised before they could be used. All the High Lord's company except Covenant had the necessary knowledge and skill, so Troy was vaguely surprised when Elena halted on the river bank and gravely asked Trell to open the ford. Troy understood that she was doing the Gravelinguses an honor, but he did not know why. Her gesture deepened the mystery of Trell. Without meeting her gaze, Trell dismounted and walked to the Luralin's edge. At first he did not appear to know the ford's secret. Troy had learned a few quick words in a strange language and two gestures to raise the bed, but Trell used none of them. He stood on the bank as if he were presenting himself to the deep current and began to sing a rumbling, cryptic song. The rest of the company watched him in hushed stillness. Troy could not grasp the words of the song, but he felt their effect. They had an old, buried, cavernous sound, as if they were being sung by the bedrock of the valley. For a moment they made him want to weep. But soon Trell's singing stopped. In silence he lifted his arms, and the flat rock of the ford stood up out of the river bottom. It broke water in sections, with channels between them, so that it did not dam the current. By the time it was ready for crossing, it was as dry as if it had never been submerged. With his head bowed, Trell walked back to his mount. When the last horse had crossed the river, and all the company was within the valley, the ford closed itself without any of the usual signals. Troy was impressed. Remembering Trell's attack on Covenant, he thought that the unbeliever was lucky to be alive, and he began to feel that he would be well advised to solve the riddle of Trell before he left Trothgard. But he could do nothing immediately. The last twilight was ebbing out of the valley as if the river currents carried the light away, and he had to concentrate to keep a grip on his own location. The lore wardens lit torches, but torchlight could not take the place of the sun. Focusing himself sternly, he rode between Lord Moram and Ruel across the valley toward Revelwood. The High Lord's company was met on the ground near the tree by a welcoming group of lore wardens. They greeted the lords with solemn dignity and embraced their comrades who returned from visiting Lord's Keep. To Warmark Troy, whom they knew well, they gave a special welcome, but when they caught sight of Covenant, they all turned toward him. Squaring their shoulders as if to meet an inspection, they saluted him and said together, Hail, white gold wielder, you who are named Erlord Thomas Covenant, unbeliever and ringthane, be welcome in Revelwood. You are the crux and pivot of our age in the land, the keeper of the wild magic which destroys peace. Honor us by accepting our hospitality. Troy expected some discomforting sarcasm from Covenant, but the unbeliever replied in a gruff, embarrassed voice, Your hospitality honors me. The lore wardens bowed in answer, and their leader stepped forward. He was an old, wrinkled man with hooded eyes and a stooped posture, the result of decades of backbending study. 
His voice had a slight tremor of age. I am Corimini, he said, the eldest of the law's rot. I speak for all the seekers of the law, both sword and staff. The accepting of a gift returns honor to the giver. Be welcome. As he spoke, he held out his hand to help Covenant dismount. But Covenant either misunderstood the gesture or went beyond it intuitively. Instead of swinging off his mount, he brusquely pulled his wedding band from his left hand and dropped it into Coromini's extended palm. The eldest caught his breath. A look of astonishment widened his eyes. Almost at once he turned to show the ring to the other lore wardens. With muted, awed murmurings of invocation like low snatches of prayer, they crowded around Corimini to gaze at the white gold and to handle it with fingers that trembled. But their touches were brief. Shortly Corimini returned to Covenant. The eldest's eyes were damp with emotion and his hand shook as he passed the ring back up to the unbeliever. O oh Lord Covenant, he said with a pronounced quaver, you exceed us. We will need many generations to repay this honor. Command us, so that we may serve you. I don't need service, Covenant replied bluntly. I need an alternative. Find some way to save the land without me. I do not wholly understand you, said Corimini. All our strength is bent toward the preservation of the land. If that may aid you also, we will be pleased. Facing the company of the lords more generally, he went on. Will you now enter Revelwood with us? We have prepared food and pleasure for you. High Lord Elena made a gracious answer and dropped lightly from Mirha's back. The rest of the riders promptly dismounted. At once, a group of students hurried out of the shadows of the tree to take charge of the horses. Then the company was escorted through the ring of trunks toward the central tree. Many lights had appeared throughout Revelwood, and their combined illumination ameliorated the dimness of Troy's sight. He was able to walk confidently with the lords, and to look up with fondness into the branches of the familiar city. In some ways he felt more at home here than in Lord's Keep. In Revelwood he had learned to see. And he felt that Revelwood also suited the High Lord. The two were inextricably linked for him. He was gratified by her just preeminence, her glow of gentle authority, and her easy grace as she swung up the wide ladder of the central trunk. Under her influence, he found the fortitude to give Covenant a word of encouragement when the unbeliever balked at climbing into the tree. You don't understand, Covenant responded vaguely. I'm afraid of heights. With a look of rigid trepidation, he forced his hands to the rungs of the ladder. Bonor took a position close behind Covenant, making himself responsible for the Ur Lord's safety. Soon they had climbed to the level of the first branches. Troy moved easily up into the tree after them. The smooth, strong wood of the rungs made him feel that he could not miss his grip. It almost seemed to lift him upward, as if Revelwood were eager for him. In moments he was high up the trunk, stepping away from the ladder onto one of the main boughs of the city. The shapers of Revelwood had grown the banyan so that the upper surfaces of the branches were flat, and the level stretch down which Troy walked was wide enough for three or four people to stand safely abreast. As he moved, he waved greetings to the people he knew. Most of the sword lore wardens, and a few students whose families lived in Lord's Keep. The procession of the lords crossed an intersection where several limbs came together, and passed beyond it toward one of the outer trunks. Formed in this trunk was a large hall, and when Troy entered it, he found that the room had been set for a banquet. The chamber was brilliant with lillian rilled torches. Long tables with carpets of moss between them covered the floor, and students of all ages bustled around, 
carrying trays laden with steaming bowls and flagons. There Troy was joined by Drinishok, sword elder of the lore wardens, and the Warmark's first battle teacher. Except for his grizzled eyebrows, Drinishok did not look like a warrior. His thin, spidery limbs and fingers did not seem sturdy enough to handle either a sword or a bow. But three lords and three quarters of Troy's war ward had trained under the old sword elder, and his tanned forearms were laced with many white battle scars. Troy greeted his mentor warmly, and after standing together in the lord's customary thanks for food, they sat down to the feast. The fare of Revelwood was simple but excellent. It made up in convivial gusto what it lacked in complexity, and all the lords and lore wardens were bountifully supplied with meats, rice, cheeses, bread, fruit, and spring wine. Warmed by the glow of Revelwood's welcome, the High Lord's company ate with enthusiasm, talking and joking all the while with their hosts and the busy students. Then, when the eating was done, High Lord Elena presided over an entertainment which the students had prepared. Champions of the sword gave demonstrations of gymnastics and blade work, and the apprentices of the staff told an intricate tale which they had distilled from the ancient giantish story of Bagoon the Unbearable and Thelma Toothfist who tamed him. Troy had never heard it before, and it delighted him. He was reluctant to lose this pleased and comfortable mood, so when the lords left the hall with the lore wardens to speak with them concerning the tidings which Runnick had brought from Sarengrave Flat, Troy did not accompany them. Instead, he accepted Drinishok's invitation and went to spend the night in the old sword elder's home. High in one of the outer trees, in a chamber woven of leaves and branches, he and Drinishok sat up for a long time, drinking spring wine and discussing the war. Drinishok was excited by the prospect of the battle, and he avowed that only Revelwood's need for a strong defense kept him from marching with the war ward. As always, he showed a swift grasp of Troy's ideas, and when the war mark finally went to bed, the only immediate blot on his private satisfaction was the mystery of Trell. The breeze in the branches lulled him into a fine sleep, and he awoke early the next morning feeling eager for the new day. He was amused, but not surprised, to find that his host was up and away before him. He knew the rigorous schedule of the door's rot. He bathed and dressed, pulled his high boots over his black leggings, and carefully adjusted his headband and his sunglasses. After a quick breakfast, he spent a few moments polishing his breastplate and his gleaming ebony sword. When he was properly apparelled as the war mark of the Lord's War Ward, he left Drinishok's chambers, moved to the central tree, and started up it toward the lookout of Revelwood. On a small platform in the uppermost branches of the tree, he joined the two students on watch duty. While he exchanged pleasantries with them, he breathed the crisp autumn air and studied the whole length and breadth of the valley of two rivers. In the west, he could see the snow crests of the mountains. He was not being cautious, looking for danger. He loved the fertile hills of Trothgard, and he wanted to fix them in his mind so that he would never forget them. If something were to strike him down during the coming war, he wanted to be sure to the very end, death or blindness, that he had in fact seen this place. He was still in the lookout when he heard the signal for the gathering of the Lord's Rot. At once he took leave of the two students and started down the tree. Shortly he reached the wide, roofless bowl of the gathering place. High in the city, on a frame of four heavy boughs radiating from the central trunk, the shapers of Revel Wood had woven an immense net of banyan roots and hung it around the central trunk. It formed a wide basin supported by the four boughs and anchored by the roots themselves in each of the six outer trees. The result was the Viancum, a meeting place large enough for half the population of the city. People sat on the roots and dangled their feet through the gaps of the net. These gaps were rarely larger than a foot square. 
but they made the Vian come an uneasy experience for novices. However, the people of Revelwood moved and even ran lightly over the net. Warmark Troy, with a blind man's alert, careful feet, was able to walk confidently away from the central trunk to join Drinishoke and the other sword lore wardens, where they stood part way up one side of the bowl. Lord Amatin was already there, talking intently with a cluster of staff lore wardens and advanced students. Most of the blood guard were stationed around the edge of the net, and past them came a steady flow of Rebel Wood's inhabitants. As Troy joined Rinishoke, he caught sight of Lord Moram moving across the bowl toward Amatin. If the Viancum caused Moram any anxiety, he did not show it. He strode boldly from root to root with his staff held in the crook of his arm. Soon High Lord Elena arrived in the company of the staff elder, Asaraka. Troy was taken slightly aback. He had expected her to be with Coromini, the eldest of the Lorisrat. But when Coromini entered the bowl, he brought with him her Lord Covenant. Troy saw what had happened. The Lorisrat ranked Covenant above Elena, and so the highest honor of Revelwood's hospitality, the invitation of the eldest, had gone to the unbeliever. This nettled Troy. He did not like to see the High Lord slighted in favor of Covenant. But he consoled himself by watching the sick look with which Covenant regarded the net and fall below it. Shortly all the Lore Wardens were in their places, the sides of the Vian come, and the branches overhead thronged with the people of Revelwood. Covenant clung to a root over one of the supporting boughs, and Bonor crouched protectively near him. The lords and Warmark Troy sat in a fanned group with the elder lore wardens, facing south, and Coromini stood before them, looking out over the assembly with a dignified mien. When all the people were still, hushed and expectant, he began the ceremonies of the meeting. He and the High Lord exchanged traditional salutations and sang to each other the ritual invocations which they considered appropriate to the purpose of the meeting. Their stately alternations spun a mood of reverent seriousness over the Viancum, wrapped all the people together as if it were weaving them into the grim and wondrous history of the land. Under the influence of the ceremonies, Troy was almost able to forget that half of what was said and sung was intended to honor the white gold wielder. But Covenant did not look as if he were being honored. He sat with an awkward stiffness, as if the point of a knife were pressed against his spine. After the last song was done, Coromini gazed at Covenant in silence, giving the unbeliever a chance to speak. But the glare which Covenant returned almost made the eldest wince. He turned away and said, Hi, Lord Elena, Lord Moram, Lord Amatin, Warmark Troy, be welcome in the Vian come of Revelwood. We are the Lorsrat, the seekers and servants of Kevin's lore. We gather to honor you and to offer you the help of all our knowledge in the name of the approaching war. The preservation of land and lore is in your hands, as the mystery of land and lore is in ours. If there is any way in which we may aid you, only speak of it, and we will put forth all our strength to meet the need. With a deep bow, High Lord Elena replied formally, The gathering of the Lord's Rot honors us, and I am honored to speak before the people of Revelwood. Troy thought that he had rarely seen her more radiant. Eldest, elders, lore wardens, students of the sword and staff, friends of the land. My friends, in the name of all the lords, I thank you. We will never be defeated while such faithfulness is alive in the land. My friends, there are matters of which I would speak. I do not speak of the danger that war brings to Revelwood. The lore of the sword will not neglect your defense, and Lord Amatin will remain with you 
to do all that a lord may do to preserve the valley of two rivers. A cheer started up on the edges of the bow, but she stopped it with a commanding glance and went on. More, I do not speak of stone downs and wood helvens, which will be destroyed by war, or of people made homeless. I know that the dispossessed of this war will find here all comfort and relief and restitution that human hearts may ask or give. This is sure and requires no urging. More, I do not speak of any need for mastery of Kevin's lore. You have given your best strength and have achieved much. You will give and achieve more. All these matters are secure in your fidelity. But there are two questions of which I must speak. A change in the cadence of her voice showed that she was approaching the heart of her reasons for coming to Revelwood. The second concerns a stranger who has visited Lord's Keep, but the first is one which was presented to you a year ago, at the request of Warmar Kyle Troy. She offered Troy a chance to speak, but he declined with a shake of his head, and she continued. It is our hope that the Lord's Rot has discovered a way to speak and hear messages across distances. The Warmark believes that such a way will be of great value in this war. Coromini's look of satisfaction revealed his answer before he spoke it. Hi, Lord, we have learned a way. Troy's heart surged at the news, and he gripped the handle of his sword. His battle plan appeared suddenly flawless. He was grinning broadly as the eldest went on. Several of our best students and law wardens have devoted themselves to this need, and they were aided by higher brands of the Lillian Rill. With the higher brands and two students, Staff Elder Asuraka learned that messages may be spoken and heard through Lomilialor, the high wood of the Lillian Rill. The task is difficult and requires strength but it will not surpass any lord accustomed to the earth power. Nodding at the staff elder, he said, Asuraka will teach the knowledge to you. We have prepared three Lomilialor rods for this purpose. More we could not do, for the high wood is very rare. Lomilialor. Troy had heard of it. It was the Lydian rill parallel to Orcrest a potent white wood descended from the one tree from which Beric Halfhand had formed the Staff of Law. The higher brands used it, as the Gravelinguses used Orcrest, to give the test of truth. Lomilialor was said to be a sure test of fidelity. If the one tested did not far surpass the strength of the tester. Some of the old tales of Covenant's first visit to the land said that the unbeliever had passed a test of truth given to him at Soaring Woodhelven, and Soaring Woodhelven had later been destroyed. As Troy got up to join Elena in thanking the Lord's Rot for what it had achieved, he looked over to see how Covenant took Coromini's views. For some reason the unbeliever was on his feet. Swaying uncertainly, afraid of falling, he muttered, Lomilialor, the test of truth. Are you going to trust that? A hot retort leaped into Troy's mouth, but something about Covenant's appearance silenced it. Troy blocked his sight with his hand, adjusted his sunglasses, then looked again. The strangeness was still there. Covenant's chest seemed to ripple like roiled water. He was solid, but something disturbed the center of his chest, making it waver like a mirage. Troy had seen an effect like this once before. He glanced quickly away toward the High Lord. She regarded him with a question in her face. Nothing distorted her. The rippling touched no one else in the Viancum, and even Covenant seemed unaware of it but the blood guard around the bowl stood as if at attention, 
and Bonor held himself at Covenant's side with a coiled poise that belied his blank expression. Then Troy saw the area of distortion detach itself from Covenant and float lazily toward the High Lord. The other time he had seen it, it had appeared so briefly, with such evanescence, that he had finally disregarded it as a trick of his vision, a misconception. But now he knew what it was. He bowed deliberately to Coromini. Forgive the interruption. I forget what I was going to say. Without waiting for an answer, he addressed Elena. He hoped that she would understand him through the careful nonchalance of his tone. Why don't you go ahead? There was something else you wanted to talk to the Lord's Rot about. While he spoke, he took a few steps in her direction, as if this were a natural expression of deference. On the edges of his sight, he watched the mirage float toward her. He turned to get closer to it. He faced Covenant in a way that allowed him to take two more steps, and remarked pointedly, You know, it just might turn out that that white gold of yours has been good for something after all. Some of his excitement forced its way into his tone. The next instant he sprang into motion. He took three rapid strides and threw himself at the roiling distortion in the air. It tried to evade him, but he caught it in time. He hit it with a jarring impact and toppled to the net with it in his arms. It struggled. He could feel invisible arms and legs, but he kept his grip. He tightened his hold until the form stopped resisting and lay still. When he heaved himself to his feet, he lifted the light, limp weight easily in his arms. All right, my friend, he gritted at it. Show yourself, or shall I ask the High Lord to tickle your ribs with the staff of law? Covenant was staring at Troy as if the war mark had lost his mind, but Lord Armiton watched him avidly, and the High Lord moved forward as if to support his threat. A peal of high young laughter rang out. Ah, very well, said a bodiless voice, bubbling with gaiety. I am captured. You have surprising vision. Release me. I will not escape. The air swirled suddenly, and Amok became visible in Troy's grasp. He was the same incongruously ancient youth who had appeared before the Council of Lords in Revelstone. Hail, High Lord! he said cheerfully. When Troy let go of him, he bowed humorously to her, then turned and repeated his bow to his captor. Hail, Warmark! You are perceptive, but rough. Is this the hospitality of Revelwood? Glee filled his voice, effaced any reproof in his words. Your strength was not needed. I am here. By hell, Covenant muttered, by hell. Indeed? said Amok, with a boyish grin that seemed to light up the laughing curls of his hair. Well, that is not for me to say, but I am well made. You bear the white gold. It is for your sake that I have returned. All the people of Revelwood had surged to their feet when Amok appeared, and the lore wardens now stood in a ready circle around the war mark and his captive. Both Coromini and Asaraka were confusedly questioning the High Lord, but Elena deferred to Lord Amatin. Stepping into the circle, Amatin asked Amok, How so? Amok replied, Lord, the white gold surpasses my purpose. I felt the sign of readiness when the krill of Loric came to life. I went to Revelstone. There I learned that the krill was not awakened by the lords of Kevin's lore. I feared that I had erred. But now I have traveled the land and seen the peril, and I have learned of the white gold which awakened Loric's krill. This shows the wisdom of my creation. Though the conditions of my life are not met, I see the need, and I appear. Are you changed? said Amatin. Will you give us your knowledge now? I am who I am. I respect the white gold, but I am unchanged. Who is he? Coromini insisted. 
By answering the eldest, High Lord Elena provided Amatin with a moment in which to prepare herself. He is Amuk, the waiting bearer of knowledge. He was made by High Lord Kevin to, to answer certain questions. It was Kevin's thought that when those who came after him had mastered the krill, they would be ready for Amok's knowledge. But we have not mastered the krill. We do not know the questions. At this, a breath of astonishment blew through Lor's rot. But Troy could see that the Lore wardens immediately understood the situation better than he did. Their eyes gleamed with possibilities he did not comprehend. At a nod from Korimini, the two elders, Asaraka and Drinishok, entered the circle and stood on either side of Lord Armiton, placing their knowledge at her service. She acknowledged them, then raised her studious face to Amok and said, Stranger, who are you? Lord, I am what you see, Amok responded cryptically. Those who know me have no need for my name. Who made you? High Lord Kevin, son of Lorik, son of Damalon, son of Beric Hartthu, the Lord Fatherer. Why were you made? I wait, and I answer. The boy's open grin seemed to mock the incorrectness of Amatin's questions. Irritated by Amok's riddling, Drinishok interposed. Boy, do you bear knowledge that belongs to the war lore? Amok laughed. Old man, I was old when the grandsire of your grandsire's grandsire was a babe. Do I appear to be a warrior? I care nothing for age, the sword elder snapped. You behave as a child. I am what I am. I behave as I was made to behave. When Lord Amatin spoke again, she emphasized her words intently. Amok? What are you? Without hesitation, Amok replied, I am the seventh ward of High Lord Kevin's lore. His answer threw a stunned silence over the whole gathering. Both elders gasped, and Coromini had to brace himself on Elena's shoulder. A burst of wild emotion shot across Elena's face. Moram's eyes crackled with sudden visionary fire and Lord Amatin gaped, amazed or appalled at what she had uncovered. Even Troy, who had not devoted his whole life to the mysteries of the wards, felt abruptly unbalanced, as if his precarious perch had been jolted by something inscrutable. Then a ragged cheer sprang up among the students. The lore wardens pressed eagerly forward, as if they wanted to verify Amok's existence by touching him. And through the clamor, Troy heard High Lord Elena exclaim, By the seven, we are saved! Covenant also heard her. Saved! He rasped across the din. You don't even know what the seventh ward is. Elena ignored him. She beamed grateful congratulations to Lord Armitin, then raised her arms to quiet the assembly. When some degree of order had returned to the Viancum, she said, Amok, you are indeed well made. You chose wisely in returning to us. Now the despiser does not overpower us as much as he may think. With an effort, old Coromini forced himself to remember his long experience with the unattainability of the wards. In a thin voice he quavered, But still we do not know the questions to unlock this knowledge. We will find them, Elena responded. Sharp determination thrummed in her voice. After a pause to steady herself, Lord Amatin returned to her inquiry. Amuk, the wards which we have found contain various knowledges on many subjects. It is so with the seventh ward? Amuk seemed to think that this was a penetrating question. He bowed to her as seriously as his bubbling spirits permitted and said, Lord, the seventh ward has many uses, but I am only one answer. What answer are you? I am the way and the door. How so? 
That is my answer. Lord Armitin looked toward Alina and Morum for suggestions, and Troy took the opportunity to ask, The way and the door to what? With a chuckle, Amok replied, Those who know me have no need for my name. Yes, I remember, Troy growled. And among those who do not know you, you are named Amok. Why don't you think of something else to say? Think of some other question, the youth retorted gaily. Troy retreated, baffled, and after a moment Lord Armitin was ready to continue. Amok, knowledge is the way and door of power. The earth power answers those who know its name. How great is the power of the seventh ward? It is the pinnacle of Kevin's lore, said Amok slyly, as if he were making a subtle joke. Can it be used to defeat the despiser? Power is power. Its uses are in the hands of the user. Amok, Amatin said, then hesitated. She seemed almost afraid of her next question, but she clenched her resolve and spoke it. Does the seventh ward contain knowledge of the ritual of desecration? Lord, desecration requires no knowledge. It comes freely to any willing hand. The Lord sighed, then turned to Asuraka and asked the staff elder for advice. Asuraka referred the question to Drinishok, but he was out of his element and could offer her nothing. On an impulse she turned to Koromini. The two conferred in hushed tones for a moment. Then Asuraka returned to Amuk. She said tentatively, Amuk, the other wards teach knowledge concerning power. Are you the power of the seventh ward? I am the way and the door. Do you bear the power itself within you? she insisted. For a moment Amok appeared to study the legitimacy of this question. Then he said simply, No. Are you a teacher? I am the way and... Suddenly Lord Amitin grasped a new idea and interrupted Amok. You are a guide. Yes. You were created to teach us the location of some knowledge or power? Ah, that may be as it happens. Much is taught, but few learn. Where is this power? Where all such powers should be. Hidden. What is the power? Laughing, the youth replied, There is a time for all things. Then he added, Those who know me have no need of my name. Amatin sagged and turned away toward the High Lord. Her thin face held a look of strain as she admitted defeat. Around her the assembly of the Lord's Rot sighed as the people shared her disappointment. But the High Lord answered Amatin by stepping calmly forward and planting the staff of law in front of Amok. In a voice soft and confident, she said, Amok, will you guide me? With an unexpected seriousness, Amok bowed. High Lord, yes, if the white gold permits. Don't ask me for permission, Covenant said quickly, but no one listened to him. The High Lord smiled and asked, Where will we go? The youth did not speak, but he gave a general nod toward the western mountains. And when will we go? Whenever the High Lord desires. Throwing back his head, he began to laugh again, as if he were releasing an overflow of high humor. Think of me, and I will join you. As he laughed, he flourished his arms intricately and vanished. Either his power was stronger than before, or he moved more swiftly. Troy caught no last glimpse of him. The war mark found that he regretted Amok's appearance intensely. Soon after that, the gathering of the Lore's Rot broke up. The Lore Wardens and students of the staff hurried away to begin analyzing what had happened, and Drinishok ordered all his students and fellow teachers away to the practice fields. 
Elina, Moram, and Amatin went with Coromini and Staff Elder Osaraka to their main library. In moments, Troy, Covenant, and Barnor were the only people left in the bowl. Troy felt that he should speak with Covenant. There were things that he needed to understand, but he feared that he would not be able to keep his temper, so he also moved away, leaving Barnor to help Covenant struggle off the net. He wanted to talk to the High Lord, ask her why she had made such a foolhardy offer to Amok. But he was not in command of his emotions. He climbed out of the vine come and strode away along one of the boughs toward Drinishok's quarters. In the Sword Elder's larder he ate a little bread and meat and drank quantities of spring wine in an effort to dissipate the dark sensation of foreboding which Amok had given him. The idea that Elena might wander off somewhere with the youth, hunting for a cryptic and probably useless power, when she was desperately needed elsewhere, made him grind his teeth in frustration. His heart groaned with a prescience that told him he was going to lose her. The land was going to lose her. Searching for balance, he consumed a great deal of spring wine, but it did not steady him. His brain reeled as if dangerous winds were buffeting him. Early in the afternoon he went in search of the lords, but one of the lore wardens soon told him that they were closeted with Osaraka, studying the Lomilia lore communication rods. So he descended to the ground, whistled for Merrill, and rode away from Revel Wood with Rule at his side. He wanted to visit the grave of the student who had summoned him to the land. Covenant had said, It isn't you they've got faith in at all. It's the student who summoned you. Troy needed to think about that. He could not simply shrug it away. One reason he distrusted Covenant was because the unbeliever had first been called by Drool Rockworm at Lord Fowl's behest. Did the nature of the summoner have any connection with the worth of the one summoned? Furthermore, Covenant had referred to that student strangely, as if he knew something about the young man Troy did not know. Troy went to the place of his summons, hoping that its physical context, its concrete location in Trothgard, would ease his vague fears and forebodings. He needed to regain his self-confidence. He knew he could not challenge Elena's decision to follow Amok if he did not believe in himself. But when he reached the side of the grave, he found Trell there. The big gravelingus knelt by the grassy mound as if he were praying. When he heard Troy's approach, he raised his head suddenly, and his face was so swollen with grief that it struck Troy momentarily dumb. He could think of no reason why Trell gravelingus should be here grieving. Before Troy could collect his thoughts to ask for an explanation, Trell jumped up and hastened away toward his mount, which he had tethered nearby. Trell! Troy started to call after him, but Rule interposed flatly. Warmark, let him go. Troy turned in surprise toward the blood guard. Rule's visage was as passionless as ever, but something in the way his eyes followed Trell seemed to express an unwanted sympathy. Carefully, Troy said, Why? I don't understand. That you must ask the High Lord, Rule replied without inflection. I'm asking you, the warmark snapped, before he could control his irritation. Nevertheless. With an effort, Troy mastered himself. Rule's mien said as plainly as words that he was acting on the High Lord's instructions, and that nothing which did not threaten her life could induce him to disobey her. All right, Troy said stiffly. I'll do that. Turning Merrill, he trotted after Trell's galloping mount back toward Revelwood. But when he re-entered the Valley of Two Rivers and approached the tree, he found Drinishok waiting impatiently for him. The lords had announced that they would leave Revelwood the next morning, 
and the Sword Elder wanted Troy to discuss the defense of the city with all the Lore Wardens and students of the Sword. This was a responsibility which Troy could not ignore. So while his private fog turned to dusk and then to night blindness, he addressed the assembled discipline of the Sword. He did not even try to see what he was talking about. He went into the strategy of the valley from memory. But when he was done, he found that he had lost his chance to talk to the lords. In the darkness, he seemed to lack courage as well as vision. After his lecture, he went to Drinishok's home and shared a meal full of indigestible lumps of silence with the sword elder. Then he went to bed early. He could not endure any more of the blurred half-sight of torches. Drinishok respected his mood and left him alone. In blind isolation, he stared uselessly into the darkness and tried to recover his balance. He felt certain that he was going to lose Elena. He ached to talk to her, to dissuade her, cling to her. But the next morning, when all the riders gathered with their mounts just after dawn on the south side of the great tree, he found that he could not confront the High Lord with his fears. Sitting regally on Mirha's back in the gleam of day, she had too much presence, too much personal authority. He could not deny or challenge her. And while she was surrounded by so many people, he could not ask her his questions about Trell. His apprehension was too personal to be aired so publicly. He strove to occupy his mind with other things until he got a chance to talk to someone. Deliberately, he scanned the company of riders. Standing by their Ranihin, behind the lords, were twenty bloodguard. First Mark Morin, Terrell, Bonor, Ruel, Runnick, and fifteen others. Obviously, Coral would remain with Lord Armiton at Revelwood. In addition to them, the group included only five others. High Lord Elena, Lord Moram, Covenant, Troy, and Trell. When he saw the Gravelingus, Troy again felt a desire to speak to him. The unconcealed wound of Trell's expression was taut with suspense, as if he awaited some decision from Elena with a degree of agony that surprised Troy. But the war mark refrained, despite his mounting anxiety. The High Lord had begun to address Lord Armiton and Eldest Coromini. My friends, she said gravely, I leave Revelwood in your care. Ward it well. The tree and the Lord's Rot are the two great achievements of the new lords, two symbols of our service. If it may be done, they must be preserved. Remember vigilance and watch the center plains. If war comes upon you, you must not be taken unaware. And remember that if Revel Wood cannot be saved, the lore still must be preserved, and lords keep warned. The lore's rot and the wards must find safety in Revelstone at need. Sister Armitin, these are great burdens, but I place them in your hands without fear. They do not surpass you, and the help of Corimini the eldest and of Asaraka and Drinishok the elders, is beyond price. I do not believe that the war ward will fall in this war. But you must be prepared for all chances, even the worst. You will not fail. This trust becomes you. Lord Armitin blinked back a moment of tears and bowed silently to the High Lord, then Elena lifted her head to Revelwood and projected her voice so that she could be heard in the tree. Friends, comrades, proud people of the land, there is war upon us. Together we confront the test of death. Now is the time of parting, when all the defenders of the land must go to their separate tasks. Do not desire to change your lot for another's. All faith and service are equal, 
alike worthy and perilous in this time of need. And do not grieve at parting. We go to the greatest glory of our age. We are honored by the chance to give our utmost for the land. This is the test of death, that at the last we may prove worthy of what we serve. Be of good heart. If the needs of this war go beyond your strength, do not despair. Give all your strength and hold peace. And do not despair. Hold courage and faith high. It is better to fall and die in peace than to re-desecrate the land. My friends, I am honored that I have shared life with you. High in Revelwood, a strident voice cried, Hail to the High Lord and the Staff of Law! And all the people in the tree and on the ground answered, Hail! Hail to the High Lord! Lelina bowed deeply to Revelwood, spreading her arms wide in the traditional gesture of farewell. Then she turned Mirhat toward the riders and spoke to Lord Moram. Now, Moram, my most trusted friend, you must depart. You and Warmark Heil Troy must rejoin the war ward to guide it into war. I have decided. I will leave you now and follow Armok to the seventh ward of Kevin's Law. In spite of himself, Troy groaned and clutched at Merrill's mane as if to keep himself from falling. But the High Lord took no notice of him. Instead, she said to Moram, You know that I do not do this to evade the burden of war, but you also know that you are the more experienced and ready in battle, and you know that the outcome of the war may allow us no second opportunity to discover this ward. Yet the ward may enable a victory which would otherwise be taken from us. I cannot choose otherwise. Lord Moram gazed at her intently for a time. When he finally spoke, his voice was thick with suppressed appeals. Beware, High Lord. Even the Seventh Ward is not enough. Elena met him squarely, but her own gaze appeared unfocused. The other dimension of her sight was so pronounced that she did not seem to see him at all. Perhaps it was not enough for Kevin Landwaster, she replied softly, but it will suffice for me. No, Moram protested, the danger is too great. Either this power did not meet Kevin's need in any way, or its peril was so great that he feared to use it. Do not take this risk. Have you seen it? she asked. Do you speak from vision? With an effort, Moram forced himself to say, I have not seen it, but I feel it in my heart. There will be death because of it. People will be slain. My friend, you are too careful of all risks but your own. If you held the staff of law in my place, you would follow Amok to the ends of the earth, and people will still be slain. Moram, ask your heart, do you truly believe that the future of the land can be won in war? It was not so for Kevin. I must not lose any chance which may teach me another way to resist the despiser. Moram bowed his head too moved to make any answer. In the silence they melded their thoughts, and after a moment the strain in his face eased. When he looked up again he directed his gaze explicitly toward Covenant and Troy. Softly he said, Then, if you must go, please do not go alone. Take someone with you, someone who may be of service. For one wild instant, Troy thought that the High Lord was going to ask him to go with her. Despite his responsibilities to the war ward, his lips were already forming his answer, yes, when she said, 
That is my desire. Er Lord Covenant, will you accompany me? I wish to share this quest with you. Awkwardly, as if her request embarrassed him, Covenant said, Do you really think I'm going to be of service? A gentle smile touched Aelina's lips. Nevertheless, he stared into the expanse of her eyes for a moment. Then abruptly he looked away and shrugged. Yes, I'll come. Troy hardly heard the things that were said next. The last formal speeches of Aelina and Coromini, the Lorsrot's brief song of encouragement, the exchange of farewells. When the High Lord said a final word to him, he could barely bring himself to bow in answer. With his yes frozen on his lips, he watched the end of the ceremonies, and saw Elena and Covenant ride away together westward, accompanied only by Bonor and First Mark Morin. He felt paralyzed in the act of falling, crying, I'm going to lose you. Lord Moram came close to him and spoke. But he did not move until he realized, through his distress, that Trell had not followed Covenant and the High Lord. Suddenly his restraint broke. He spun urgently toward Trell, turned in time to see the Gravelingus yank his heavy fists out of his hair, snatch up the reins of his horse, and start away at a gallop toward the ford of the Lurlin, north of Revelwood. Troy went after him. Merrill flashed under the tree and caught up with Trell in the sunlight beyond the city. Troy ordered the Gravelingus to stop, but Trell ignored him. At once the war mark told Merrill to halt Trell's mount. Merrill gave one short, commanding whinny, and the horse stopped so sharply that Trell almost lost his seat. When the Gravelingus forced his head up to meet Troy, his eyes ran with tears and he panted as if he were being slowly suffocated. But Troy had no more time to spare for considerateness. What are you doing? he rasped. Where are you going? Revelstone, croaked Trill. There is nothing for me here. So? We're going south. Don't you know that? You live in the South Plains, don't you? Don't you want to help defend your home? This was not what Troy wanted to ask, but he had not found the words for his real question. No. Why not? I cannot go back. She is there. I cannot bear it. After this. As Trell panted his answer, Lord Moram rode up to them. At once he started to speak, but Troy cut him off with a savage gesture. She? the warmark demanded. Who? Your daughter? When Trell nodded dumbly, Troy said, Wait a minute, wait a minute. Things he did not know buffeted him. He had to find answers. I don't understand. Why don't you go back home to your daughter? She's going to need you. Melancholian, Trell gasped. I cannot. How could I look into her face, answer questions after this? Do not torment me. Warmark. Moram's voice was hard and dangerous, a warning, almost a threat. Let him be. Nothing that he can say will help you. No, Troy retorted. I've got to know. Trell, listen to me. I have got to know. Believe me, I understand how you feel about him. Trell no longer seemed to hear Troy. She chose, he panted. Chose! He heaved the words between his clenched teeth as if they were about to burst him. She chose him. Him! Trell, answer me. What were you doing out there yesterday? At that grave? Trell! The word grave penetrated Trell's passion. Abruptly he wrapped his arms around his chest, hunched forward. Through his tears he glared at Troy. You are a fool, he hissed. Blind. She wasted her life. Wasted? Troy gaped. Wasted? It's the student who summoned you.
was covenant right. Perhaps, Lord Moram said grimly. This time his tone compelled Troy's attention. Troy stared at Moram with a gaze thick with dread. He has abundant reason to visit that grave, the Lord went on. Atiaran Trelmate is buried there. She died in the act which summoned you to the land. She gave her life in an effort to regain her Lord Covenant. But she failed of her purpose. Your presence here is the outcome of her peaceless grief and her hunger for retribution. Moram's explanation exceeded the limit of Trell's endurance. Pain convulsed his features. He struck his horse a fierce blow with his heels, and it sprang at once into a frightened gallop toward the Luralin ford. But Troy did not even see him go. The warmark turned sharply and found that he could still discern Elena, Covenant, and the two bloodguard riding westward out of the valley. Amok was already with them, walking jauntily at the High Lord's side. Atiaran, Trellmate. Trellmate? She was his wife. He knew of Atiaran. He had heard too much talk about Covenant not to know that she was the woman who had guided the unbeliever from Mithill Stone down to Andalane and the Solzies River. But he had not known that Trell was her husband. That had been kept from him. Then he went a step further. Covenant had raped Trell's daughter. Atiaran's daughter. The daughter of the woman who... Covenant, you bastard! Troy howled. What have you done? But he knew that the travellers could not hear him across the distance. The noise of the two rivers obliterated distant shouts. A stiff gust of helplessness knocked down his protest, so that his voice cracked and stumbled into silence. It was no wonder that Trell could not return home, face his daughter. How could he tell her that the High Lord had chosen friendship rather than retribution for the man who had raped her? Troy did not understand how she could do such a thing to Trell. Another moment passed before he grasped the rest of what Moram had said. She died in the act. Atiaran was his summoner, not some young ignorant or inspired student. That, too, had been kept from him. He was the result and consequence of her unanswerable pain. It isn't you. Was Covenant right? Were all his plans only so much despair work, set in motion by the extravagance of Atiaran's death? Warmark, Lord Moram's tone was stern. That was not well done. Trell's hurt is great enough. I know. Troy gritted over the aching of his heart. But why didn't you tell me? You knew about all this. The Council decided together to withhold this knowledge from you. We saw only harm in the sharing of it. We wish to spare you pain, and we hoped that you would learn to trust our Lord Covenant. You were dreaming, Troy groaned. That bastard thinks the whole thing is some kind of mental game. All that unbelieving is just a bluff. He thinks he can get away with anything. You can't trust him. Grimly, he pushed the argument to its conclusion. And you can't trust me, or you would have told me all this before. She was trying to summon him. As far as you know, I'm just a surrogate. He tried to sound lucid, but his voice shook. You misunderstand me, Moram said carefully. No, I don't misunderstand. He could feel deadly forces at work around him, choosing, manipulating, determining. He had to clench himself to articulate. Moram, something terrible is going to happen to her. 
He looked at the Lord, then turned away. He could not bear the compassion in Moram's gaze. Patting Merrill's neck, he sent the Ronihin trotting around the east side of Revelwood. He avoided the waiting lore wardens, avoided having to bid them farewell. Gesturing roughly for the blood guard and Lord Moram to follow him, he rode straight away from Revelwood toward the South Ford. He was looking forward to this war. He wanted to get to it in a hurry. Chapter 16 Forced March Yet, even in this mood, he could not cross the ford of the rill out of Crothgard without regret. He loved the sun-bright beauty of Revelwood, the uncomplex friendship of the lore wardens. He did not want to lose them, but he did not look back. He could not understand why Elena had repudiated Trell Atiaran mate's just rage and grief, and he sensed now, in a way more fundamental than he had ever seen it before, that he would have to prove himself in this war. He would have to prove that he was the fruit of hope, not of despair. He would have to win. If he did not, then he was more than a failure. He was an act of evil, a piece of treachery perpetrated against the land in defiance of his own love or volition, worse than covenant, for covenant at least tried to avoid the lie of being trusted. But he, Heil Troy, had deliberately sought trust, responsibility, command. No, that thought was intolerable. He had to win, had to win. When he had passed the crest of the South Hill, he slowed Merrill to a better traveling pace and allowed Lord Moram and the remaining eighteen bloodguard to catch up with him. Then he said through his teeth, biting down on his voice to avoid accusing Moram, Why is she taking him? He raped Trell's daughter. Moram responded gently, Wormark Troy, my friend, you must understand that the High Lord has little choice. The way of her duty is narrow and beset with perils. She must seek out the Seventh Ward, and she must take Ere Lord Covenant with her, because of the white gold. With the staff of law, she must ensure that his ring does not fall into Lord Fowl's hands, and if he turns against the land, she must be near him to fight him. Troy nodded to himself. That was reasoning he could comprehend. Abruptly he shook himself, forced down his instinctive protest. With an effort, he unclenched his teeth and sighed. I'll tell you something, Moram. When I'm done with this war, when I can look back and tell myself that poor Atiaran is satisfied, I'm going to take a vacation for a few years. I'm going to sit down in Andalane and not move a muscle until I get to see the celebration of spring. Otherwise, I'm never going to be able to forgive that damn covenant for being luckier than I am. But he meant luckier in another way. Though he realized now that no other choice was possible, he ached to think that Elena had chosen covenant, not him. If Moram understood him, however, the Lord tactfully followed what he had said rather than what he meant. Ah, if we are victorious! Moram was smiling, but his tone was serious. You will not be alone. Half the land will be in Andalane when next the dark of the moon falls on the middle night of spring. Few who yet live have seen the dance of the wraiths of Andalane. Well, I'm going to get there first, Troy muttered, trying to sustain this conversation. But then he could not keep himself from reverting to the subject of the unbeliever. Moram, don't you resent him, after what he's done? Evenly and openly, Lord Moram said, I have no special virtue to make me resent him. One must have strength in order to judge the weakness of others. I am not so mighty. This answer surprised Troy. For a moment he stared at Moram, asking silently, Is that true? 
Do you believe that? But he could see that Moram did believe it. Baffled, Troy turned away. Surrounded by the blood guard, he and Lord Moram followed a curve through the hills that took them generally east-southeast to intercept the war ward. As the day passed, Troy was able to turn his thoughts more and more toward his marching army. Questions began to crowd his mind. Were the villages along the march able to provide enough food for the warriors? Was first half Amarine able to keep up the pace? Such concerns enabled him to put aside his foreboding, his aching sense of loss. He became another man, less the blind, uncertain stranger to the land, and more the war mark of the war word of Lord's Keep. The change steadied him. He felt more comfortable with this aspect of himself. He wanted to hurry, but he resisted the temptation because he wanted to make this part of the journey as easy as possible for the Ranihin. Still, by the end of that day, the eighth since he had left Revelstone, he, Lord Moram, and the Bloodguard had left behind the re-blooming health of Trothgard. Even at a pace which covered no more than seventeen leagues in a day, the land through which they rode changed rapidly. East and southeast of them was the more austere country of the center plains. In this wide region the stern rock of the earth seemed closer to the surface of the soil than in Trothgard. The plain supported life without encouraging it, sustained people who were tough, hardy. Most of the men and women who made up the war ward came from the villages of the center plains. This was traditionally true, and for good reason. In all the great wars of the land, the despisers' armies had struck through the center plains to approach Revelstone. Thus these plains bore much of the brunt of Lord Fowle's malice. The people of the plains remembered this, and sent their sons and daughters to the Lorsrot to be trained in the skills of the sword. As he made camp that night, Troy was intensely conscious of how personally his warriors depended on him. Their homes and families were at the mercy of his success or failure. At his command they were enduring the slow hell of this forced march. And he knew that the war would begin within the next day. By that time the vanguard of Lord Fowle's army would reach the western end of the Mithill Valley, and would encounter Hiltmark Quan and the Lord's Colendrill and Veerment. He was sure of it, no later than the evening of the ninth day. Then men and women would begin to die, his warriors. Bloodguard would begin to die. He wanted to be with them, wanted to keep them alive, but he could not. And the march to Doom's retreat would go on and on and on, grinding down the war ward like the millstone of an unanswerable need. Soon Troy stretched himself out in his blankets and pressed his face against the earth, as if that were the only way he could keep his balance. He spent most of the night reviewing every facet of his battle plan, trying to assure himself that he had not made any mistakes. The next morning he felt full of urgency, and he found that whenever he forgot himself, he began to hurry Merrill's pace. So he turned to Moram and asked the Lord to talk to him, distract him. In response, the Lord slowly dropped into a musing, half-singing tone, and began to tell Troy about the various legended or potent parts of the land which lay between them and Doom's retreat. In particular, he narrated some of the old tales about the one forest, the mighty wood which had covered the land in an age that was ancient before Beric Halfhand's time, with its forest stalls and its fierce foes, the ravers. During the centuries when the trees were still awake, he said, the forest stalls had cherished their consciousness and guided their defenses against Turia, Moksha, and Samadhi. But now, if the old tale spoke truly, no active remnant or vestige of the one forest and the forest stalls remained in the land, except the grim woods of Garroting Deep and Cairoyal Wildwood. And none who entered Garroting Deep 
for good or ill, ever returned. This dark forest lay near the line of the war ward's march, beyond the last hills. Then Troy talked for a while about himself and his reactions to the land. He felt close to Moram, and this enabled him to discuss the way High Lord Elena personified his sense of the land. Gradually he relaxed, regained his ability to say to himself, It doesn't matter who summoned me. I am who I am. I'm going to do it. So he was not just surprised when he and Moram caught up with the struggling march of the warriors by mid-afternoon. He was shocked. The war ward was almost half a day's march behind schedule. The warriors met him with a halting cheer that stumbled into silence as they realized that the High Lord was not with him. But Troy ignored them. Riding straight up to first half Armorine, he barked, You're slow! Speed up the beat! At this rate, we're going to be exactly one and a half days too late! The welcome on Armorine's face fell into chagrin, and she whirled away at once toward the drummers. With a wide, sighing groan of pain, the warriors stepped up their pace, hurried to the demand of the drums until they were half running. Then Warmark Troy rode up and down beside their ranks like a flail, enforcing the new rhythm with his angry presence. When he found one Eoward lagging slightly, he shouted into the young drummer's face, By God, I'm not going to lose this war because of you! He clapped his beak by the shamed Warhaft's ear until the drummer copied it exactly. Only after his dismay had subsided, did he observe what nine days of hard marching had done to the war ward? Then he wished that he could recant his harshness. The warriors were suffering severely. Almost all of them limped in some way, pushed themselves unevenly against the nagging pain of cuts and torn muscles and bone bruises. Many were so tired that they had stopped sweating, and the overheated flush of their faces was caked with dust giving them a yellow and demented look. More than a few bled at the shoulders from sores worn by the friction of their pack straps. Despite their doggedness, they marched raggedly, as if they could hardly remember the ranked order which had been trained into them ninety leagues ago at Revelstone. And they were behind schedule. They were still one hundred eighty leagues away from Doom's retreat. By the time they lurched and gasped their way into camp for the night, Troy was almost frantic for some way to save them. He sensed that bare determination would not be enough. As soon as the accompanying higher brands and gravelinguses had started their campfires, Lord Moram went to do what he could for the war ward. He moved from Eoward to Eoward, helping the cooks. In each stew pot, his blue fire worked some effect on the food, enhanced it, increased its health and vitality. And when the meal was done, he walked through all the war ward, spreading the balm of his presence, talking to the warriors, helping them with their bruises and bandages, jesting with any who could muster the strength to laugh. While the Lord did this, Troy met with his officers, the hafts and war hafts, after he had explained High Lord Elena's absence, he turned to the problem of the march. Painfully, he reviewed the circumstances which made this ordeal so imperative, so irretrievably necessary. Then he addressed himself to specific details. He organized a rotation schedule for the leather water jugs so that they would be passed continuously through the ranks for the sake of the overheated warriors. He made arrangements for the packs of the men and women with bleeding shoulders to be carried by the horses. He ordered all the mounted officers except the drummers to ride double so that the most exhausted warriors could rest on horseback. And he told these officers to gather Aliantha for the marchers as they rode. He assigned all scouting and water duties to the blood guard, thus freeing more horses to help the warriors. Then he sent the hafts and war hafts back to their commands. When they were gone, first haft Armorine came over to speak with him. 
Her blunt, dour face was charged with some grim statement, and he forestalled her quickly. No, Amarine, he said. I am not going to put someone else in your place. She tried to protest, and he hurried on more gently. I know I've made it sound as if I blame you because we're behind schedule, but that's just because I really blame myself. You're the only one for this job. The War Ward respects you, just as it respects Quan. The warriors trust your experience and honesty. Glumly, he concluded, After all this, I'm not so sure how they feel about me. At once her self-doubt vanished. You are the war mark. Who has dared to question you? Her tone implied that anyone who wanted to challenge him would have to deal with her first. Her loyalty touched him. He was not entirely sure that he deserved it, but he intended to deserve it. Swallowing down his emotion, he replied, No one is going to question me as long as we keep up the pace, and we are going to keep it up. To himself, he added, I promised Quan. We're going to gain back the time we've lost, and we're going to do it here in the center plains. The terrain gets worse south of the Black River. The first half nodded as if she believed him. After she had left him, he went to his blankets and spent the night battering the private darkness of his brain in search of some alternative to his dilemma. But he could conceive nothing to eliminate the need for this forced march. When he slept, he dreamed of warriors shambling into the south as if it were an open grave. The next morning, when the ranks of the war ward stirred, tensed weakly, lumbered into motion like a long, dark groan across the plains, war mark Heil Troy marched with them. As chewing his ronihin, he started the beat of the drums, verified it, and moved to it himself. As he marched, he worked his way up and down among the Eoward, visiting every Eoman, encouraging every warhaft by name, surprising the warriors out of their numb fatigue with his presence and concern, striving, in spite of his own untrained physical condition, to set an example that would be of some help to his army. At the end of one day in the ranks, he was so weary that he barely reached the small camp he shared with Lord Moram and First Half Domarine before he mumbled something about dying and pitched into sleep. But the next day he hauled himself up and repeated his performance, hiding his pain behind the commiseration which he carried in one way or another to the warriors of the war ward. He marched with his army for four days across the center plains. After each day at his cruel pace, he felt that he had passed his limit, that the whole forced march was impossible, and he must give it up. But each night Lord Moram helped cook the army's food, and then went among the warriors, sharing his courage with them. And twice during those four days the war ward came upon blood guard tending large caches of food, supplies prepared by the villagers of the center plains. Fresh and abundant food had a surprising efficacy. It restored the fortitude of warriors who no longer believed in their ability to drive themselves forward. At the end of his fourth day on foot, the thirteenth day of the march, Troy finally allowed himself to think that the condition of the war ward had stabilized. He had walked more than forty leagues. Fearing to do anything which might damage his army's fragile balance, he planned to continue his own march. Both Moram and Amarine urged him to stop. They were concerned about his exhaustion, about his bleeding feet and unsteady gait, but he shrugged their arguments aside. In his heart he was ashamed to ride when his warriors were suffering afoot. But the next morning he tasted a worse shame. When the light of dawn woke him, he struggled out of his blankets to find Amarine standing before him. In a grim voice she reported that the war ward had been attacked during the night. Sometime after midnight, the blood guard scouts had reported that the tethered horses were being stalked by a pack of Kreesh. 
At once the alarm spread throughout the camp, but only the mounted hats and war hats had been able to answer it swiftly. With the blood guard, they rushed to the defense of the horses. They found themselves confronting a huge pack of the great yellow wolves, at least ten score Kreesh. The blood guard on their Ranihin met the first brunt of the attack, but they were outnumbered ten to one, and the officers behind them were on foot. The scent of the Kreesh had panicked the horses so that they could not be mounted or herded out of danger. One Ranihin, five horses, and nearly a dozen hafts and war hafts were slain before Amarine and Lord Moram were able to mobilize their defense effectively enough to drive back the wolves. And before the Kreesh were repelled, a score or more of them broke past the officers and charged into a part of the camp where some of the warriors, stunned by exhaustion, were still asleep. Ten of those men and women lay dead or maimed in their blankets after the blood guard and Moram had destroyed the wolves. Hearing this, Troy became livid. Brandishing his fists in anger and frustration, he demanded, Why didn't you wake me? Without meeting his gaze, the first half said, I spoke to you, shook you, shouted in your ear, but I could not rouse you. The need was urgent, so I went to meet it. After that, Troy did no more marching. He did not intend to be betrayed by his weakness again. Astride Merrill, he rode with Rule along the track of the creche, and when he had assured himself that the wolves were not part of a concerted army, he returned to take his place at the head of the war ward. From time to time he cantered around his army as if he were prepared to defend it single-handed. The Kreesh attacked again that night, and again the next night, but both times Warmark Troy was ready for them. Though he was blind in the darkness, unable to fight, he studied the terrain and chose his campsites carefully before dusk. He made provision for the protection of the horses, planned his defenses. Then he set ambushes of blood guard, archers, fire. Many Kreesh were killed, but his war wards suffered no more losses. After that third assault, the wolves left him alone. But then he had other things to worry about. During the morning of the march's sixteenth day, a wall of black clouds moved out of the east toward the warriors. Before noon, gusts of wind reached them, ruffling their hair, riling the tall grass of the plains. The wind stiffened as the outer edges of the storm drew nearer. Soon rain began to flick at them out of the darkening sky. The intense blackness of the clouds promised a murderous downpour. It effectively blinded Troy. All the higher brands and gravelinguses lit their fires to provide light to hold the war ward together against the force of the torrents. But the main body of the storm did not come that far west. It seemed to focus its center on a point somewhere in the eastern distance, and when it had taken its position, it remained stationary. The warriors marched through the outskirts of the grim weather. The ragged and tormented rain which lashed at them out of the infernal depths of the storm did not harm them much, but their spirits suffered nevertheless. They all felt the ill force which drove the blast. They did not need Troy to tell them that it was almost certainly directed at Hiltmar Kwan's command. By the time the storm had dissipated itself late the next day, Troy had lost nearly one Eoman. Somewhere in the darkness and the fear of what assailed Quan, almost a score of the least hardy warriors lost their courage. Amid all the slipping and struggling of the war ward, they simply lay down in the mud and died. But they were only eighteen. Close to sixteen thousand men and women survived the storm and marched on, and for the sake of the living, Warmark Troy steeled his heart against the dead. Riding Merrill as if there were no limit to his courage, he led his army southward, southward, and did not let his crippling pace waver. 
Then, three days later, the day after the full of the moon, the war ward had to swim the Black River. This river formed the boundary between the center and south plains. It flowed northeast out of the western mountains and joined the Midhill many scores of leagues in the direction of Andelaine. Old legends said that when the Black River burst out from under the great cliff of Riven Rock, the eastward face of Melancurian Skyweir, its water was as red as pure heart's blood. But from Riven Rock the Black poured into the center of Garroting Deep. Before it passed through the last hills into the plains, it crossed the foot of Gallows Howe, the ancient execution mound of the Forestals. The water which the war ward had to cross was reddish black, as if it were thick with a strange silt. In all the history of the land, the black river between the last hills and the mid-hill had never tolerated a bridge or ford. It simply washed away every effort to make a way across it. The warriors had no choice but to swim. As they climbed the south bank, they looked drained, as if some essential stamina or commitment had been sucked from their bones by the current's dark hunger. Still they marched. The war mark commanded them forward, and they marched. But now they moved like battered, empty hulks, driven by a meaningless wind over the trackless sargasso of the south plains. At times, it seemed that only the solitary fire of Troy's will kept them stumbling, trudging ahead, striving. And in the South Plains yet another difficulty awaited them. Here the terrain became rougher. In the southwest corner of the Center Plains, only the thick curve of the last hill separated Garroting Deep from the plains. But south of the Black River, these hills became mountains, a canted wedge of rugged peaks with its tip at the river, its eastern corner at the bottleneck of Doom's Retreat, and its western corner at Cravenhaw, where Garroting Deep opened into the southern wastes, forty leagues southwest of Doom's Retreat. The line of the war ward's march took it deeper and deeper into the rough foothills skirting these mountains. After two days of struggling with these hills, the warriors looked like reanimated dead. They were not yet lagging very far behind the pace, but clearly it was only a matter of time before they began to drop in their tracks. As the sun began to set, covering Troy's sight with mist, the war mark made his decision. The condition of the warriors wrung his heart. He felt his army had reached a kind of crisis. The war ward was still five days from Doom's retreat, five terrible days, and he did not know where Quan was. Without some knowledge of the Hiltmark's position and status, some knowledge of Lord Fowl's army, Troy could not prepare for what lay ahead, and his army no longer appeared capable of any preparation. The time had come for him to act. Though the war ward was still a league away from the end of its scheduled march, he halted it for the night. And while the warriors shambled about the business of making camp, he called Lord Moram aside. In the dusk, he could hardly make out the Lord's features, but he concentrated on them with all his determination, strove to convey to Moram the intensity of his appeal. Moram, he breathed. There has got to be something you can do for them. Something, anything to help pull them together. Something you can do with your staff, or sing, or put in the food. Something. There has got to be. Lord Moram studied the war mark's face closely. Perhaps, he said after a moment, there is one aid which may have some effect against the touch of the Black River. But I have been loath to use it, for once it has been done, it cannot be done again. We are yet long days from Doom's retreat, and the need of the warriors for strength in battle will be severe. Should not this aid be kept until that time? No. 
Troy tried to make Moram hear the depth of his conviction. The time is now. They need strength now, in case they have to fight before they get to the retreat, or in case they have to run to get there in time. We don't know what's happening to Quan, and after tonight you won't get another chance until after the fighting's already started. How so? the Lord asked carefully. Because I'm leaving in the morning, I'm going to Kevin's watch. I want to get a look at Fowl's army. I have to know exactly how much time Quan is giving us. And you're coming with me. You're the one who knows how to use that high wood communication rod. Moram appeared surprised. Leave the war ward? he asked quickly, softly. Now? Is that wise? Troy was sure. I've got to do it. I've been ignorant too long. Now I've got to know. From here on, we can't afford to let Fowl surprise us. And I'm... He grimaced at the fog. I'm the only one who can see far enough to tell what Fowl's doing. After a moment, he added, That's why they call it Kevin's Watch. Even he needed to know what he was getting into. Abruptly, the Lord passed a hand over the strain in his face and nodded. Very well. It will be done. Here is the aid which can be given. Each of the Gravelinguses bears with him a small quantity of hurt loam, and the higher brands have a rare wood dust, which they name Rillenlure. I had hoped to save such aids for use in healing battle wounds, but they will be placed in the food tonight. Pray that they will suffice. Without further question, he turned away to give his instructions to the higher brands and gravelinguses. Soon these men were moving throughout the camp, placing either hurt loam or rillen lure in each cooking pot. Each pot received only a pinch. Each warrior ate only a minute quantity. But the higher brands and gravelinguses knew how to extract the most benefit from the wood dust and loam. With songs and invocations, they made their gift to the warriors strong and efficacious. Shortly after eating, the warriors began to fall asleep. Many of them simply dropped to the ground and lost consciousness. For the first time in the long damage of the march, several of them smiled at their dreams. When Moram returned to Warmark Troy after the meal, he was almost smiling himself. Then Troy began to give First Half Darmarine her instructions for the Battle of Doom's retreat. After they had discussed food in the final stages of the march, they talked about the retreat itself. In spite of his assurances, she viewed that place with dread. In all the wars of the land, that was the place to which armies fled when all their hopes had been destroyed. Grim old legends spoke of the ravens which nested high in the sides of the narrow defile, above the piled scree and boulders of the edges, cawing for the flesh of the defeated. But Troy had never doubted this part of his plan. Doom's retreat was an ideal place for a small army to fight a large one. The enemy could be lured into the canyon and beaten in segments. That's the beauty of it, Troy said confidently. This is one time when we're going to turn Fowl's tables on him. We're going to take a curse and make it into a blessing. Once Quan arrives, we'll have the upper hand. Fowl may not even know we're there until it's too late for him. But even if he does, he'll still have to fight us. He can't afford to turn his back on us. All you have to do, he added, is keep up the pace for five more days. Amarine's blunt skull reminded him just how impossible those five days might be. But in the morning he felt that he had been justified. Thanks to the robberant of the Rillenlure and Hurtloam, his warriors met the call of dawn with renewed resolution in their eyes and something like strength in their limbs. When he climbed nearby hill to speak to them, they crowded around him and gave a cheer that made his chest tight with pride. He wanted to embrace them all. 
he faced the war ward with his back to the sunrise, and when he could discern their faces through his mist, he began. My friends, he shouted, hear me. I'm going to go to Kevin's watch to find out what Fowl is doing, so this will probably be my last chance to talk to you before the fighting starts. And I want to give you fair warning. We've been taking it pretty easy for the past twenty-two days, but now the soft part is over. We're going to have to start earning our pay. He risked this bleak joke apprehensively. If the warriors understood him, they might relax a bit, shed some of their pain and care, draw closer to each other. But if they heard derogation in his words, if they were affronted by his grim humor, then they were lost to him. He felt an immense relief and gratitude when he saw that many of the warriors smiled. A few even laughed aloud. Their response made him feel suddenly and beautifully in harmony with them, in tune with his army, the instrument of his will. At once he was confident again of his command. Briskly he went on. As you know, we're only five days from Doom's retreat. We have almost exactly forty-eight leagues left to go. After what you've already done, you should be able to do this in your sleep. But still, there are a few things I want to say about it. First, you should know that you've already accomplished more than any other army in the history of the land. No other war ward has ever marched this far, this fast. So every one of you is already a hero. I'm not bragging. Facts are facts. You are already the best. But heroes are not. Our job isn't done until we've won. That's why we're going to Doom's Retreat. It's a perfect place for a trap. Once we get there, we can handle an army five times our size. And just getting there, just pulling Fowl's army south like this, we've already saved scores of stone downs and wood helvens in the center plains. For most of you, that means we've saved your homes. He paused hoping to let his own confidence reach into the hearts of the warriors. Then he said, But we have got to get to the retreat in time. That is where Hiltmark Quan expects to find us. He and his Eoward are fighting like hell to give us these five more days. If we don't reach the retreat before they do, they will all die. It's going to be close, but I can tell you for a fact that the Hiltmark has already bought three of those five days for us. You all saw that storm six days ago. You know what it was. An attack on the Hiltmark's Eoward. That means that six days ago he was still holding Fowl's army in the Mid-Hill Valley. And you know Hiltmark Quan. You know he won't let a mere two days get between us and victory. It is going to be close. We're not going to get much rest. But once we're in the retreat, I'm not afraid of the outcome. At this, the hafts raised a cheer to answer Troy's bravado, and he stood silently in the ovation with his head bowed, accepting it only because the courage in the shout, the courage of his army, overwhelmed him. When the cheering subsided and the war ward became silent again, he said thickly into the stillness, My friends, I'm proud of you all. Then he turned and almost ran from the hill. Lord Moram followed him as he sprang onto Merrill's back. Accompanied by Rule, Terrell, and eight other bloodguard, the two men galloped away from the war ward. Troy set a hard pace until his army was out of sight in the hills behind him. Then he eased Merrill back to a gate which would cover the distance to Mithill Stone Down and the base of Kevin's Watch in three days. With Moram at his side, he cantered eastward over the rumpled plains. After a time, the Lord said quietly, Warmark Troy, you have moved them. You've got it backward, replied Troy in a voice gruff with emotion. They did it to me. No, my friend, they have become very loyal to you. They're loyal people. They, all right, yes, I know what you mean. They're loyal to me. If I ever let them down, if I even make any normal human mistakes, they're going to feel betrayed. I know. 
I focused too much of their courage and hope on myself, on my plans. But if it gets them to Doom's retreat in time, the risk will be worth it. Lord Moram assented with a nod. After a pause, he said, But you have done your part. My friend, I must tell you this. When I first understood your intention to march toward Doom's retreat at such a pace, I felt the task to be impossible. Then why did you let me do it? flared Troy. Why wait until now to say anything? Ah, war mark, returned the Lord. Everything that passes unattempted is impossible. At this, Troy turned on Moram. But when he met the Lord's probing gaze, he realized that Moram would not have raised such a question gratuitously. Forcing himself to relax, he said, You don't actually expect me to be satisfied with an answer like that. No, the Lord replied simply. I speak only to express my appreciation for what you have done. I trust you. I will follow your lead in this war into any peril. Abruptly, a rush of gratitude filled Troy's throat, and he had to clench his teeth to keep from grinning foolishly. To meet Moram's trust, he whispered, I won't let you down. But later, when his emotion had receded, he was disconcerted to remember how many such promises he had made. They seemed to expand with every new development in the march. His speech to the war ward was only one in a series of assertions. Now he felt that he had given his personal guarantee of success to practically the entire land. He had maneuvered himself into a corner, a place where defeat and betrayal became the same thing. The simple thought of failure made his pulse labor vertiginously in his head. If this was the kind of thinking that inspired Covenant's unbelief, then Troy could see that it made a certain kind of sense. But he had a savage name for it. He called it cowardice. He forced the thought down and turned his attention to the South Plains. Away from the mountains, the terrain leveled somewhat, and opened into broad stretches of sharp, hardy grass mottled with swaths of grey bracken and heather turning purple in the autumn. It was not a generous land. Troy had been told that there were only five stone downs in all the South Plains, but its unprofligate health was vital and strong, like the squat, muscular people who lived in it. Something in its austerity appealed to him, as if the ground itself were appropriate for war. He rode it steadily, keeping a brisk pace while conserving Merrill's strength for the hard run from Kevin's watch to Doom's retreat. But the second night, his confidence suffered a setback. Soon after moonrise, Lord Moram sprang suddenly awake, screaming so vehemently that Troy's blood ran cold. Troy groped toward him through the darkness, but he struck the war mark down with his staff and started firing fierce blasts of power into the invulnerable heavens as if they were attacking him. A madness gripped him. He did not stop until Terrell caught his arms, shouted into his face, Lord, corruption will see you. With an immense effort, Mora mastered himself, silenced his power. Then Troy could see nothing. He had to wait in blind suspense until at last he heard Moram breathe. It is past. I thank you, Terrell. The Lord sounded utterly weary. Troy thronged with questions, but Moram either would not or could not answer them. The force of his vision left him dumb and quivering. He could barely compel his lips to form the few words he spoke to reassure Troy. The war mark was not convinced. He demanded a light. But when Rule built up the campfire, Troy saw the garish heat of torment and danger in Moram's eyes. It stilled him, denied his offer of support or consolation. He was forced to leave the Lord alone in his cruel, oracular pain. For the rest of the night, Troy lay awake, waiting anxiously. 
but when dawn came and his sight returned, he perceived that Moram had weathered the crisis. The fever in his gaze had been replaced by a hard gleam, like a warning that it was perilous to challenge him. A gleam that reminded Troy of that picture in the Hall of Gifts entitled Lord Moram's Victory. The Lord offered no explanation. In silence they rode away into the third day. On the horizon ahead, Troy could make out the thin black finger of Kevin's watch, though the valley of Midhill Stone Down was still twenty-two leagues distant. After the strain of the night, he was under even more pressure than before to climb the watch and see Lord Fowle's army. In that sight, he would find the fate of his battle plan. But he did not drive the Ranihin beyond their best travelling gate, so the valley was already full of evening shadows when he and Moram reached the Midhill River and followed it upstream into the southern range. Through his personal haze he caught only one glimpse of Midhill Stone Down. From the top of a heavy stone bridge across the river he looked southward along the east bank and dimly made out a dark, round cluster of stone huts. Then the last penetration of his sight faded, and he had to ride into the village on trust. When Troy and his companions had dismounted within the round, open center of the stone down, Lord Moram spoke quietly to the people who came out to greet him. Soon the stone downers were joined by a group of five, bearing with them a wide bowl of graveling. They placed it on a dais in the center of the circle, where its warm glow and fresh, loamy smell spread all around them. The light enabled Troy to see dimly. The group of five included three women and two men. Four of them were white-haired, aged, and dignified. But one man appeared just past middle age. His thick, dark hair was streaked with gray, and over his short, powerful frame he wore a traditional brown stone downer tunic with a curious pattern resembling crossed lightning on his shoulders. He had a permanently twisted, bitter expression, as if something had broken in him early in life, turning all the tastes of his experience sour. But despite his bitterness and his relative youth, his companions deferred to him. He spoke first. Hail, Moram, son of Variol, lord of the Council of Revelstone. Hail, Warmark, Heil, Troy. Be welcome to Midhill Stone Down. I am Triok, son of Thuler, first among the circle of elders of Midhill Stone Down. It is not our custom to question our guests before hospitality has cleansed the weariness of their way. But these are perilous times. A blood guard brought us tidings of war. What need calls you here? Triok, your welcome honors us, replied Lord Moram, and we are honored that you know us. We have not met. That is true, Lord, but I studied for a time in the Lord's Rot, the Lords and the Friends of the Lords, he nodded to Troy, were made known to me. Then, Triok, elders and people of Midhill Stone Down, I must tell you that there is indeed war upon the land. The army of the Grey Slayer marches in the South Plains to do battle with the war ward of Revelstone at Doom's Retreat. We have come so that Warmark Troy may climb Kevin's watch and study the movements of the foe. He must have brave sight if he can see so far, though it is said that High Lord Kevin viewed all the land from his watch. But that is not our concern. Please accept the welcome of Midhill Stone Down. How may we serve you? Smiling, Moram answered, A hot meal would be a rich welcome. We have eaten camp food for many days. At this, another of the elders stepped forward. Lord Moram, I am Terra Slenmate. Our home is large and Slen, my husband, is proud of his cooking. Will you eat with us? Gladly, tell us, Slen, mate. You honor us. Accepting a gift honors the giver, she returned gravely. 
Accompanied by the other elders, she led Moram and Troy out of the centre of the stone down. Her home was a wide, flat building, which had been formed out of one prodigious boulder. Within, it was bright with graveling. After several ceremonious introductions, Troy and Lord Moram found themselves seated at a long stone table. The meal that Slen set before them did full justice to his pride. When all the guests had eaten their fill and the stoneware dishes and pots had been cleared away, Lord Moram offered to answer the questions of the elders. Taras began by asking generally about the war, but before she had gone far, Triok interrupted her. Lord, what of High Lord Elena? Is she well? Does she fight in this war? Something abrupt in Triok's tone irritated Troy, but he left the answers to Moram. The Lord replied, The High Lord is well. She has uncovered knowledge of one of the hidden wards of Kevin's lore, and has gone in quest of the ward itself. He sounded cautious, as if he had some reason to distrust Triok. And what of Thomas Covenant, the unbeliever? The blood guards said that he has returned to the land. He has returned. Ah, yes, said Triok. He seemed aware of Moram's caution. And what of Trell Atearan, mate? For many years he was the Gravelingus of Mithil Stonedown. How does he meet the need of this war? He is in Revelstone, where his skills serve the defense of the keep. At once Triok's attitude changed. Trell is not with the High Lord? he demanded sharply. No. Why not? For a moment Lord Moram searched Triok's face. Then he said as if he were taking a risk. Er Lord Thomas Covenant, unbeliever and ring thane, rides with the High Lord. With her! Triok cried, springing to his feet. Trell permitted this! He glared bitterly at Moram, then spun away and flung out of the house. His vehemence left an awkward silence in the room, and Teros spoke quietly to ease it. Please do not be offended, Lord. His life is full of trouble. It may be that you know part of his tale. Moram nodded, assured Teros that he was not offended. But Triok's conduct disturbed Warmark Troy. It reminded him vividly of Trell. I don't know, he said bluntly. What business is the High Lord of his? Ah, Warmark, Terras said sadly. He would not thank me for speaking of it. I... A sharp glance from Moram silenced her. Troy turned toward Moram, but the Lord did not meet his gaze. Before Er Lord Covenant's first summoning to the land, Moram said carefully, Triok was in love with the daughter of Trell and Atiaran. Troy barely restrained an ejaculation. He wanted to curse Covenant. There seemed to be no end to the damage Covenant had done. But he held himself back for the sake of his hosts. He scarcely heard Moram ask, Is Trell's daughter well? Is there any way in which I may help her? No, Lord sighed Teras. The health of her body is strong, but her mind is unsteady. Always she has believed that the unbeliever will come for her. She has asked the circle of elders, asked permission to marry him. We can find no healer able to touch this illness. I fear you would only turn her thoughts more toward him. Moram accepted her judgment morosely. I am sorry. This failure grieves me. But the lords know only of one unfettered healer with power for such needs. And she left her home and passed out of knowledge forty years ago, before the Battle of Soaring Woodhelven. It humbles us to be of so little use for such needs. His words left behind a pall of silence in their wake. 
For a time, like a muffled sigh, he stared at his clasped hands. But then, rousing himself from his reverie, he said, Elders, how will you meet the chance of war? Have you prepared? Yes, Lord, one of the other women replied. We have little cause to fear the destruction of our homes, so we will hide in the mountains if war comes. We have prepared food stores against that need. From the mountains, we will harass any who assail Mithill Stone down. Moram nodded, and after a moment Teros said, Lord, Warmark, will you spend the night with us? We will be honored to provide beds for you, and perhaps you will be able to speak to the gathering of the people. No, said Troy abruptly. Then, hearing his discourtesy, he softened his tone. Thank you, but no. I need to get up to the watch, as soon as possible. What will you see? The night is dark. You may sleep in comfort here, and still climb to Kevin's watch before morning. But Troy was adamant. His anger at Covenant only increased his impatience. He had a strong sense of pressure, of impending crisis. Lord Moram's polite, firm support soon satisfied the stone downers that this decision was necessary, and in a short time he and Troy were on their way. They accepted a pot of graveling from the elders to light their path, left all the bloodguard except Terrell and Rule to care for the Ranihin and watch over the valley, then started walking briskly along the mid-hill into the night. Troy could see nothing outside the primary glow of the graveling, but when he was sure he was out of earshot of the stone down, he said to Moram, You knew about Tryok before tonight. Why didn't you tell me? I did not know the extent of his distress. Why should I burden you? Yet now it is in my heart that I have treated him wrongly. I should have dealt with him openly, and trusted him to bear my words. My caution has only increased his pain. Troy took a different view. You wouldn't need to be cautious at all if it weren't for that damned covenant. But Moram only walked on up the valley in silence. Together they worked their way south into the foothills of the surrounding mountains, then doubled back northward, up the eastern slopes. On the mountainside the trail was difficult. Terra led Lord Moram, and Troy followed them with Rule at his back. As he ascended the path, he could see nothing of his situation. For him, the glow of the graveling was encased in dark fog. But slowly he began to feel a change in the air. The warm autumn night of the South Plains turned cooler, rarer. It made his heart pound. By the time he had climbed a couple thousand feet, he knew that he was moving into mountains which had already received their first winter snows. Soon after that, he and his companions left the open mountainside and began to work upward through rifts and crevices and hidden valleys. When they reached open space again, they were on a ledge in a cliff face, moving eastward under the huge loom of a peak. This ledge took them to the base of the long, leaning, stone shaft of the watch. Then, clambering through empty air like solitary dream figures, they went up the exposed stair of the shaft. After another five hundred feet, they found themselves on the parapeted platform of Kevin's watch. Troy moved cautiously over the floor of the watch and seated himself with his back against the surrounding parapet. He knew from descriptions that he was on the tip of the shaft, poised four thousand feet directly above the foothills of a promontory in the range and he did not want to give his blindness a chance to betray him. Even sitting with solid stone between his back and the fall, he had an intense impression of abysses. His sense of ambience felt poignantly the absence of any comforting confines or enclosures or limits. This was like being cast adrift in the trackless heavens, and he reacted to it like a blind man, with fear and a conviction of irremediable isolation. He placed the pot of graveling on the stone before him, 
so that he could at least vaguely see his three companions. Then he braced both arms against the stone beside him as if to keep himself from falling. A slight breeze drifted onto the watch from the towering mountain face south of it, and the air carried a foretaste of winter that made Troy shiver. As midnight passed through the darkness, he began to talk desultorily, as if to warm the vigil by the sound of his voice. His present sense of suspension, of voids, reminded him of his last moments in that world which Covenant insisted on calling real, moments during which his apartment had been flame-gutted, forcing him to hang by feigning fingers from his window-sill, with a long fall and smash on concrete hovering below him. He talked erratically about that world, until the vividness of the memory eased. Then he said, Friend Moram, remind me, remind me to tell you sometime how grateful I am for everything. He was embarrassed to say such things aloud, but these feelings were too important to be left unexpressed. You and Elena and Quan and Amarine, you're all incredibly precious to me. And the war ward. I think I'd be willing to jump from here if the war ward needed it. He fell silent again, and time passed. Although he shivered in the chill breeze, his speech had steadied him. He tried to turn his thought to the fighting ahead, but the unknown sight crouched in the coming day dominated his brain, confusing all his anticipations and plans, and around him the blank night remained unchanged, as impenetrable as chaos. He needed to know where he stood. In the distance, he thought he heard dim hoofbeats, but none of his companions reacted to them. He could not be sure he had heard anything. He needed to distract himself. Half to Moram, he growled, I hate dawns. I can cope with nights. They keep me. There's something I've had experience with, at least. But dawns. I can't stand waiting for what I'm going to see. Then abruptly he asked, Is the sky clear? It is clear, Moram said softly. Troy sighed his relief. For a moment he was able to relax. Silence encompassed the watch again. The waiting went on. Gradually Troy's shivering became worse. The stone he leaned against remained cold, impervious to his body warmth. He wanted to stand up and pace, but did not dare. Around him, Moram, Rule, and Terrell stood as still as statues. After a while, he could no longer refrain from asking the Lord if he had received any messages from Elena. Has she tried to contact you? How is she doing? No, Warmark, Moram answered. The High Lord does not bear with her any of the Lomilialor rods. No? The news dismayed Troy. Until this moment he had not realized how much trust he had put in Moram's power to contact Elena. He wanted to know that she was safe, and as a last resort he had counted on being able to summon her. But now she was as completely lost to him as if she were already dead. No! He felt suddenly so blind that he could not see Moram's face, that he had never really seen Moram's face. Why? The high wood rods were only three. One went to Lord's Keep, and one stayed in Revelwood, so that the Lord's Rot and Revelstone could act together to defend themselves. One rod remained. It was given into my hands for use in this war. Troy's voice crackled with protest. What good is that? At need, I will be able to speak to Revelwood and Lord's Keep. Oh, you fool! Troy did not know whether he was referring to Moram or himself. So many things had been kept from him, and yet he had never thought to ask who had the rods. He had been saving that whole subject until he saw Lord Fowle's army, 
knew what help he would need. Why didn't you tell me? For answer, Moram only gazed at him. But through his haze, Troy could not read the Lord's expression. Why didn't you tell me? he repeated more bitterly. How much else is there that you haven't told me? Moram sighed. As to the Lomilia lore, I did not speak because you did not ask. The rods are not a tool that you could use. They were made for the lords, and we used them as we saw fit. It did not occur to us that your desires would be otherwise. He sounded withdrawn, weary. For the first time, Troy noticed how unresponsive the lord had been all day. A fit of shivering shook him. That dream Moram had had last night. What did it mean? What did the Lord know that made him so unlike his usual self? Troy felt a sudden foretaste of dread. Moram, he began. Moram, peace, war mark, the Lord breathed. Someone comes. At once Troy heaved to his feet, and caught at Rule's shoulder to anchor himself. Though he strained his ears, he could hear nothing but the low breeze. Who is it? For a moment no one answered. When Rule spoke, his voice sounded as distant and passionless as the darkness. It is Tull, who shared the mission of Korik to the giants of Sea Reach. Chapter 17 Tull's Tale Troy's heart lurched and began to labor heavily. Tull! He could feel his pulse beating in his temples. Korik's mission! After the shock of Runnick's news, he had repressed all thought of the giants, refused to let himself think of them. He had concentrated on the war, concentrated on something he could do something about. But now his thoughts reeled. The giants! Almost instantly he began to calculate. He had been away from Revelstone for twenty-five days. The mission to Sea Reach had left eighteen days before that. That was almost enough time. Almost enough. The giants could not travel as fast as Bloodguard on Ronihin, but surely they would not be far behind. Surely! Troy could understand how Tull had come here. It made sense. The other blood guard would be leading the giants, and Tull had come ahead to tell the war ward that help was on the way. With war on the land and Lord Fowl marching, the giants would not go to Revelstone, would not go north at all. They would go south, around Sorengrave Flat, if not through it. The blood guard knew Troy's battle plan. They would know what to do. They would pick up the trail of Lord Fowl's army above Land's Drop, south of Mount Thunder, and would follow it, past Moran Moss, through the Mid-Hill Valley, then southwest toward Doom's Retreat. They would be hoping to attack Lord Fowl's rear during the Battle of the Retreat, and Tull, seeking to circumvent Lord Fowl's army in search of the War Ward, would naturally come south to skirt the southern range toward Doom's Retreat. That route would bring him almost to the doorstep of Mithill Stone Down. Surely! When Tull topped the stair and stepped onto the watch, Troy was so eager that he jumped past all preliminary questions. Where are they? The words came so rapidly that he could hardly articulate them. How far behind are they? In the dim light of the graveling, he was unable to make out Tull's face. But he could tell that the blood guard was not looking at him. Lord, Tull said, I was charged by Korik to give my tidings to the High Lord. With shawl and veil I was charged. For an instant his flat voice faltered. But the blood guard in the stone down have told me that the High Lord has gone into the western mountains with Amuk. I must give my tidings to you. Will you hear? Even through his excitement, Troy sensed something strange in Tull's tone, something that sounded like pain. But he could not wait to hear it explained. Before Lord Moram could reply, 
Troy repeated, where are they? They, said the blood guard. The giants, how far behind are they? Tull turned deliberately away from him to face Lord Moram. We will hear you, Moram said. His voice was tense with dread, but he spoke steadily without hesitation. This war is in our hands. Speak, Bloodguard. Lord, they... we could not... the giants... Suddenly the habitual flatness of Tull's voice was gone. Lord! The word vibrated with a grief so keen that the Bloodguard could not master it. The sound of it stunned Troy. He was accustomed to the characteristic alien lack of inflection of all the blood guard. He had long since stopped expecting them to express what they felt, had virtually forgotten that they even had emotions, and he was not braced for grief. His anticipation of good news was so great that he could already taste it. Instantly, before either he or Lord Moram could say anything, react at all, Carol moved toward Tull. Swinging so swiftly that Troy hardly saw the blow, he struck Tull across the mouth. The hit resounded heavily in the empty air. At once, Tull stiffened, came to attention. Lord, he began again, and now his voice was as expressionless as the night. With shawl and veil I was charged to bear tidings to the High Lord. Before the dawn of the twenty-fourth day of the mission, the dawn after the dark of the moon, we left Kirkry and came south as Korik charged us, seeking to find the High Lord in battle at Doom's retreat. But because of the evil which is awake, we were compelled to journey on foot around the Saran grave, and so twelve days were gone. We came too near to the shattered hills, and so Vale and Shoal fell to the scouts and defenders of corruption. But I endured. Born by the Ranihin, I fled to Landsdrop and the upper land, following corruption's army. Striving to pass around it, I rode through the hills to the southern range and so came within hail of Mithil Stonedown, eight days in which the Ranihin has run without rest. Lord! Again he faltered, but at once he controlled himself. I must tell you of the mission to Sea Reach, and of the ill doom which has befallen the grieve. I hear you, Moram said painfully. But forgive me. I must sit. Like an old man, he lowered himself down his staff to rest with his back against the wall of the parapet. I lack the strength to stand for such tidings. Tull seated himself opposite the Lord across the graveling pot, and Troy sat down also, as if Tull's movement compelled him. The vestiges of his sight were locked on the blood guard. After a moment, Moram said, Vonick came to us in Trothgard. He spoke of Herkin and Lord Shitra, and of the lurker of the Saran grave. There is no need to speak of such things again. Very well. Tull faced the Lord, but his visage was shrouded in darkness. Troy could not see his eyes. He appeared to have no eyes, no mouth, no features. When he began his tale, his voice seemed to be the voice of the blind knight. But he told his tale clearly and coherently, as if he had rehearsed it many times during his journey from Sea Reach. And as he spoke, Troy was reminded that he was the youngest of the blood guard, a Haru Chai, no older than Troy himself. Tull had come to Revelstone to replace one of the bloodguard who had been slain during Lord Moram's attempt to scout the shattered hills. So he was still new to the vow. Perhaps that explained his unexpected emotion, 
and his ability to tell a tale in a way that his hearers could understand. After the deaths of Lord Shitra and the blood guard Karen, there was rain in Sorengrave Flat all that day. It was cold and merciless, and it harmed the mission, for Lord Hiram was sickened by the river water he had swallowed, and the rain made his sickness worse. And the blood guard could give him no ease, neither warmth nor shelter. In the capsizing of the raft, all the blankets had been lost, and the rank water of the defiles course did other damage. It spoiled all the food except that which had been kept in tight containers. It ruined the Lillian Will rods, so that they had no more potency to burn against the rain. It even stained the clothing, so that Lord Hiram's robe and the raiment of the blood guard became black. Before the end of the day, the Lord was no longer strong enough to propel or steer the raft. Fever filled his eyes, and his lips were blue and trembling with cold. Sitting in the center of the raft, he hugged his staff as if for warmth. During the night he began to rant. In a voice that bubbled through the water running down his face, he spoke to himself as to an adversary and tormentor, alternately cursing and pleading. At times he wept like a child. His delirium was cruel to him, demeaning him as if he were without use or worth, and the blood guard could do nothing to succor him. But at last, before dawn, the rain broke, and the sky became clear. Then Corrick ordered the raft over to one bank. Though it was perilous to stop thus in darkness, he sent half the blood guard foraging into the jungle for firewood and aliantha. After Sill fed him a handful of treasure berries, the Lord rallied enough to call up a flame from his staff. With this, Corrick started a fire, built it into a steady blaze near the center of the raft. Then the steersman pushed the raft out into the night, and the mission continued on its way. In the course of that day, they slowly passed out of the Sauron grave. Across the leagues, the defile's course was now growing constantly wider and shallower, dividing into more channels as islets and mud banks increased. These channels were treacherous, shallow, barred with mud banks, full of rotten logs and stumps, and the effort of navigating them slowed the raft still more. And around it, the jungle gradually changed. The vegetation of the Sauron grave gave way to different kinds of growths. Tall, dark trees with limbs that spread out widely above bare trunks, hanging mosses, ferns of all kinds, bushes that clung to naked rock with thin root fingers and seemed to drink from the river through leaves and branches. Water snakes swam out of the path of the raft, and the stench of the course slowly faded into a smell of accumulated wet decay and stagnation. Thus the mission entered Life Swallower, the Great Swamp. As they moved, Corrick kept the raft in the northern passages. In this way he was able to begin traveling northeastward toward Sea Reach and to avoid the heart of Life Swallower. When night came, they were fortunate that the sky was clear. In that tortuous channel, starless darkness would have halted the mission altogether. Yet they were still in one of the less difficult regions of Life Swallower. Water still flowed over the deep mud and silt. Eastward, in the heart of the great swamp, the water slowly sank into the ground, creating one continuous quagmire for scores of leagues in all directions where the mud flowed and seethed almost imperceptibly. But in other things they were not so fortunate. The fever now raged in Lord Hiram. Though Sill had fed him with aliantha, and on water boiled clean, he was failing. Already he looked thinner, and he shook as if there were a palsy in his bones. And without him, without the power of his staff, the mission could not escape Life Swallower. The steersmen were forced to keep the raft where the water was deepest because the mud of the swamp sucked at their poles. If the logs touched that clinging mud, the blood guard would be unable to pull the raft free. 
Even in the centre of the channel their progress was threatened by the peculiar trees of life swallower. These trees the giants called marsh waders. Despite their height and the wide stretch of their limbs, their roots were not anchored in solid ground. Rather, they held themselves erect in the mud, and they seemed to move with the submerged, subtle currents of the swamp. Passages that looked open from a distance were closed when the raft reached them. Channels appeared which had been invisible earlier. More than once trees moved toward each other as the raft passed between them, as if they sought to capture it. All these things grew worse as the days passed. The level of the water in the channel was declining. As the mission moved north and east, more and more of the river was swallowed into the mire, and the raft sank toward the mud. The blood guard could find no escape. Life Swallower allowed them no opportunity to work their way northward to solid ground. Although they were always within half a league of the simple marsh which bordered the swamp, they could not reach it. They thrust the raft along, labored tirelessly day and night, paused only to collect aliantha and firewood, but they could not escape. They needed Lord Hiram's power, and he was lost in delirium. His eyes were crusted as if with dried foam, and only the treasure berries and boiled water which Sill forced into him kept him alive. During the afternoon of the eighteenth day of the mission, the logs of the raft touched mud. Though thin water still gleamed among the trees, the raft no longer floated. The bog held it despite the best efforts of the steersman, and drew it eastward deeper into the swamp, moving with the slow current of the mire. Corrick could not see any hope, but Sill disagreed. He insisted that within Lord Hiram's ill flesh, an unquenched spirit survived. He felt it with his hand on the Lord's brow. Something in Hiram still resisted the fever. Through the long watch of the day he nourished that spirit with treasure berries and boiled brackish water. And in the evening the Lord rallied. Some of the dry flush left his face. He began to sweat. As his chills faded his breathing became easier. By nightfall he was sleeping quietly. But it appeared that he had begun to recover too late. Deep in the dark night, the grip of the mud bore the raft into an open flat devoid of trees. There the current eddied, turned back on itself, formed a slow whirlpool, just broad enough to catch all four sides of the raft and start sucking it down and the blood guard could do nothing. Here all strength and fidelity lost their worth. Here no vow had meaning. The mission was in Lord Hiram's hands, and he was weak. But when Corrick wakened him, the Lord's eyes were lucid. He listened as Corrick told him of the mission's plight. Then after a time he said, How far must we go to escape? A league, Lord. Corrick indicated the direction with a nod. So far? Friend Corrick, some day you must tell me how we came to these straits. Sighing, he pulled himself close to the fire and began eating the mission store of Aliantha. He made no attempt to rise until he had eaten it all. Then, with Sill's help, he climbed to his feet on the slowly revolving raft and moved into position. Bracing himself against the blood guard, he thrust his staff between the logs into the mud. A snatch of song broke through his teeth. The staff began to pulse in his hands. For a time his exertions had no effect. Power mounted in his staff, grew higher at the command of his uncertain strength, but the raft still sank deeper into the swamp. The stench of decay and death thickened. Lord Hiram groaned at the strain and summoned more of his strength. He began to sing aloud. Blue sparks burst from the wood of his staff, ran down into the muck. With a loud sucking noise, the raft pulled free of the eddy, lumbered away. 
swinging around the whirlpool, it started northward. For a long time, Lord Hiram kept the raft moving. Then he reached the marsh waders on the north side of the eddy. There, the blood guard threw out clingor lines to the trees ahead, used the ropes to pull the raft along. At once, Hiram dropped his power and slumped forward. Sill bore him back to the center of the raft. As soon as he lay down by the embers of the fire, he was asleep. But now the blood guard no longer needed his help. They cast out the clingor ropes and heaved on them, hauled the raft between the trees. Their progress was slow, but they did not falter. And when the mud became so thick that their ropes broke under the strain, they strung lines between the trees and left the raft. Sill carried Lord Hiram lashed to his back and moved through the mire by pulling himself along the lines while the other blood guards strung new ropes ahead and released the ones behind. Then at last, in the light of dawn, the mud changed to soft, wet clay. The trees gave way to stands of cane and marsh grass, and the blood guard began to feel solid ground with their bare toes. Thus they came out into the wide belt of marsh that bordered Life Swallower. In the distance ahead they could see the steep hills which formed the southern edge of Sea Reach. The mission had lost three days. Yet the blood guard did not begrudge Lord Hiram the time to cook a hot meal from the last supplies. The Lord was worn and wasted. His once round face had become as lean as a wolf's. He needed food and rest and the mission would make good speed across Sea Reach toward Kirkry. If necessary, the blood guard could carry Lord Hiram. When he had eaten, the Lord groaned to his feet and started toward the hills. He set a slow pace. He was forced to rest long and often. The blood guard soon saw that at this rate they would need all day to cross the five leagues to the hills, but the Lord refused their offer of aid. Haste, he said, I have no heart for haste. And his voice had a bitterness which surprised them until Korak reminded them of what they had heard from Warhaft Turkin and of what the Lord's response had been. Hiram apparently believed Herkin's prophecy concerning the downfall of the giants. Yet the Lord labored throughout the day to reach the hills, and the next day he strove to climb the hills as if he had changed during the night, recovered his sense of urgency. Rolling his eyes at the arduous slope, he pushed himself, labored upward at the limit of his returning strength. When at last he crested the hill, he and all the blood guard paused to look at Sea Reach. The land which the old lords had given to the giants for a home was wide and fair, enclosed by hills on the south, mountains on the west, and the sun-birthed sea on the east. It was a green haven for the shipwrecked voyagers. But although they used the land, cultivated the rolling countryside with crops of all kinds, planted immense vineyards, grew whole forests of the special redwood and teak trees from which they crafted their huge ships, they did not people it. They were lovers of the sea, and preferred to make their dwelling places in the cliffs of the rocky coast, forty leagues east from where the mission now stood. During the age of Damalon Giant Friend, when the unhomed were more numerous, they had spread out along the coast, building homes and villages across the whole eastern side of Sea Reach. But their numbers had slowly declined, until now they were only a third of what they had once been. Yet they were a long-lived, story-loving, gay people, and the lack of children hurt them cruelly. Out of slow loneliness, they had left their scattered homes in the north and south of Sea Reach and had formed one community, a sea-cliff city where they could share their few children and their songs and their long tales. Despite their ancient custom of long names, names which told the tale of the thing named, they called their city simply Kirkri, the Grieve. There they had lived since High Lord Kevin's youth. Looking out over the land of the giants, Lord Hiram gave a low cry. 
Korik. Pray that Herkin lied. Pray that his message was a lie. Ah, oh, my heart! He clutched at his chest with both hands and started down the soft slope into Sea Reach at a run. Korik and Sil caught him swiftly, placed a hand under each of his arms. They bore him up between them so that he could move more easily. Thus the mission began its journey toward the grieve. Lord Hiram ran that way for the rest of the day, resting only at moments when the pain in his chest became unendurable, and the blood guard knew that he had good reason. Lord Morom had said, Twenty days. This was the twentieth day of the mission. The next dawn, when Lord Hiram arose from his exhausted sleep, he spurned Corrick and Sill and ran alone. His pace soon brought the mission to the westmost of the giant's vineyards. Korik sent Doar and Shull through the rows, searching for some sign, but they reported that the giants who had been working this vineyard had left it together in haste. The matter was clear. Giantish hoes and rakes as tall as men lay scattered among the vines with their blades and teeth still in the marks of their work, and several of the leather sacks in which the giants usually carried their food and belongings had been thrown to the ground and abandoned. Apparently the unhomed had received some kind of signal and had dropped their work at once to answer it. Their footprints in the open earth of the vineyard ran in the direction of Kirkree. That day the mission passed through vineyards, teak stands, fields. In all of them the scattered tools and supplies told the same tale, but the next day came a rain which effaced the footprints and work signs. The blood guard were able to gain no more knowledge from such things. During the night the rain ended. In the slow breeze the blood guard could smell sea salt. The clear sky appeared to promise a clear day, but the dawn of the twenty-third day had a red cast scored at moments with baleful glints of green, and it gave the Lord no relief. After he had eaten the treasure berries Sill offered him, he did not arise. Rather, he wrapped his arms around his knees and bowed his head as if he were cowering. For the sake of the mission, Korik spoke, Lord, we must go. The grieve is near. The Lord did not raise his head, his voice was muffled between his knees. Are you impervious to fear? Do you not know what we will find? Or does it not touch you? We are the blood guard, Korik replied. Yes, Lord Hiram sighed, the blood guard. And I am Hiram, son of Fool, Lord of the Council of Revelstone. I am sworn to the services of the land. I should have died in Sheetra's place if I had her strength. Abruptly he sprang to his feet. Spreading his arms, he cried in the words of the old ritual, We are the new preservers of the land, votaries of the earth power. Sworn and dedicate. Dedicate. We will not rest but he could not complete it. Melancurion, he moaned, clutching his black robe at his chest. Melancurion, Skyweir, help me. Korik was loath to speak, but the mission compelled him. If the giants are to be aided, we must do it. Aided, Lord Hiram gasped. There is no aid for them. He stooped, snatched up his staff. For several shuddering breaths he held it, gripped it, as if to wrest courage from it. But there are other things we must learn. The High Lord must be told what power performed this abomination. His eyes had a shadow across them, and their lids were red as if with panic. Trembling, he turned and started toward Kirkri. Now the mission did not hasten. It moved cautiously toward the sea, warding against an ambush. 
Yet the morning passed swiftly. Before noon the bloodguard and the lord reached the high lighthouse of the grieve. The lighthouse was a tall spire of open stonework that stood on the last and highest hill before the cliffs of the coast. The giants had built it to guide their roving ships, and someone was always there to tend the focused light beam of the signal fire. But as the bloodguard crept up the hill toward the foot of the spire, they could see that the fire was dead. No gleam of light or wisp of smoke came from the cupola atop the tower. They found blood on the steps of a lighthouse. It was dry and black, old enough to resist the washing of the rain. At a command from Corrick, Vale ran up the steep steps into the spire. The rest of the bloodguard waited, looking out over Kirkry and the sunbirth sea. In the noon sun under a clear sky, the sea was bright with dazzles, and out of sight below the rim of the cliff, the waves made muffled thunder against the piers and levees of the grieve. There, like a honeycomb in the cliff, was the city of the giants, all its homes and halls and passages, all its entrances and battlements, had been delved into the rock of the coast. And it was immense. It had halls where five hundred giants could gather for their giant claves and their stories which consumed days in the telling. It had docks for eight or ten of the mighty giant ships. It had hearths and homes enough for all the remnant of the unhomed. Yet it showed no sign of habitation. The back of the grieve, the side facing inland, looked abandoned. Above it an occasional gull screamed, and below the sea beat, but it revealed no life. However, Kirkry had been built to face the sea. Still the bloodguard hoped to find giants there. Then Vale came down out of the lighthouse. He spoke directly to Lord Hiram. One giant is there. He indicated the cupola of the spire with a jerk of his head. She is dead. After a moment he said, She was killed. Her face and the top of her head are gone. Her brain is gone. Consumed. All the blood guard looked at Lord Hiram. He was staring at Vale with red in his eyes. His lean face was twisted. In his throat he made a confused noise like a snarl. His knuckles were white on his staff. Without a word he turned and started down toward the main entrance of the grieve. Then Corrick gave his commands. Of the eleven blood guard, Vale, Doar, Shoal, and two others he instructed to remain at the lighthouse, to watch and to give warning if necessary, and to carry out the mission if the others fell. Three he sent northward to begin exploring Kirkry from that end, and with Tull and Sill he followed Lord Hiram. These three took the Lord away from the main entrance toward the south of the city. Together the four crept into the grieve on its southern side. The entrance they chose was a tunnel that led straight through the cliff, sloping slightly downward. They passed along it to its end, where it opened into a roofless rampart overhanging the sea. From this vantage they could see much of the city's cliff front. Ramparts like the one on which they stood alternately projected and receded along the wall of rock for several levels below them, giving the face of the city a knuckled appearance. They could see into many of the projections until the whole city passed out of sight north of them, behind a bulge in the cliff. Down at sea level, just south of this bulge, was a wide levee between two long stone piers. The levee and the piers were deserted. Nothing moved on any of the ramparts. Except for the noise of the sea, the city was still. But when Lord Hiram opened a high stone door and entered the apartments beyond it, he found two giants lying cold in a pool of dried blood. Both their skulls were broken asunder and empty, as if the bones had been blasted apart from within. 
in the next set of rooms were three more giants, and in the next set three more, one of them a child, all dead. They lay among pools of their blood, and the blood was spattered around as if someone had stamped through the pools while they were still fresh. All, including the child, had been slain by having their heads rent open. But they were not decayed. They had not been long dead. Not above three days. Three days, Korik said. And Lord Hiram said bitterly, Three days. They went on with the search. They looked into every apartment along the rampart until they were directly above the levee. In each set of rooms they found one or two or three giants, all slaughtered in the same way, and none but the youngest children showed any sign of resistance, of struggle. The few youngest bodies were contorted and frantic. All the rest lay as if they had been simply struck dead where they stood or sat. When the searchers entered one round meeting hall, they discovered that it was empty and the huge kitchen beyond it was also empty. The stove-fires had fallen into ash, but the cooks had not been killed there. The sight dismayed Lord Hiram. Groaning, he said, They went to their homes to die. They knew their danger, and went to their homes to await it. They did not fight, or flee, or send for help. Melen on Abatha! Only the children! What horror came upon them! The blood guard had no answer. They knew of no wrong potent enough to commit such a slaughter unresisted. As he left the hall, Lord Hiram wept openly. From that rampart, he and the blood guard worked downward through the levels of Kirkri. They took a crooked stairway which descended back into the cliff, then toward the sea again. At the next level they again went to look into the rooms. Here also all the giants were dead. Everywhere it was the same. The unhomed had gone to their private dwellings to die. Then an urgency came upon the blood guard and the Lord. They began to hasten. The Lord leaped down the high stairs, ran along the ramparts to inspect the apartments, in their black garb, the four flew downward like the ravens of midnight, taking the tale of shed blood and blasted skulls. When they were more than halfway down the grieve, Korak stopped them. He had noticed a change in the air of the city. But the difference was subtle. For a moment he could not identify it. Then he ran into the nearest apartment, hastened to the lone giant dead in one of the back rooms, touched the pool of blood. This giant had been slain more recently. A few spots of the pool were still damp. Perhaps the slayer was still in the city, stalking its last victims. At once Lord Hiram whispered, We must reach the lowest level swiftly. If any giants yet live, they will be there. Korik nodded. Tull sprinted to scout ahead as the others ran to the stairs and started down them. On each level... They stopped long enough to find one dead giant, test the condition of the blood. Then they raced on downward. The blood grew steadily damper. Two levels above the piers, they found a child whose flesh still retained a vestige of warmth. They explored the next level more carefully, and in one room they discovered a giant with the last blood still dripping from his riven skull. With great caution, they crept down the final stairs. The stairway opened on a broad expanse of rock, the base of the two piers and the head of the levee between them. The tide was low and quiet. The waves broke far down the levee, but still the sound filled the air. Even here the blood guard and the lord could not see beyond the great cliff bulge just north of the piers. This bulge and the outward bend of Kirkree's southern tip formed a shallow cove around the levee. The flat base of the city lay in the afternoon shadow of the cliff, and the unwarmed rock was damp with spray. 
No one moved on the piers or along the walkway which traversed the city from its southern end northward around the curve of the cliff. Cut into the base of the cliff, behind the walkway and the head rock of the piers, were many openings. All had heavy stone doors to keep out the sea in storms, but most of the doors were open. They led into workshops, high chambers where the giants formed the planks and hawsers of their ships. Like the meeting halls and kitchens, these places were deserted. But unlike the western vineyards and fields, the workshops had not been abandoned suddenly. All the tools hung in their racks on the walls. The tables and benches were free of work. Even the floors were clean. The giants laboring there had taken the time to put their shops in order before they went home to die. But one smaller door near the south end of the head rock was tightly closed. Lord Hiram tried to open it, but it had no handle, and he could not grip the smooth stone. Corrick and Tull approached it together. Forcing their fingers into one crack of the door, they heaved at it. With a scraping noise like a gasp of pain, it swung outward, admitting shadow light to the chamber beyond. The single room was bare. It contained nothing but a low bed against one side wall. It was lightless, and the air in it smelled stale. On the floor against the back wall sat a giant. Even crouched with his knees drawn up before him, he was as tall as the blood guard. His staring eyes caught the light and gleamed. He was alive. A shallow breath stirred his chest, and a thin trail of saliva ran from the corner of his mouth into his grizzled beard. But he made no move as the four entered the cell. No blink or flicker of his eyes acknowledged them. Lord Hiram rushed toward him gladly, then stopped when he saw the look of horror on the giant's face. Corrick approached the giant, touched one of the bare arms which gripped his knees. The giant was not cold. He was not another Hurkin. Corrick shook the giant's arm, but the giant did not respond. He sat gaping blindly out the doorway. Corrick looked a question at the Lord. When Hiram nodded, Corrick struck the giant across the face. His head lurched under the blow, but it did not penetrate him. Without blinking, he raised his head again, resumed his stare. Corrick prepared to strike again with more force, but Lord Hiram stopped him. Do him no injury, Corrick. He is close to us. We must reach him, Corrick said. Yes, said Hiram. Yes, we must. He moved close to the giant and called, Rock Brother, hear me. I am Hiram, son of Hul, Lord of the Council of Revelstone. You must hear me. In the name of all the unhomed, in the name of friendship and the land, I adjure you. Open your ears to me. The giant made no reply. The slow rate of his breathing did not vary. His white gaze did not falter. Lord Hiram stepped back, studied the giant. Then he said to Corrick, Free one of his hands. He rubbed one heel of his staff, and when he took his hand away, a blue flame sprang up on the metal. I will attempt the Ka'amora, the fire of grief. Corrick understood. The Ka'amora was a ritual by which the giants purged themselves of grief and rage, they were impervious to any ordinary fire, but the flames hurt them, and they used that pain at need to help them master themselves. Swiftly, Korak pried the giant's right hand loose from its grip, pulled the arm back so that its hand was extended toward Lord Hiram. Moaning softly, Stone and sea, rock brother, stone and sea, the Lord increased the strength of his Lord's fire, he placed the flame directly under the giant's hand, enveloped the fingers in fire. At first nothing happened. The ritual had no effect. The giant's fingers hung motionless in the flame, and the flame did not consume them. But then they twitched, groped, clenched. The giant pushed his hand farther into the fire, though his fingers were writhing in pain. Abruptly he drew a deep, shuddering breath 
His head snapped back, thudded against the wall, dropped forward onto his knees. Yet still he did not withdraw his hand. When he raised his head again, his eyes were full of tears. Trembling, panting, he pulled back his hand. It was undamaged. At once Lord Hiram extinguished his fire. Rock brother, he cried softly. Rock brother, forgive me. The giant stared at his hand. Time passed as he became slowly aware of his situation. At last he recognized the Lord and the blood guard. Suddenly he flinched, jerked both hands to the sides of his head, gasped, Alive! Before Lord Hiram could answer, he went on, What of the others? My people! Lord Hiram clutched his staff for support. All dead. Ah! Oh. The giant groaned. His hands dropped to his knees, and he leaned his head back against the wall. Oh, my people! The tears streamed down his cheeks like blood. The Lord and the blood guard watched him in silence, waited for him. At last his grief eased, and his tears ceased. When he brought his head forward from the wall, he murmured as if in defeat, he has left me to the last. With a visible effort, Lord Hiram forced himself to ask, Who is he? The giant answered in misery, He came soon. He came soon after we had learned the fate of the three brothers, the brothers of one birth, Damalon Rock Brothers' omen of the end. This spring, ah, uh, was it so recent? It needs more time. There should be years given to it. There are my people. This spring, this... We knew at last that the old slumbering ill of the Sauron grave was awake. We thought to send word to brave Lord's Keep. For a moment he choked on the grief in his throat. Then we lost the brothers. Lost them. We arose to one sunrise, and they were gone. We did not send to the lords. How could we bear to tell them that our hope was lost? No. Rather, we searched. From the northern climes to the spoiled plains and beyond. We searched. We searched through all the summer. Nothing. In despair, the searchers returned to the grieve, Kirkry, last home of the unhomed. Then the last searcher returned, Waven hair hail all, whose womb bore the three. Because she was their mother, she searched when all others had given up the search, and she was the last to return. She had journeyed to the shattered hills themselves. She called all the people together and told us the fate of the three before she died. The wounds of the search... He groaned again. No, I am the last. Ah, my people! As he cried out, he moved, shoved himself to his feet, stood erect against the wall. Towering over his hearers, he put back his head and began to sing the old song of the unhomed. Now we are unhomed, bereft of root and kith and kin. From other mysteries of delight we set our sails to resail our track. But the winds of life blew not the way we chose, and the land beyond the sea was lost. It was long, like all giantish songs, but he sang only a fragment of it. Soon he fell silent, and his chin dropped to his breast. Again Lord Hiram asked, Who is he? The giant answered by resuming his tale. Then he came. Omen of the end and home turned to misery and gall. Then we knew the truth. We had seen it before, in lighter times, when the knowledge might have been of some use. But we had denied it. We had seen our evil and had denied it, thinking that we might find our way home and escape it. Fools! 
When we saw him, we knew the truth. Through folly and withering seed and passion and impatience for home, we have become the thing we hate. We saw the truth in him. Our hearts were turned to ashes, and we went to our dwellings, these small rooms which we called homes in vain. Why did you not flee? Some did. Some four or five who did not know the long name of despair, or did not hear it, or they were too much like him to judge. The ill of the sarin grave took them. They are no more. Compelled by the ancient passion of the blood guard, Korak asked, Why did you not fight? We had become the thing we hate. We are better dead. Nevertheless, Korak said, Is this the fealty of the giants? Does all promised faithfulness come to this? By the vow, giant, you destroy yourselves and let the evil live. Even Kevin Landwaster was not so weak. In his emotion he forgot caution, and all the blood guard were taken unaware. The sudden voice behind them was cold with contempt. It cut through them like a gale of winter. Turning, they found that another giant stood in the doorway. He was much younger than the giant within, but he resembled the older giant. The chief difference lay in the contempt that filled his face, raged in his eyes, twisted his mouth as if he were about to spit. In his right hand, he clenched a hot green stone. It blazed with an emerald strength that shone through his fingers. As he gripped it, it steamed thickly. He stank of fresh blood. He was spattered with it from head to foot. And within him, clinging to his bones, was a powerful presence that did not fit his form. It slavered from behind his eyes with a great force of malice and wrong. Ha! he said in a despising tone. A lord and three bloodguard. I am pleased. I had thought that my friend in the Sarin grave would take all like you. But I see I shall have that pleasure myself. Ah, but you are not entirely scatheless, are you? Black becomes you. Did you lose friends to my friend? He laughed with a grating sound, like the noise of boulders being crushed together. Lord Hiram stepped forward, planted his staff, said bravely, Come no closer to Rhea Raver. I am Hiram, Lord of the Council of Revelstone, Melancurion Abatha, Durok Minus Mil Cabal. I will not let you pass. The giant winced as Lord Hiram uttered the words of power. But then he laughed again. Ha, little lord, is that the limit of your lore? Can you come no closer than that to the seven words? You pronounce them badly, but I must admit you have recognized me. I am Turia Harem, but we have few names now, my brothers and I. There is Flesh Harrower and Satan's Fist, and I am named... Kin slaughterer. At this, the older giant groaned heavily. The raver glanced into the back of the cell and said in a tone of satisfaction, Ah, there he is. Little lord, I see that you have been speaking with Sparlim Keelsetter. Did he tell you that he is my father? Father, why do you not welcome your son? The blood guard did not look at the older giant, but they heard Keelsetter's pain and understood it. Something within the giant was breaking. Suddenly he gave a savage roar. Leaping past the four, he attacked Kin Slaughterer. His fingers caught the raver's throat. He drove him back out of the doorway onto the headrock of the piers. Kin Slaughterer made no attempt to break his father's hold. He resisted the impetus until his feet were braced. Then he raised the green stone, moved it toward Keelsetter's forehead. Both fist and stone passed through the older giant's skull into his brain. Keelsetter screamed. His hands dropped. His body went limp. 
he hung from the point of power which impaled his head. Grinning ravenously, the raver held his father there for a long moment. Then he tightened his fist. Deep emerald flashed. The stone blasted the front of Keelsetter's skull. He fell dead, pouring blood over the headrock. Kinslaughter stamped his feet in the spreading pool. He appeared oblivious to the four, but he was not. As Corrick and Tull started forward to attack him, he swung his arm, hurled a bolt of power at them. It would have slain them before they reached the doorway, but Lord Hiram lunged, thrust up his staff between them. The end of his staff caught the bolt. It detonated with such force that it broke the staff in two and flung the four humans against the back of the cell. The impact made them unconscious. Thus even the vow could not preserve the blood guard from the extremity of their need. Corrick was the first to reawaken. Hearing returned before sight or touch, and he began to listen. In his ears the noise of the sea grew, became violent, but the sound was not the sound of waves in storm. It was more erratic, more vicious. When his sight was restored, he was surprised to find that he could see. He had expected the darkness of clouds. But early starlight shone through the doorway from a clear night sky. Outside, the sea thrashed and heaved across the piers and up the levee, as if goaded by rowls. And along the sky, lightning leaped, followed by such thunder that he felt the bursting in his chest. Through the spray, a high wind howled and still the sky was clear. There was a Bayamo upon the sea. Then a different lightning struck upward into the heavens, a bolt as green as blazing emerald. It came from the levee. Looking through the darkness, Corrick discerned the form of the raver, kinslaughterer. He stood down in the levee, so close to the tide that the waves broke against his knees. With his stone he hurled green blasts into the sky and shook his arms as if the windstorm were his to command. On the levee behind him were three dead forms, the three blood guard whom Corrick had sent to the northern end of the city. For a time Corrick did not comprehend what Kinslaughterer was doing, but then he perceived that the seas out beyond the piers moved in consonance with Kinslaughterer's arms. As the giant raver waved and gestured, they heaved and reared and broke and piled themselves together. Farther away the situation was worse. Slowly, with great pitchings and shudders, a massive wall of water rose out of the ocean. Kinslaughterer's green lightning glared across the face of it as it mounted, tossed its crest higher and higher, and as it grew, it moved toward the cliff. The raver was summoning a tsunami. Corrick turned to rouse his companions. Sill and Tull were soon conscious and alert, but Lord Hiram lay still, and blood trickled from the corner of his mouth. Swiftly, Sill ran his hands over the Lord's body, reported that Hiram had several broken ribs, but no other injuries. Together, Corrick and Sill chafed his wrists, slapped his neck. At last, his eyelids fluttered and he awakened. He was dazed. At first he could not grasp Corrick's tidings, but when he looked out into the night he understood. Already the mounting tidal wave appeared half as high as the cliff, and its writhing had a dark ill cast. There was enough hatred concentrated in it to shatter the grieve. When Lord Hiram turned from it, his face was taut with terrible purpose. He had to shout to make himself heard over the roar of waves and wind and thunder. We must stop him. He violates the sea. If he succeeds, if he bends the sea to his will, the law that preserves it will be broken. It will serve the despiser like another raver. Corrick answered, Yes! There was a fury in the blood guard. They would have disobeyed any other decision. Yet Sill remembered caution enough to say, He has the ill earth stone. No! Lord Hiram searched the floor for the pieces of his staff. When he found them, he called for Klingor. 
Tull gave him a length of line. He used it to lash the two pieces of his staff together, metal heels joined. Clutching this unwieldy instrument, he said, That is only a fragment of the stone. The ill-earth stone itself is much larger. But in our worst dreams we did not guess that the despiser would dare cut pieces of the stone for his servants. His mastery of it must, must be very great. Thus he is able to subdue giants, the ravers and the stone together, the stone empowering the raver and the raver using the stone. And the others, flesh harrower, Satan's fist, they also must possess fragments of the stone. Do you hear, Korik? I hear, Korik replied. The High Lord will be warned. Lord Hiram nodded. The pain in his ribs made him wince, but he thrust his way out of the cell into the howling wind. Korik, Sill, and Tull followed at once. Ahead of them, Kin Slaughterer labored in an ecstasy of power. Though it was still some distance from the piers, the tsunami towered over him, dwarfed his stolen form. Now he was chanting to it, invoking it. His words cut through the tumult of the storm. Come, see, obey me, raise high, crash down, break rock, break stone, crush heart, grind soul, rend flesh, crack whole, eat dead for bread. Come, see, Obey me. And the seas answered, piled still higher. Now the waves' crest frothed and lashed level with the upper ramparts of Kirkri. The blood guard wished to attack instantly, but Lord Hiram held them back, so that he would not be heard by Kinslaughterer. He mouthed the words, I must strike the first blow. Then he moved over the headrock as fast as his damaged chest permitted. When the four started into the levee, the huge wall of water already appeared to be leaning over them. Only the might of Kin Slaughterer's stone kept it erect. As they approached, he was too consumed by the spectacle of his own power to sense them. But in the last moment, some instinct warned him. He spun suddenly, found Lord Hiram within a few yards of him. Roaring savagely, he raised his glowing fist to hurl a blast at the Lord. But while the raver cocked his arm, Lord Hiram leaped the last distance toward him. With the last fragments of his staff, the Lord struck upward. The metal heels hit Kin Slaughterer's hand before his bolt was ready. The two powers clashed in a blaze of green and blue. Kin Slaughterer's greater force drove his might like lightning down the length of Lord Hiram's arms into his head and body. The green fire burned within him, burned his brain and heart. When the flame ceased, he collapsed. But the clash scorched Kin Slaughterer's hand, and its recoil knocked his arm back. He lost the stone. It fell, rolled away from him across the headrock. At once the three blood guards sprang. Together they struck the raver with all their strength, and in that assault their vow at last found utterance. The giant raver was dead before his form fell into the water. Yet still for a long moment the blood guard hurled blows at him, driven by the excess of their rage and abomination. Then the splashing of salt water cooled them, and they perceived that the storm had begun to fade. Without the compulsion of the stone, the wind failed. The lightning stopped. After a few last rolls, the thunder fell away. The tidal wave made a sound like an avalanche as it fell backward into the sea. Its spray wet the faces of the blood guard, and its waves broke over their thighs. Then it was gone. Together the three hastened back to Lord Hiram. He still clung to life, but he was almost at an end. The raver's blast had burned him deeply. His eye sockets were empty, and from between his hollow lids a thin green smoke rose up into the starlight. His sill lifted him into a sitting position. His hands groped about him as if they were searching for his staff. And he said weakly, 
do not, do not touch. Take. He could not speak it. The effort burst his heart. With a groan, he died in Sill's arms. For a time, the blood guard stood over him in silence, gave him what respect they could, but they had no words to say. Soon Corrick went and took up Kinslaughterer's fragment of the yellow earth stone. Without a will to drive it, it was dull. It showed only fitful gleams in its core, but it hurt his hand with a deep and fiery cold. He clenched it in his fist. We will take it to the High Lord, he said. Perhaps the other ravers have such power. The High Lord may use this power to defeat them. Sil and Tull nodded. In the ruin of the mission, there was no other hope left to them. Then we sent homeward the bodies of our fallen comrades, Tull said softly. There was no need for haste. We knew that their Rani Hin could find a way in safety north of the Saran grave. And when that task was done, we returned to the five who stood watch at the lighthouse. Two of them, Corrick charged to return to Lord's Keep with all possible speed so that Revelstone might be warned, and because he judged that the war had already begun, that the High Lord would be marching in the South Plains with the war ward. I was charged, and Shull and Vale with me, to bear these tidings southward the way I have come. With Sil and Doar, Corrick undertook the burden of the Yill Earth Stone, so that it might be taken in safety to Revelstone for the Lords. At last the bloodguard fell silent. For a long time Troy sat gazing sightlessly at the stone before him. He felt deaf and numb, too shocked to hear the low breeze blowing around Kevin's watch, too stunned to feel the chill of the mountain air. Dead, he asked silently. All dead. But it seemed to him that he felt nothing. In him there was a pain so deep that he was not conscious of it. But in time he recollected himself enough to raise his head, look over at Lord Moram. He could see the Lord dimly. His forehead was tight with pain, and his eyes bled tears. With an effort, Troy found his voice. It was husky with emotion as he asked, Is this what you saw last night? Is this it? No. Lord Moram's reply was abrupt. But it was not abrupt with anger. It was abrupt with the exertion of suppressing his sobs. I saw a bloodguard fighting in the service of the despiser. There was a long and heart-rending pause before Tull said through his teeth, That is impossible. They should not have touched the stone. The Lord breathed weakly. They should not. Troy wanted to question Moram, ask him what he meant. But then suddenly he realized that he was seeing more clearly. His fog was lifting. At once he rose to his knees, turned, braced his chest on the edge of the parapet. Instinctively he tightened his sunglasses on his face. Along the rim of the eastern horizon, dawn had already begun. Chapter 18 Doom's Retreat Immediately Troy jumped erect to face the sun. His companions stood with him in tense silence, as if they intended to share what he would see, but he knew that even the blood guard could not match his mental sight. He paid no attention to them. All his awareness was consumed by the gradual revelations of the dawn. At first he could see only a fading gray and purple blankness, but then the direct rays of the sun caught the platform, and his surroundings began to lift their heads out of the mist. Above the long fall into the shadow, he received his first visual sense of the wide open air in which Kevin's watch stood, as if on the tip of a dark finger accusing the heavens. 
In the west, across a distance too great for any sight but his, he saw sunlight touch the thin snow caps of the mountain wedge which separated the south plains from Garreting Deep. And as the sun climbed higher, he made out the long curve of peaks running south and then west from the valley of Mithill Stone Down to Doom's Retreat. Then the light reached down to the hills which formed the eastern border of the plains between Kevin's Watch and Andalane. Now he could follow the whole course of the Mithill River northwest and then north until it joined the black. He felt strangely elevated and mighty. His gaze had never comprehended so much before, and he understood how high Lord Kevin must have felt. Standing on the watch was like being on the pinnacle of the earth. But the sun kept rising. Like a tide of illumination it flooded across the plains, washing away the last of his blindness. What he saw staggered him where he stood. Horror filled his eyes like the rush of an avalanche. It was worse than anything he could have imagined. He made out the war ward first. His army had just begun to march. It crept south along the mountain wedge. He saw it as hardly more than a smudge in the foothills, but he could gauge its speed. It was still two days from Doom's retreat. Hiltmar Kwan's force was closer to him and farther from the retreat, but the horsemen were moving faster. He estimated their numbers instinctively, instantly. He knew at once that they had been decimated. More than a third of the two hundred bloodguard were gone, and of Kwan's twelve Eoward, less than six remained. They hurried raggedly, almost at a dead rout. Raging at their heels came a vast horde of Kreesh, at least ten thousand of the savage yellow wolves. The mightiest of them, the most powerful two thousand, bore black riders, Irviles. The ridden Kreesh ran in tight wedges, and the Irvile loremasters at the wedge tips threw torrents of dark force at every rider who fell within their reach. In an effort to control the pace, restrain it from utter flight, Eoman turned at intervals. Twenty or forty warriors threw themselves together at the yellow wall to slow the charge of the Kreesh. Troy could see flashes of blue fire in these sorties. Colindril and Veerment were alive. But two lords were not enough. The riders were hopelessly outnumbered, and they were already well beyond the Mithill River in their race toward Doom's retreat. Even if they ran no faster, they would reach the retreat before the marching war ward. Juan had been unable to gain the last day that the marchers needed. Yet even that was not the most crushing sight. Behind the wolves came the main body of Lord Fowl's army. This body was closer than the others to Kevin's watch, and Troy could see it with appalling clarity. The giant striding at its head was the least of its horrors. At the giant's back marched immense ranks of cave whites, at least twenty thousand of the strong, ungainly rock delvers. Behind them hurried an equal number of Irviles, loping on all fours for better speed. Through their ranks, hundreds of fearsome, lion-like griffins alternately trotted and flew, and after the demon dim spawn came a seething, grim army so huge that Troy could not even guess its numbers. Humans, wolves, wane him, forest animals, creatures of the flat, all radiating the fathomless blood hunger which coerced them, many myriad of warped, rabid creatures, the perverted handiwork of Lord Fowl and the Ill Earth Stone. Most of this prodigious army had already crossed the Mid Hill in pursuit of Hiltmark Quan and his command. It moved with such febrile speed that it was little more than three days from Doom's retreat, and it was so mighty that no ambush however well conceived, could hope to stand against it. But there would be no ambush. The war war did not know its peril, and would not reach the retreat in time. Like jagged hunks of rock, these facts beat Warmark Troy to his knees. Dear God, he breathed in anguish, what have I done? The avalanche of revelations battered him down. Dear God! Dear God, what have I done?
Behind him, Lord Moram insisted with mounting urgency, What is it? What do you see? Warmark, what do you see? But Troy could not answer. His world was reeling around him. Through the vertigo of his perceptions, his clutching mind could grasp only one thought. This was his fault. All of it was his fault. The futility of Korik's mission, the end of the giants, the inevitable slaughter of the war ward, everything was on his head. He had been in command. And when the debacle of his command was over, the land would be defenseless. He had served the despiser from the start without knowing it, and what Atiar and Trellmate had given her life for was worse than nothing. Worse! he gasped. He had condemned his warriors to death, and they were only the beginning of the toll Lord Fowl would exact for his misjudgment. Dear God! He wanted to howl, but his chest was too full of horror. It had no room for outcries. He did not understand how the despiser's army could be so big. It surpassed his most terrible nightmares. Wildly, he surged to his feet. He tore at his breast, trying to wrest enough air from his unbreathable failure for just one cry. But he could not get it. His lungs were clogged with ruin. A sudden loud helplessness roared in his ears, and he pitched forward. He did not realize that he had tried to jump until Terrell and Rule caught his legs and hauled him back over the parapet. Then he felt a burning in his cheeks. Lord Moron was slapping him. When he flinched, the Lord pulled close to him, shouted into his eyeless face, Warmark! Heil Troy! Hear me! I understand. The Despiser's army is great, and the War Ward will not reach Doom's retreat in time. I can help! Dumbly, instinctively, Troy tried to straighten his sunglasses on his face, and found that they were gone. He had lost them over the edge of Kevin's watch. Hear me, Moram cried. I can send word. If either Colin Drill or Veerment lives, I can be heard. They can warn Amarine. He grabbed Troy's shoulders and his fingers dug in, trying to gain a hold on Troy's bones. Here, I am able, but I must have reason, hope. I cannot, if it is useless. Answer he demanded through clenched teeth. You are the war mark. Find hope. Do not leave your warriors to die. No, Troy whispered. He tried to break away from Moram's grip, but the Lord's fingers were too strong. There's no way. Fowl's army is too big. He wanted to weep, but Moram did not let him. Discover a way, the Lord raged. They will be slain. You must save them. I can't, Troy shouted in sudden anger. The stark impossibility of Moram's demand touched a hidden resource in him, and he yelled, Fowl's army is too goddamn big. Our forces are going to get there too late. The only way they can stay alive just a little longer is to run straight through the retreat and keep going until they drop. There's nothing out there, just wastes and desert and a clump of ruins, and... Abruptly, his heart lurched. Kevin's watch seemed to tilt under him, and he grabbed at Moram's wrists to steady himself. Sweet Jesus, he whispered. There is one chance. Speak it! There's one chance, Troy repeated in a tone of wonder. Jesus! With an effort, he forced his attention into focus on Moram. But you will have to do it. Then I will do it. Tell me what must be done. For a moment longer, the sweet sense of reprieve amazed Troy, outweighing the need to act, almost dumbfounding him. It's going to be rough, he murmured to himself. God, it's going to be rough. But Moram's insistent grip held him. Speaking slowly to help himself collect his thoughts, he said, You're going to have to do it. There's no other way. But first you've got to get through to Colandril or Veerment. 
Lord Moram's piercing gaze probed Troy. Then Moram hilted the war mark to his feet. Quietly, the Lord asked, Do Colin Drill and Veerment live? Yes, I saw their fire. Can you reach them? They don't have any of that high wood. Moram smiled grimly. What message shall I give? Now Troy studied Moram. He felt oddly vulnerable without his sunglasses, as if he were exposed to reproach, even to abhorrence. But he could see Moram acutely. What he saw reassured him. The Lord's eyes gleamed with hazardous potentials, and the bones of his skull had an indomitable hue. The contrast to his own weakness humbled Troy. He turned away to look out over the plains again. The ponderous movement of Lord Fowl's hordes continued as before, and at the sight he felt a resurgence of panic. But he held on to his power of command, gripped it to keep his shame at bay. Finally he said, All right, let's get going. Tull, you'd better go back to the stone down. Have the Rani Hin brought as far up the trail as possible. We've got a long run ahead of us. Yes, Warmark. Tull left the watch soundlessly. Now, Moram, you had the right idea. Amarine has got to be warned. She has got to get to the retreat ahead of Quan. It occurred to him that Quan might not be alive, but he forced that fear down. I don't care how she does it. She's got to have that ambush ready when the riders arrive. If she doesn't... He had to lock his jaw to keep his voice from shaking. Can you communicate that? He shuddered to think of the warrior's plight. After a twenty-five-day march, they would have to run the last fifty miles, only to learn that their ordeal was not done. Pushing himself around to face Moram, he demanded, Well? Moram had already taken the Lomilia lower rod from his robe and was lashing it across his staff with a clingor thong. As he secured the rod, he said, My friend, you should leave the watch. You will be safer below. Troy acquiesced without question. He gazed at the armies once more to be sure that he had gauged their relative speeds accurately, then wished Lord Moram good luck and started the descent. The stairs felt slippery under his hands and feet, but he was reassured by Rule's presence right below him. Soon he stood on the ledge at the base of the watch and stared up into the blue sky toward Lord Moram. After a pause that seemed unduly long to Troy's quickening sense of urgency, he heard snatches of song from atop the shaft. The song mounted into the air, then abruptly fell silent. At once flame erupted around Lord Moram. It engulfed the whole platform of the watch, and it filled the air with an impression of reverberation, as if the cliff face echoed a protracted and inaudible shriek. The noiseless ululation made Troy's ears burn, made him ache to cover them and hide his head, but he forced himself to withstand it. He did not take his gaze off the watch. The echoing was mercifully brief. Moments after its last vibration had faded, Terrell came down the stair, half carrying Moram. Troy was afraid that the Lord had damaged himself, but Moram only suffered from a sudden exhaustion the price of his exertion. All his movements were weak, unsteady, and his face dripped with sweat, but he managed a faint smile for Troy. I would not care to be Colandril's foe, he said wanly. He is strong. He sends riders to Amarine. Good. Troy's voice was gruff with affection and relief. But if we don't get to Doom's retreat before mid-afternoon tomorrow... It'll be wasted. Moram nodded. He braced himself on Terrell's shoulder and stumbled away along the ledge with Troy and Rule behind him. They made slow progress at first because of Moram's fatigue, but before long they reached a small, pine-girdled valley plentifully grown with oleantha. A breakfast of treasure berries rejuvenated Lord Moram, and after that he moved more swiftly. Behind Moram and Terrell, with Rule at his back, Troy travelled on an urgent wind, a pressure for haste that threatened to become a gale. 
He was eager to reach the Ranihin. When they met Tull and the other blood guard on their way up the trail, he mounted Merrill at once and hurried the Ranihin into a brisk trot back toward Mithill Stone Down. He intended to ride straight past the village to the plains where the Ranihin could run. However, as he and his companions approached the Stone Down, he saw the circle of elders waiting beside the trail. Reluctantly, he stopped and saluted them. Hail, Warmark Troy, Teraslen mate replied. Hail, Lord Moram. We have heard some of the tidings of war, and know that you must make haste. The Triox, son of Thuler, would speak with you. As Teras introduced him, Triox stepped forward. Hail, elders of Mithill Stone Down, Moram responded. Our thanks again for your hospitality. Triox, son of Thuler, we will hear you. But speak swiftly, time presses heavily upon us. It is no great matter, said Triox stiffly. I wish only to seek pardon for my earlier conduct. I have reason for distress, as you know. But I kept my oath of peace at Ariar on Trellmate's behest, at a time when I sorely wished to break it. I have no wish to dishonor her courage now. It was my hope that Trell Gravelingus would stay with the High Lord, to protect her. He said this defiantly, as if he expected Moram to reprimand him. Now he is not with her, and I am not with her. My heart fears this. But if it were possible, I would take back my harshness to you. There is no need for pardon, Moram answered. My own weak faith provoked you. But I must tell you that I believe Thomas Covenant to be a friend of the land. The burden of his crime hurts him. I believe he will seek atonement at the High Lord's side. He paused, and Triarch bowed in a way that said he accepted the Lord's words without being convinced. Then Moram went on. Triarch, son of Thula, please accept a gift from me. In the name of the High Lord, who is loved by all the land. Reaching into his robe, he brought out his Lomiliolor rod. This is high wood, Triarch. You have been in the Lor's rot, and will know some of its uses. I will not use it again. He said this with a resolution that surprised Troy. And you will have need of it. I am called Seer and Oracle. I speak from knowledge, though the need itself is closed to me. Please accept it, for the sake of the love we share, and as expiation for my doubt. Triarch's eyes widened, and the twisting of his face relaxed briefly. Troy caught a glimpse of what Triarch might have looked like if his life had not been blighted. In silence, he accepted the rod from Lord Moram's hands, but when he held the high wood, his old bitterness gripped his features again, and he said dourly, I may find a use which will surprise you. Then he bowed, and the other elders bowed with him, freeing Moram and Troy to be on their way. Troy threw them a salute and took his opportunity. He had no time to spare for Moram's strange gift or for Triarch's brooding promises. Instead, he clapped Merrill with his heels and led his companions out of the valley of Mithill Stone down at a gallop. In a short time they rounded the western spur of the mountains and swung out into the plains. As Troy scanned his companions, he was surprised to see that Tull's mount could keep up the pace. This Ronnie Hin had been ridden through danger at cruel speeds for the past eight days, and the strain had wounded its gait. But it was a Ronnie Hin. Its head was up, its eyes were proud and its matted mane jumped on its neck like a flag gallantly struggling to unfurl. For a moment, Troy understood why the Ramen did not ride, but he made no concessions to the Ranihin's fatigue. Throughout the day, he kept his company running like rapid thunder into the west. He ached to join his warriors, to share the fight and the desperation with them, to show them the one way in which they might be able to steal a victory out of the teeth of Lord Fowl's army. Only an exigent need for sleep forced him to stop during part of the night. 
Ruel awakened him before dawn, and he rode on again along the base of the southern range. When daylight returned his vision to him, he could see the cliffs near Doom's retreat ahead. Now his direct route to the retreat would take him angling rapidly closer to the vanguard of Lord Fowle's army. But he kept his heading. Near that horde of Creech and Irviles, he would find whatever was left of the mounted Eo ward. He caught sight of Quan's force sooner than he had expected. The hilt mark must have taken his riders on a southward curve toward the retreat to keep their pursuers as far as possible from the march of the war ward. Shortly after noon, Troy and his companions crested a high foothill which enabled them to look some distance north into the plains. And there, only a league away, they saw the tattered, fleeing remnant of Quan's command. At first, Troy felt a thrill of relief. He could see Hiltmar Quan riding beside his standard-bearer among the warriors. At least six score bloodguard galloped among the Eoward, and the blue robes of Colendril and Veerment were clearly visible through the dark surge of the retreat. But then Troy perceived how the riders were moving. They were almost completely routed. In a tight mass like a swath of panic on the plains, they pushed and jostled against each other, threw frantic glances behind them in ways that unbalanced their mounts, bristled with angry and fearful cries. Some of them whipped their horses. Behind them the creche ran like a yellow gale scored with black. Nevertheless, the distance between the warriors and the wolves remained constant. After a moment, Troy understood. Quan's ward were struggling to match exactly the hunting pace of the creche. The wolves themselves could not maintain a dead run. They were forced by the weight of their riders and by the long distance of the chase to travel at the swift loping gait of a hunting pack. And Quan's warriors fought to keep their flight almost directly under the noses of the wolves. In this way they lured the creche onward. With prey so near, the wolves could neither rest nor turn aside. Quan's strategy was cunning, cunning and fatal. The warriors also could not rest. They were vulnerable to every spurt of speed from the creche, and any warrior who was unseated for any reason was instantly torn to pieces. Another eel ward had already been lost this way, but if Quan could maintain these tactics, the marching eel ward would have until late afternoon to reach their positions in Doom's retreat. The war mark did not bother to calculate the odds. He urged Merrill ahead. At full stretch, the Ranihin raced to join Quan. When they saw Troy and Lord Moram, the warriors gave a raw, dry cheer. Quan, Colendril, and Veerment dashed out toward the war mark. But there was little joy in their reunion. The plight of the Eoward was desperate. When he drew close to them, Troy saw that most of the horses were virtually prostrate on their feet. Only their fear of the wolves kept them up and running. And the warriors were in no better condition. They had ridden for days without proper food or sleep. None of them lacked injuries. The dust of the plains clung to their faces and clotted their wounds, making the cuts and rents look like premature scars. Troy had to tear his aching gaze from them to salute the hilt mark. Through the thunder of the hooves, Quan shouted, Hail, Warmark! Well met! As Troy swung Merrill into place beside him, he added, Not eight days, I fear. Did you send word to Armarine? Troy yelled. Yes. Then it's all right. Seven will be enough. He clapped the hilt mark's shoulder, then slowed Merrill and dropped back among the warriors. Immediately dust and fear and tension swirled around him like the hot breath of the creche. Now he could hear the hunting snarl of the wolves and the roinish barking of the Irviles. He felt their presence as if they were his fault, as if they had been created by his folly. Yet he forced himself to smile at his warriors, shout encouragement through the din. He could not afford self-recrimination. The burden of saving the war ward was on his shoulders now. 
Moments later, a surge ran through the barking commands of the Irvile. Troy guessed that the pursuers were about to attempt another spurt. He looked ahead quickly toward the sheer cliffs of Doom's retreat. They were no more than two leagues away. There, the western tip of the southern range swung northward to meet the southeast corner of the mountain wedge which separated the south plains from Garroting Deep, and between these two ranges was the defile of Doom's retreat. The narrow canyon lay like a gash through the rock, and its crooked length provided the land's only access to the wastes and the grey desert. Troy's gaze sprang to the mouth of the canyon. The last marching Eoward was still arriving at the retreat. If they were not given more time, they would be caught outside the canyon by the creche. Their ambush would fail. The war mark was moving too swiftly for hesitation. When he was sure that the war ward had been Quan's riders, he pushed Merrill ahead, away from the creche, and caught the hilt mark's attention with a wave of his arm. Then he gave Quan a hand signal which ordered the eel ward to turn and attack. Quan did not falter. He understood the need for the order. Despite the maimed condition of his command, he sent up a shrill, piercing whistle which drew the eyes of his officers toward him. With hand signals he gave the hafts and war hafts their instructions. Almost at once the riders responded. The outer ear ward peeled back, and the warriors in the center tried to turn where they were. Frantically they fought their horses around to face the wolves. Disaster struck the maneuver immediately. As soon as the riders stopped fleeing, Kreesh crashed in among them. The whole trailing edge of Quan's command went down under the onslaught, and the Irvile lore masters whirled their iron staves, throwing acid power gleefully over the fallen humans and horses. The screaming of the horses shot through the tumult of snarls and cries. Instantly, a wide swath of grey-green bracken turned blood-red, but the abrupt profusion of corpses broke the charge of the creche. Their leaders stopped to kill and tear and eat, and this threw the following wolves into confusion. Only the Irvile wedges drove straight ahead into the milling heart of the Eel Ward. Bloodguard raced to the aid of the warriors. The three lords threw themselves at the nearest Irviles. Other warriors rallied and struck and through the center of the fight Warmark Troy charged like a madman, hacking at every wolf within reach. For a time the creche were held. The warriors fought with a desperate fury, and the cool blood guard broke wolves in all directions. Working together, the lords blasted one Irvile wedge apart, then another. But that accounted for only a tenth of the mounted Irviles. The others regrouped, began to restore order, coordination to the creche. Some of the horses lost their footing on the slick ground. Others went out of control with fear, threw their riders, and lost themselves in futile plunges among the wolves. Troy saw that if any of the warriors were to survive this fight, they would have to flee soon. He battled his way toward the lords, but suddenly a whole pack of creche swirled about him. Merrill spun, dodging the fangs and kicking. Troy fought as best he could, but Merrill's whirling unbalanced him. Twice he almost lost his seat. A wolf leaped up at him, and he barely saved himself by jabbing his sword into its belly. Then Rule brought other bloodguard to his aid. In a concerted charge, ten of them hammered into the pack, shattered it. Troy righted himself, tried uselessly to straighten his missing sunglasses, then cursed himself and sent Merrill toward the lords again. As he moved, he snapped a glance at the retreat. The last of the marchers were just disappearing down the canyon. Do something, he howled when he neared Lord Moram. We're being slaughtered. Moram spun and shouted to Colandrill and Veerment, then returned to the war mark. On my signal, he yelled over the din. Flee on my signal. Without waiting for a reply, he pushed his Ronnie Hin into a gallop and dashed toward the retreat with the other lords. In a hundred yards they separated. Veerment stopped directly between the conflict and the retreat, while Moram raced straight north, 
and Collinville ran south. When they were in position, they formed a long line across the approach to Doom's retreat. They dismounted. Lord Veerment held his staff upright on the ground in the center as Moram and Colindril whirled their staffs and shouted strange invocations through the noise of battle. While they prepared, Troy fought his way to Quan's side, told him what Moram had said. The Hiltmark accepted it without pausing. They separated, battled away toward the flanks of the struggle, spreading the command. Troy feared that Moram's call would come too late. The power of ninety score Irviles rapidly organized the turbulent creche. As the Eobard gathered themselves to flee, the Irviles wrenched the creche away from the tearing of carcasses, bunched them again into fighting wedges, and hurled them at the warriors. In that instant, Lord Moron signaled with his staff. The riders sent their horses running straight toward Doom's retreat. They seemed to rush out from under the piled spring of the wolves. Once again the trailing warriors crashed to the ground under a massive breaker of creche. But this time the remaining riders did not fight back. They gave free rein to the fear of their horses and fled. The suddenness of their flight opened a gap between them and the wolves, and the gap widened slowly as the horses at last found release for all their accumulated dread. In moments... Troy and Quan, with the last three Eobard and little more than a hundred bloodguard, flashed by on either side of Lord Veerment. As they passed him, he took his staff from where he had planted it in the line between Moram and Colindril, caught it by one end with both hands, and cocked it behind his head. Then the last rider had crossed the line. Veerment swung his staff and struck the ground of the line with all his might, Instantly, a shimmering wall of force sprang up between Moram and Colindril. When the first creche charged it, it flared into brilliant blue flame and hurled them back. Seeing that the wall held, Lord Moram leaped onto the Ranihin and sprinted after the warriors. Lord Veermant followed as swiftly as his sturdy mustang could carry him. When they neared Troy and Quan, Moram shouted, Make haste! The forbidding cannot hold. The Irviles will break it. Flee! The warriors needed no urging, and Quan dashed after them, stridently herding them toward the retreat. Troy went with him. For a moment Moram and Veermet were right behind them, but suddenly the Lord stopped. At the same time all the bloodguard wheeled their Ranihin and pounded back toward the forbidding. Cursing in dismay, Troy turned to see what had happened. Lord Colindril was on the ground near the wall. Several badly wounded warriors had fallen from their mounts within yards of the blue fire, and Colindril was trying to help them. Rapidly he tore their clothing into strips, made tourniquets and bandages. He did not look up to see his danger. Already the Irviles were preparing to fight the wall, they sent most of the riderless creche running to pass around the ends of the fire. Three Irvile wedges moved forward to attack. The rest retreated a short distance and began reforming themselves into a huge, single wedge. Troy kicked Merrill into a gallop and joined the bloodguard following Moram and Veerment. Lord Moram was twenty yards ahead of Troy, but he could not reach Colindril in time. The three Irvile wedges near the fire attacked. They did not try to break the Lord's Wall. Instead, the Lore Masters concentrated all their power in one place. With a harsh clang, they struck their iron staves together. A great spew of liquid force gushed from the impact, splashed into the forbidding fire, and passed through it. In black, burning gouts, the corrosive fluid dropped toward Colindril. It fell just short of him, did not touch him, but it hit the ground with a concussion that flung him and the injured warriors into the air like limp bundles. When they flopped down again, they lay still. At once, the three wedges hurried aside and the new, single, massed wedge started lumbering toward the wall. Simultaneously, the first creche rounded both ends of the fire. The next instant, Lord Moram threw himself from his Ronihin's back, landed beside Colindril. 
A quick glance told him that the warriors were dead. The force of the concussion had killed them. He concentrated on call and drill. Touching the Lord's chest with his hands, he confirmed what his eyes told him. Life still flickered in call and drill, but his heart was not beating. Then Troy reached Morham's side, and the blood guard poised themselves to defend the Lord's. On horseback, Veerment worked at the wall of forbidding, tightened it against the assault of the wedge, but it could not withstand fifteen hundred Irviles. The wedge moved slowly, but it was hardly twenty yards from the fire, and Creesh poured around the ends of the wall now, pelting toward the bloodguard and lords. The bloodguard moved out to meet the wolves, but a hundred bloodguard could not hold back five thousand Creesh for long. Flee! Moram yelled. Go! Save yourselves! We must not all die here! But he did not wait to observe that no one obeyed him. Instead, he bent over the fallen lord again. Holding his lower lip in his teeth, he massaged Colandrill's chest, hoping to renew his pulse. But his heart remained motionless. Moram drew a sudden sharp breath, raised his fist and hammered once with all his might on Colandrill's chest. The blow jolted the lord's heart. It lurched, stumbled, then broke into a limping beat. Moram shouted for Moral. At once the blood guard leaped down from his Ronihin, caught Colandrill in his arms, and sprang up again. Seeing this, Lord Veerment broke away from the forbidding wall, started back toward Doom's retreat. Moram and Troy mounted, surged away from the wall after him. The blood guard followed in a protective ring around the lords. A moment later, the massed Irvile wedge hit the wall and tore it. Dark, liquid powers shredded the blue flame, ripped it into fragments and scattered it. Instantly, the rest of the creche flooded after the escaping Ronihin, and the wolves pouring around the ends of the wall changed direction to intercept the riders. But the Ronihin outdistanced them. The greatest horses of Ra pulled past Veerment and thundered toward Doom's retreat. Ahead, under the late afternoon shadow of the cliffs, Hiltmark Quan was urging the last of his warriors into the canyon. Maddened by the escape of so many prey, the Creesh howled with rage and swung to converge on Lord Veerment. His mustang ran hard and bravely, but it was already exhausted. Slowly the Creesh gained on it. Before it had covered half the distance to the retreat, Troy could see that it would lose the race. He called for help but the blood guard did not respond. Only Toman, the blood guard personally responsible for Veerment, remained behind. In sense, Troy started to go back himself, but Moram stopped him by shouting, There is no need! Toman waited until the last possible moment, until the Creesh were raging at the heels of the Mustang. Then he pulled the Lord onto his own Ronihin and carried him away toward the retreat. Almost at once the Mustang fell screaming under an avalanche of wolves. For an instant the haze of the cliff shadow turned sickly red in Troy's sight. But then Merrill's taut run bore him beyond the scream, took him straight toward the gap in the cliffs. He flashed into the deeper gloom of the defile. Except for the slit of light ahead, he could see nothing. The sharp change made him feel that he was foundering. The rumble of hooves pounded back at him from the cliffs, and behind the echo came the shrill croaking derision of the ravens. He felt waters of darkness closing over his head. When he broke out the end of the retreat into the dim, late light of day, he was almost dazzled with relief. As he passed, first half Damarine gave a piercing shout, and thousands of warriors dashed away from the cliffs on either side of the gap. Despite the long fatigue which radiated from them, they ran with precision, took positions, formed an arc over the end of the canyon, sealed the trap. Moments later the first creche came howling out of the retreat and sprang at them. The whole arc of warriors staggered under the shock of impact, but Armorine had eighteen Eoward braced to meet the onslaught. The arc gave ground, but did not break. With an effort, Troy brought himself under control. Over to one side he could hear Lord Veerment barking, Release me! Am I a child that I must be carried? Troy grinned grimly, 
then drew Merrill up behind the ark so that he would be ready to help his warriors if the wolves outweighed them. He ached to see the outcome of the trap, but the darkness of the retreat foiled his sight. Soon, however, he could hear the sounds of combat echoing out of the defile. Over the noise of the embattled ark, he made out a sudden raw howl as the creche in the retreat found themselves attacked from above by twenty Eoward hidden in the canyon walls. At first the howl contained surprise and ferocity, but no fear. The wolves did not understand their danger. The Irviles were wiser. Their commands cut stridently through the rage of the wolves, and soon the howling changed. To their dismay, the creche began to understand the glee of the ravens, and the yammering of the Irviles became fiercer, more desperate. In the narrow defile they could not make effective use of their fighting wedges, and without that focus of power they were vulnerable to arrows and spears and rockfalls. Caught in a seething, confused mass of wolves, the wedges began to collapse. As the wedges crumbled, fear and uncertainty penetrated the wolves' fury for blood. In tattered bunches the creche broke away, tried to flee through the canyon, but the cramped panic of their numbers only hampered them and made the Irviles more vulnerable. And death rained down on them through the jeering of the ravens. In mad frenzy, wild to fight an enemy they could not reach, the creche started to attack the Irviles. No wolves or Irviles escaped. When the battle was done, the entire vanguard of Flesh Harrower's army lay dead in Doom's retreat. For one moment, a hush fell over the battleground. Even the ravens were silent. Then a hoarse cheer came echoing from the canyon. The Eowards, seeding the end of the retreat, responded loudly, and the ravens began sailing down to the defile's floor, where they feasted on Demon Dim's spawn and creche. Slowly, Troy became aware that first half Armorine was at his side. When he turned to her, he felt that he was grinning insanely, but even without his sunglasses he did not care. Congratulations, Armorine, he said. You've done well. The evening fog on his sight was already so bad that he had to ask her about casualties. We have lost few warriors, she replied with dour satisfaction. Your battle plan is a good one. But her praise only reminded him of the rest of Lord Fowle's army and of the ordeal still before the war ward. He shook his head. Not good enough. But then, rather than explain what he meant, he said to her, First half, give my thanks to the warriors. Get them fed and settled for the night. There won't be any more fighting today. When they're taken care of, we'll have a council. Amarine's gaze showed that she did not understand his attitude, but she saluted without question and moved away to carry out his orders. His blank mist swallowed her at once. Darkness blew about him as if it rode on the wind of the war ward shouting. He called for rule and asked the blood guard to guide him to Lord Moram. They found Moram beside a small campfire under the lee of the westward mountains. He was tending Lord Colandrill. Colandrill had regained consciousness, but his skin was as pale as alabaster, and he looked weak. Moram cooked some broth over the campfire and massaged Colandrill while the broth heated. Lord Colandrill greeted the war mark faintly, and Troy replied with pleasure. He was glad to see that Colandrill was not mortally injured. He was going to need the Lord. He was going to need every help or power that he could find. But he had other things to consider before he began to think about his need for help. When he had assured himself that Lord Colandrill was on the way to recovery, he drew Moram away for a private talk. He waited until they were beyond earshot of the Boar Ward's camp. Then he sighed wearily. Moram, we're not finished. We can't stop here. Without transition, as if he had not changed subjects, he went on. What are we going to do about Lord Veerment? One of us has got to tell him about Shitra. 
I'll do it if you want. I probably deserve it. I will do it, Moram murmured distantly. All right. Troy felt acutely relieved to be free of that responsibility. Now, what about this, what Tull told us? I don't like the idea of telling everyone that, that the mission... He could not bring himself to say the words, the giants are dead. I don't think the warriors will survive what's ahead if they know what happened to the mission. It's too much. Having three giants taken over by ravers is bad enough, and I'll have to tell them worse things than that myself. Softly Moram breathed. They deserve to know the truth. Deserve? Troy's deep feeling of culpability flooded into anger. What they deserve is victory. By God, don't tell me what they deserve. It's a little late for you to start worrying about what they know or don't know. You've seen fit to keep secrets from me all along. God knows how many horrors you still haven't told me. Keep your mouth shut about this. That choice was made by the Consul. No one person has the right to withhold knowledge from another. No one is wise enough. Moram spoke as if he were wrestling with himself. It's too late for that. If you want to talk about rights, you don't have the right to destroy my army. My friend, have you... have you suffered? Has the withholding of knowledge harmed you? How should I know? Maybe if you had told me the truth about Atiaran, we wouldn't be here now. Maybe I would have been afraid of the risk. You tell me if that's good or bad. Then his anger softened. Moram, he pleaded. They're right on the edge. I've already pushed them right to the edge. And we're not done. I just want to spare them something that will hurt so bad. Very well. Moram sighed in a tone of defeat. I will not speak of the giants. Thank you, Troy said intensely. Moram gazed at him searchingly, but through his darkness he could not read the Lord's expression. For a moment he feared that Moram was about to tell him something, reveal the last mysteries of Trell and Elena and the Covenant. He did not want to hear such things, not now, when he was already so overburdened. But finally the Lord turned silently and started back toward Colandrill. Troy followed him. But on the way he paused to speak with Terrell, who was the ranking bloodguard. Terrell, I want you to send scouts out to the South Plains. I don't expect Fowl's army before midday tomorrow, but we shouldn't take any chances, and the warriors are too tired. But there's one thing. If Fowl or Flesh Harrower or whoever is in command sends any scouts this way, make sure they know we are here. I don't want them to have any doubt about where to find us. Yes, Warmark, Terrell said, and stepped away to make the arrangements. Troy and Moram went on to their campfire. They found Lord Veerment feeding Colandrill. As he spooned the broth to Colandrill's lips, the hawk-faced lord talked steadily in a low, exasperated tone, as if his pride were offended. But his movements were gentle, and he did not abandon the task to Moram. He hovered over Colandrill until the warm broth had restored a touch of color to his pale cheeks. Then Veerment stood up and rasped. You would be less foolhardy were you not Rani Hinborn. A lesser mount would teach you the limits of your own strength. This inverted repetition of Veerment's old accusation against himself momentarily overcame Lord Moram. A moan escaped through his teeth, and his eyes filled with tears. For that moment his courage seemed to fail him, and he reached toward Veerment as if he were groping through blind grief. But then he caught himself, smiled crookedly at the rough look of surprise and concern on Veerment's face. Come, my brother, he murmured, I must speak with you. 
Together they walked away into the night, leaving Troy to watch over Colandrill. In a wan voice, Colandrill asked, What has happened? What disturbs Moron? Sighing heavily, Troy seated himself beside the Lord. He was full of all the evil he had caused. He had to swallow several times before he could find his voice to say, Runic came back from Korik's mission. Lord Shitra died in the Saren grave. Then he was grateful that Corlandril did not speak. He did not think he could stand a reprimand of any more pain. They sat together in silence until Lord Moram returned alone. Moram carried himself sorely, as if he had just been beaten with clubs. The flesh around his eyes was red and swollen, sorrowful. But his eyes themselves wielded a hot peril, and his glances were like spears. He said nothing about Lord Veerment. Words were unnecessary. Moram's expression revealed how Veerment took the news of his wife's death. To steady himself, Moram set about preparing food for Troy and himself. Their meal passed under a shroud of gloom. But as he ate, Lord Moram slowly mastered himself, relaxed the pain in his face. To match him, Warmark Troy grappled inwardly for the tone of confidence he would need when the council started. He did not want his doubt to show. He did not intend to make his army pay for his personal dilemmas and inadequacies. When Hiltmark Quan approached the fire and announced that all the hafts were ready, both Troy and Moram answered him resolutely, calmly. The Lord threw a large pile of wood onto the fire while Quan brought his officers into a wide circle around it. But despite the bright blaze of the fire, the hafts looked hazy and insubstantial to Troy. For an irrational instant, he feared that they would break into illusions and disappear when he told them what they had to do. But he braced himself. Hiltmar Quan and First Half Darmarine stood near him like pillars on one side, and Lord Moram watched him from the other. Clearing his throat, he opened the council. Well, we're here. In spite of everything, we've accomplished something that any of us would have said was impossible. Before we get into what's ahead, I want to thank you all for what you've done. I'm proud of you, more than I'll ever be able to say. As he spoke, he had to resist a temptation to duck his head, as if he were ashamed of his uncovered eyelessness. Painfully, he wondered what effect this view of him would have on the hafts. But he forced himself to hold his head up as he continued, But I have to tell you plainly, we haven't come near winning this war yet. We've made a good start, but it's only a start. Things are going to get worse. He lost his voice for a moment and had to clench himself to recover it. It's not going to work out the way I planned. Hiltmar Quan, first half Armorine, you've done everything you could, everything I asked, but it's not going to work out the way I told you it would. But first things first. We've got reports to make. Yes, ma'am. Will you go first? Quan bowed and stepped forward into the circle. His square, white-haired visage was streaked with grime and blood and fatigue, but his open gaze did not falter. In blunt, unaffected language, he described all that had happened to his command since he had left Revelstone the raft ride and run to the Mithill Valley, the blockade there, the progression of the battle as Flesh Harrower, the corrupted giant of whom Mainthrall Rue had spoken, organized successive efforts to break the hold of the defenders. For five days the Blood Guard, the warriors, and the two lords withstood Cave Whites, Creech, warped, man-like creations of the Ill Earth Stone, Irviles. But on the sixth day, Quan continued, Flesh Harrower came against us himself. Now his voice expressed the weariness of long fighting and lost warriors. With a power that I do not name, 
he called a great storm against us. Abominable creatures like those of which Mainthrall Rue spoke fell upon us from the sky. They cast fear among our mounts, and we were driven back. Then Flesh Harrower broke the forbidding, and sent Creech and Irviles to pursue us. Time and again we turned to fight, so that the enemy might be delayed, and time and again we were overmastered. Often we sent riders ahead to bear warning, but every messenger was slain. Flocks of savage cormorants assailed them from the sky and destroyed them all, though some of them were bloodguard. Still we fought, he concluded. At last we are here. But half the bloodguard and eight of the eoward were slain, and the horses have passed the end of their strength. Many will never bear riders again, and all need long days of rest. The battle which remains must be met afoot. When he finished, he returned to his place in the circle. His courage was evident, but as he moved, his square shoulders seemed already to be carrying all the weight they could bear. And because Troy could find no words for his respect and gratitude, he said nothing. Silently, he nodded to first half Domarine. She described briefly the last few days of the war ward's march, then she reported on the present condition of the army. Water and Aliantha are not plentiful here, beyond Doom's retreat. The war ward carries food which may be stretched for five days or six, no more. The warriors themselves are sorely damaged by their march. Even the uninjured are crippled by exhaustion. Great numbers have wounds about their feet and shoulders, wounds which do not heal. Three score of the weakest die during our last run to the retreat. Many more will die if the war ward does not rest now. Her words made Troy groan inwardly. They were full of unintended reproaches. He was the war mark. He had promised victory again and again to people who trusted him. And now... He felt a sharp desire to berate himself, tell the hafts just how badly he had miscalculated. But before he could begin, Lord Colendrill spoke. The wounded lord was supported by two bloodguard, but he was able to make his weak voice heard. I must speak of the power which Hiltmar Quan did not name. I still do not comprehend how the despiser gained mastery over a giant. It surpasses my understanding. But Flesh Harrower is in truth a giant, and he is possessed of a great power. He bears with him a fragment of the ill earth stone. Lord Moram nodded painfully. Alas, my friends, he said, this is a dark time for all the land. Danger and death beset us on every hand, and ill defies all defense. Hear me. I know how this giant, this flesh harrower, has been turned against us. It is accomplished through the combined might of the stone and the ravers. Either alone would not suffice. The giants are strong and sure. But together, who in the land could hope to endure? Therefore the giant carries a fragment of the ill earth stone, so that the despiser's power will remain upon him, and the raver will possess an added weapon. Mel and Kurian Abatha! This is a great evil. For a moment he stood silent as if in dismay, and distress filled the hats as they tasted the magnitude of the ill he described. But then he drew himself up, and his eyes flashed around the circle. Yet it is always thus with the despiser. Let not the knowledge of this evil blind you or weaken you. Lord Fowl seeks to turn all the good of the land to harm and corruption. Our task is clear. We must find the strength to turn harm and corruption to good. For that reason we fight. If we falter now, we become like Flesh Harrower, 
unwilling enemies of the land. His stern words steadied the hafts, helped them to recover their resolve. However, before he or Troy could continue, Lord Veerment said harshly, What of the giants, Moram? What of the mission? How many other souls have already been lost to the despiser? Veerment had entered the circle across from Troy while Lord Colendwill had been speaking. The clouds on Troy's sight prevented him from seeing Veerment's expression, but when the Lord spoke, his voice was raw with bitterness. Answer, Moram, seer and oracle. Is Hiram dead also? Do any giants yet live? Troy felt Veerment's bitterness as an attack on the war ward, and he used words like whips to strike back. That isn't our concern. There's nothing we can do about it. We're stuck here. We're going to live or die here. It doesn't matter what's happening anywhere else. In his heart, he felt that he was betraying the giants, but he had no choice. All we can do is fight. Do you hear me? I hear you. Lord Veerment fell silent, as if he understood Troy's vehemence, and the war mark seized his chance to change the subject. All right, he said to the whole circle. At least now we know where we stand. Now I'll tell you what we're going to do about it. I have a plan, and with Lord Moram's help, I'm going to make it work. Bracing himself, he said bluntly, We're going to leave here. Flesh Harrower and his army probably won't arrive before midday tomorrow. By that time we will be long gone. The hafts gaped and blinked momentarily as they realized that he was ordering another march. Then several of them groaned aloud, and others recoiled as if he had struck them. Even Quan winced openly. Troy wanted to rush into explanations, but he contained himself until Armorine stepped forward and protested. Warmark, why will your former plan not suffice? The warriors have given their utmost to gain Doom's retreat as you commanded. Why must we leave? Because Fowl's army is too goddamn big. He did not want to shout, but for a while he could not stop himself. We've killed ten thousand Creech and a couple thousand Irviles, but the rest of that army is still out there. It's not three times bigger than we are, or even five times bigger. Flesh Harrower has twenty times our numbers. Twenty! I've seen them! With an effort, he caught hold of his pointless fury, jerked it down, my old plan was a good one while it lasted, he went on, but it just didn't take into account that Fowl's army might be so big. Now there's only two things that can happen. If that giant sends his army in here, just ten or twenty thousand at a time, the fight is going to last for weeks. But we've only got food for six days. We'll starve to death in here. And if he cuts through in one big blast... He'll get control of both ends of the retreat. Then we'll be trapped, and he can pick us off in his own good time. Now listen to me, he shouted again at the chagrined hats. I'm not going to let us get slaughtered as long as there is anything I can do to stop it. Anything at all. And there is one thing. Just one. I've got one more trick to play in this game, and I'm going to play it if I have to carry every one of you on my back. He glared around the circle, trying to fill his eyeless stare with authority, command, some kind of power that would make the war ward obey him. We will march at dawn tomorrow. Darkness shrouded his sight, but in the firelight he could see Quan's face. The old veteran was wrestling with himself, struggling to find the strength for this new demand. He closed his eyes briefly, and all the hafts waited for him, as if he had their courage in his hands, to uphold or deny as he saw fit. When he opened his eyes, his face seemed to sag with fatigue. 
but his voice was steady. War mark? Where will we march? West for now, Troy replied quickly, toward those old ruins. It won't be too bad. If we handle things right, we can go slower than we have so far. Will you tell us your plan? No. Troy was tempted to say, if I tell you, you'll be so horrified that you'll never follow me. But instead he added, I want to keep it to myself for a while. Get it ready. You will just have to trust me. He sounded to himself like a man falling out of a tree, shouting to the people above him as he fell that he would catch them. Warmark, Quan said stiffly. You know that I will always trust you. We all trust you. Yes, I know. Troy sighed. A sudden weariness flooded over him, and he could barely hear his own voice. He had already fallen a long way since he had left Revelstone. Miscalculations denuded his ideas of all their vitality, divested them of their power to save. He wondered how many other things he would have torn from him before this war was done. A long moment passed before he could find enough energy to say, There's one more thing. It's got to be done. We don't have any choice any more. We've got to leave some people behind. To try to hold the retreat. Make Flesh Harrower think we're still here. Slow him down. It'll be suicide, so we'll need volunteers. Two or three EO wards should be enough to make it work. Quan and Amarine took this stolidly. They were warriors, familiar with this kind of thinking. But before Troy could say anything else, Lord Veerment sprang into the circle. No, he barked, striking the ground with his staff. None will be left behind. I forbid it. Now Troy could see him clearly. His lean face looked as sharp as if it had been taken to a grindstone, and his eyes flamed keenly. Troy's throat felt abruptly bone dry. With difficulty he said, Lord Veerment, I'm sorry. I've got no choice. This march will kill the warriors unless they can go more slowly, so somebody has got to gain them time. Then I will do it. Veerman's tone was raw. I will hold Doom's retreat. It is a fit place for me. You can't, Troy objected, almost stammering. I can't let you. I need you with me. Unable to bear the force of Veerman's gaze, he turned to Lord Moram for help. Warmark Troy speaks truly. Moram said carefully, Death will not heal your grief, and you will be sorely needed in the days ahead. You must come with us. By the seven, Veerment cried, do you not hear me? I have said that I will remain. Shitra, my wife, is lost, she whom I loved with all my strength and yet did not love enough. Melancholian, do not speak to me of cannot or must. I will remain. No warriors will be left behind. Moram cut in. Lord Veerment, do you believe that you are able to defeat Flesh Harrower? But Veerment did not reply to that question. Heal Colindril, he said harshly. I will require you both, and call the blood guard from the plains. I start at dawn. Then he swung away and stopped out of the circle into the night. His departure left Troy bewildered and exhausted. He felt that the burden of the warboard already clung to his shoulders, bent his back so that he moved as if he were decrepit. His confused fatigue made him unfit for speeches, and he dismissed the hats abruptly. As he did so, he felt that he was fading them that they needed him to lead them, give them a strong figure around which they could rally. But he had no strength. 
He went to his blankets as if he hoped that some kind of fortitude would come to him in a dream. He sank at once into exhaustion and slept until sleep was no longer possible for him, until the sunrise above the mountains filled his brain with shapes and colors. When he arose, he discovered that he had slept through all the noise of the war ward as it broke camp and began its march. Already the last year ward were shambling away from Doom's retreat. They trudged as if they were maimed into the dry, heat-pale land of the southern wastes. Cursing dully at his weakness, he grabbed a few bites of the food Rule offered him, then hurried away toward the retreat. There he found Colindrill and Moram with a small group of blood guard. On either side of the defile's southern end, the lords had climbed as high as they could up the scree into the jumbled boulders piled against the canyon walls. From these positions they plied their staffs in a way that cast a haze across the air between them. Beyond them, in Doom's retreat itself, Lord Vermont clambered over the rocks and fallen shale. As he moved, he waved the fire of his staff like a torch against the darkness of the cliffs. Only Toman accompanied him. Troy looked closely at Colindrill. The wounded lord looked wan and tired, and sweat glistened on his pale forehead, but he stood on his own and wielded his staff firmly. Troy saluted him, then climbed the scree on the other side to join Lord Moram. When he reached Moram, he sat and watched while the haze moved and took shape. It appeared to revolve slowly, like a large wheel standing in the end of the retreat. Its circumference fitted just within the scree and stone, so that it effectively blocked the canyon floor, and it turned as if it were hanging on a pivot between Moram and Colindrill. Beyond it, Troy could see only the empty retreat, the raven-cleaned bones of the Irviles and wolves, and the lone lord struggling up and down the sides of the canyon with his flame bobbing like a will-o'-the-wisp. Soon, however, both Moram and Colindrill ended their exertions. They planted their staffs like anchors in the edges of the haze and leaned back to rest. Lord Moram greeted Troy tiredly. After a moment's hesitation, Troy nodded toward Veerment. What's he doing? Moram closed his eyes and said as if he were answering Troy, We have made a word of warning. While he was thinking of ways to rephrase his question, Troy asked, What does it do? It seals Doom's retreat. How will it work? I can see it. It won't take Flesh Harrower by surprise. Your sight is keen in some ways. I cannot see the word. Awkwardly, Troy asked, Is there anyone still out there besides Veerment? No. All the warriors have left. The scouts have been recalled. None may pass this way now without encountering the word. So he's committed himself. He's stuck out there. Yes. Moram bit at the word angrily. Troy returned to his first question. What does he hope to gain? It's suicide. Moram opened his eyes, and Troy felt the force of the Lord's gaze. We will gain time, Moram said. You spoke of a need for time. Then he sighed and looked away down the canyon. And Lord Veerment Sheetramate will gain an end to anguish. Numbly, Troy watched Veerment. The hawkish Lord did not look like a man in search of relief. He threw himself up and down in the tumbled edges of the defile, kicked his way through the shale and the fleshless bones and the watchful silence of the ravens, as if he were possessed. And he was exhausting himself. Already his stride was unsteady, and he had fallen several times. Yet he had covered less than a third of Doom's retreat with the invisible skein of his fire. But some power... Some relentless coercion of will kept him going. 
Throughout the morning he continued his weird progress along the canyon, stopping only at rare moments to accept water and treasure berries from Toman. By mid-morning he was half done. Now, however, he could no longer keep up his pace. He had to lean on Toman as he stumbled up into the rocks and down again, and his staff's fire guttered and smoked. A few ravens dropped out of their high nests and sailed around him as if to see how much longer he would endure. But he went on. The force which blazed in him did not waver. In the end, he was compelled to leave the last yards of the retreat unwoven. Toman pointed out to him the rising dust of Flesh Harrower's approach. Shortly, the leading wave of yellow wolves came into view. Lord Veerment dropped his task, straightened his shoulders. He gave Toman one final order. Then he walked out of Doom's retreat to meet the army of the Despiser. The wide front of wolves rushed toward him, suddenly eager for prey. But at the last they hesitated, halted. The unflinching challenge of his stance threw them into confusion. Though they snapped and snarled fiercely, they did not attack. They encircled the two men and ran howling around them while the rest of the army made its approach. Flesh Harrower's army marched out of the northeast until the dark line of it filled the horizon and the tramping of its myriad feet shook the ground. The despiser's horde seemed to cover the whole plains, and their tremendous numbers dwarfed Lord Veerment like an ocean. When the giant came forward, kicked his way through the wolves to confront the lord and the blood guard, his size alone made the two men appear puny and insignificant. But when the giant was within ten yards of him, Veerment made a forbidding gesture. Come no closer, Moksha Raver, he shouted hoarsely. I know you, Jehanum Flesh Harrower. Go back, back to the evil which made you. I deny you passage. I, Veerment Sheetramate, Lord of the Council of Revelstone, you may not pass here. Flesh Harrower stopped. Ah, a lord, he said, peering down at Veerment as if the lord were too tiny to be seen easily. I am amazed. His face was twisted, and his leer gave him an expression of acute pain, as if his flesh could not disguise the hurt of the rabid presence within it. But his voice seemed to suck and cling in the air like quicksand, it held only derision and lust as he continued. Have you come to welcome me to the slaughter of your army? But of course you know it is too small to be called an army. I have fought and followed you from Andelaine, but do not think that you have outwitted me. I know you seek to meet me in Doom's retreat because your army is too weak to fight elsewhere. Perhaps you have come to surrender, to join me. You speak like a fool, Veerment barked. No friend of the land will ever surrender to you or join you. Admit the truth and go. Go, I say. Melancurion of Arthur. Abruptly he caught his staff in both hands and raised it over his head. Durach minus mil cabal. With all the names of the earth power I command you, there is no victory for the despiser here. As Veerment shouted his words, the raver flinched. To defend himself, he thrust his hand into his leather jerkin, snatched out a smooth green stone that filled his fist. A lambent emerald flame played in its depths, and it steamed like boiling ice. He clenched it made it steam more viciously, and exclaimed, Veerment, Shitra, mate! For a hundred leagues I have driven two lords before me like ants. Why do you believe that you can resist me now? Because you have killed Shitra, my wife, the lord cried in rage. Because I have been unworthy of her all my life. 
because I do not fear you, Raver. I am free of all restraint. No fear or love limits my strength. I match you hate for hate, Moksha Raver. Melancholia Nabava. His staff whirled about his head, and a livid blue bolt of power sprang from the wood at Flesh Harrower. Simultaneously, Toman rushed forward with his fingers crooked like claws, threw himself at the giant's throat. Flesh Harrower met the attack easily, disdainfully. He caught Veerman's bolt on his stone and held it burning there like a censer. Almost at once the blue flame turned deep, dazzling green, blazed up higher, and with his other hand the giant dealt Toman a blow which sent him sprawling behind Veerment. Then Flesh Harrower flung the fire back. The Lord's fury never winced. Swinging his staff, he jabbed its metal end like a lance into the gout of power. Savage cracking noises came from the wood as it bucked and bent. But the staff held. Veerment shouted mighty words over the flame, compelled it to his will again. Slowly the green burned blue on his staff. When he had mastered it, he hurled it again at the raver. Flesh Harrower began to laugh. Veerment's attack, multiplied by some of the giant's own power, caught on the stone as if the green rock were its wick. There it grew hungrily until the column of emerald fire reached high into the air. Laughing, the raver shot this fire toward Veerment. It splintered his staff. Flash burned the pieces to cinders, deluged him. But then the flame bent itself to his form, gripped him, clung and crawled all over him like a corona. His arms dropped, his head fell forward until his chin touched his chest. His eyes closed. He hung in the fire as if he had been nailed there. Triumphantly, Flesh Harrower cried, now, vehement Sheetra mate, where is your defiance now? For a moment his derision scaled upward, echoed off the cliffs. Then he went on. Defeated, I see. But hearken to me, puppet. It may be that I will let you live. Of course, to gain life you must change your allegiance. Repeat these words. I worship Lord Foul, the despiser. He is the one word of truth. Lord Veerman's lips remained clamped shut. Within the paralyzing fire, his cheek muscles bulged as he set his jaws. Speak it! Flesh Harrower roared. With a jerk of the stone, he tightened the corona around Veerman. A gasp of agony tore the Lord's lips apart. He began to speak. I worship. He went no further. Behind him, Toman jumped up to carry out his last duty. With one kick, the blood guard broke Lord Veerment's back. Instantly, the Lord fell dead. Toman's face was taut with murder as he sprang again at Flesh Harrower's throat. This time the Blood Guard's attack was so swift and ruthless that it broke past the Raver's defenses. He caught Flesh Harrower, dug his fingers into the giant's neck. For a moment the giant could not tear him away. He ground his fingers into that thick throat with such passion that Flesh Harrower could not break his hold. But then the Raver brought the stone to his aid. With one blast, he burned Toman's bones to ash within him. The blood guard collapsed in a heap of structureless flesh. Then for a time, Flesh Harrower seemed to go mad. Roaring like a cataclysm, he jumped and stamped on Toman's form until the blood guard's bloody remains were crushed into the grass. And after that... He sent the vast hordes of his wolves howling into the gullet of Doom's retreat. Driven by his fury, they ran blindly down the canyon and hurtled into the word of warning. The first wolf to touch the word triggered it. 
In that instant, the piled rock within the walls seemed to blow apart. The power which Viermet had placed there threw down the sloped sides of the defile. A deadly rain of boulders and shale fell into the canyon, crushing thousands of wolves so swiftly that the pack had time for only one yowl of terror. When the dust blew clear, Flesh Harrower could see that the retreat was now blocked, crowded with crumbling rock and scree. An army might spend days struggling through the rubble. The setback appeared to calm him. The hunger for vengeance did not leave his eyes, but his voice was steady as he shouted his commands. He called forward the griffins. Flying heavily with their viles on their backs, they went into the retreat to fight Veerman's word. And behind them, Flesh Harrower sent his rock-wise cave whites to clear the way for the rest of the army. Compelled by his power, the creatures worked with headlong desperation. Many of the griffins were destroyed because they flew mindlessly against the word. Scores of cave whites killed each other in their frenzy to clear the debris from the canyon floor. But lore-wise Irviles finally tore down the word of warning, and the cave whites accomplished prodigious feats. Given sufficient time and numbers, they had the strength and skill to move mountains. Now they heaved and tore at the rubble. They worked through the night, and by dawn they had cleared a path ten yards wide down the center of the retreat. Holding the stone high, Flesh Harrower led his army through the canyon. At the south end of the retreat, he found the warboard gone. The last of his enemies, a small band of riders including two lords, were galloping away out of reach. He howled imprecations after them, vowing that he would pursue them to the death. But then his far-seeing giantish eyes made out the warboard, seven or eight leagues beyond the riders. He marked the direction of their march, saw where they were headed, and he began to laugh again. Peals of sarcasm and triumph echoed off the blank cliffs of Doom's retreat. The war ward marched toward Garroting Deep. Chapter 19 The Ruins of the Southern Wastes By the time Warmark Troy rode away from Doom's retreat with the Lords Moram and Colandril and a group of blood guard, he had put aside his enervation, his half-conscious yearning to hide his head. Gone, too, was the sense of horror which had paralyzed him when Lord Veerment died. He had pushed these things down during the dark night, while Moram and Colandril fought to maintain the word of warning. Now he felt strangely cauterized. He was the war mark, and he had returned to his work. He was thinking, measuring distances, gauging relative speeds, forecasting the war ward's attrition rate. He was in command. He could see his army's need for leadership as clearly as if it were in some way atrocious. Ahead of him, the war ward had swung slightly south to avoid the immediate foothills of the mountains, and across this easier ground it moved at a pace which would cover no more than seven leagues a day. But still the conditions of the march were horrendous. His army was traveling into the dry half-desert of the southern wastes, no vestige or hint of autumn ameliorated the arid breeze which blew northward off the parched, lifeless, gray desert. Most of the grass had already failed, and the few rills and rivulets which ran down out of the mountains evaporated before they reached five leagues into the wastes. And even south of the foothills the terrain was difficult, eroded and rasped and cut by long ages of sterile wind into jagged hills, gullies, arroyos. The result was a stark, heat-pale land, possessed by a weird and unfriendly beauty. The war ward had to march over packed ground that felt as hard and hostile as rock underfoot, and yet sent up thick dust, as if the soil were nothing but powder. Within three leagues of the retreat, Troy and his companions found the first dead warrior. 
the wood helven and corpse lay contorted on the ground like a torture victim. Exhaustion blackened its lips and tongue, and its staring eyes were full of dust. Troy had a mad impulse to stop and bury the warrior, but he was sure of his calculations. In this acrid heat, the losses of the war ward would probably double every day. None of the living could afford the time or strength to care for the dead. By the time the war mark caught up with his army, he had counted ten more fallen warriors. Numbers thronged in his brain. Eleven dead the first day, twenty-two the second, forty-four the third. Six hundred and ninety-three human beings killed by the cruel demands of the march before he reached his destination. And God alone knew how many more. He found himself wondering if he would ever be able to sleep again. But he forced himself to pay attention as Quan and Amarine reported on their efforts to keep the warriors alive. Food was rationed. All water jugs were refilled at every stream, however small. Every haft and war haft moved on foot, so that their horses could carry the weakest men and women. Quan's remaining riders also walked, and their damaged mounts bore packs and collapsed warriors. All scouting and water gathering were done by the blood guard, and every warrior who could go no farther was supplied with food and ordered to seek safety in the mountains. There was nothing else the commanders could do. All this filled Troy with pain. But then Quan described to him how very few warriors chose to leave the march and hide in the hills. That news steadied Troy. He felt it was both terrible and wonderful that so many men and women were willing to follow him to the utter end of his ideas. He mustered his confidence to answer Quan's and Amarine's inevitable questions. Quan went bluntly to the immediate problem. Does Flesh Harrower pursue us? Yes, Troy replied. Lord Veerment gained us about a day, but that giant is coming after us now. He's coming fast. Quan did not need to ask what had happened to Lord Veerment. Instead, he said, Flesh Harrower will move swiftly. When will he overtake us? Sometime tomorrow afternoon. Tomorrow evening at the latest. Then we are lost, said Amarine, and her voice shook. We can march no faster. The warriors are too weary to turn and fight. Warmark, she implored. Take this matter from me. Give the first half's place to another. I cannot bear. I cannot give these commands. He tried to comfort her with his confidence. Don't worry. We're not beaten yet. But to himself he sounded more hysterical than confident. He had a sudden desire to scream. We won't have to march any faster than this. We're just going to turn south a fraction more, so that we'll reach that old ruined city. Doriandor Koroshev, Moron calls it. We should get there before noon tomorrow. He felt that he was speaking too quickly. He forced himself to slow down while he explained his intentions. Then he was relieved to see dour approval in the faces of his officers. First half Armorine took a deep, shuddering breath as she caught hold of her courage again, and Quan's eyes glinted with bloody promises for the enemy. Shortly he asked, Who will command the Eoward which must remain? Permit me, Armorine said. I am at the end of my strength for this marching. I wish to fight. The hilt mark opened his mouth to answer her, but Troy stopped them both with a gesture. For a moment he juggled burdens mentally, seeking a point of balance. Then he said to Quan, The lords and I will stay behind with first half to Amorine. We'll need eight Eoward of volunteers, and every horse that can still stand. The blood guard will probably stay with us. If we handle it right, most of us will survive. Quan frowned at the decision, but his acceptance was as candid as his dislike. To Amarine he said, We must find those who are willing and prepare them today. 
so that tomorrow no time will be lost. In answer, the first half saluted both Quan and Troy, then rode away among the war ward. She carried herself straighter than she had for several days, and her alacrity demonstrated to Troy that he had made the correct choice. He nodded after her, sardonically congratulating himself for having done something right. But Quan still had questions. Shortly he said, I ask your pardon, Warmark, but we have been friends, and I must speak of this. Will you not explain to me why we march now? If Doom's retreat is not the battleground you desire, perhaps Doriand or Koroshev will serve. Why must this terrible march continue? No, I'm not going to explain. Not yet. Troy kept his final plan to himself, as if by silence and secrecy he could contain its terrors. And Doriand or Koroshev won't serve. We could fight there for a day or two, but after that, Flesh Harrower would surround us and just squeeze. We've got to do better than that. The Hiltmark nodded morosely. Troy's refusal saddened him like an expression of distrust. But he managed a wry smile as he said, Warmark, is there no end to your plans? Yes. Troy sighed. Yes, there is. And we're going to get there. After that, Moram is going to have to save us. He promised. Because he could not bear to face Quan with his inadequacies, he turned away. Clapping Merrill with his heels, he went in search of the lords. He wanted to explain his intentions for Dorian or Koroshev and to find out what additional help Moram and Colandrill could give the war ward. During the rest of that day and the next morning, he received regular reports from the Blood Guard on Flesh Harrower's progress. The giant raver's army was large and unwieldy. It had covered only nine leagues during the day after it traversed Doom's retreat, but it did not halt during the dark night and took only one short rest before dawn. Troy judged that the giant would reach Dorian or Koroshev by mid-afternoon. That knowledge made him ache to drive the war ward faster, but he could not. Too many warriors left the army or died that night and the next morning. To his dismay, the attrition tripled. A litany of numbers ran through his brain. Eleven, thirty-three, ninety-nine... At that rate, the march itself would claim 4,004 victims by the end of six days. And lives would be lost in Dorian or Koroshev. He needed complex equations to measure the plight of his army. He did not try to hurry it. As a result, the warriors were only a league ahead of Flesh Harrower when they started up the long slope toward the ruins of Dorian or Koroshev. The ancient city sat atop a high hill under the perpetual frown of the mountains, and the hill itself crested a south-running ridge. The ruins were elevated on a line that separated, hid from each other, the east and west sides of the southern wastes. In past ages, when the city lived and thrived, it had commanded perfectly the northern edge of that region, and now the low, massive remains of fortifications testified that the inhabitants of the city had known the value of their position. According to the legends which had been preserved in Kevin's lore, these people had been warlike. They had needed their strategic location. Lord Colandrill translated the name as Master Place, or Desolation of Enemies. The legend said that for centuries Dorian or Koroshev had been the capital of the nation which gave birth to Beric Halfhand. That was the age of the one forest's dominion in the land. Then there were no wastes south of the mountains. The region was green and populous. But in time it became too populous. Groups of people from this southern country slowly moved up into the land and began to attack the forest. 
At first they only wanted timber for the civilization of Doriander Koroshev. Then they wanted fields for crops. Then they wanted homes. With the unconscious aid of other immigrants from the north, they eventually accomplished the maiming of the one forest. But that injury had many ramifications. On the one hand, the felling of the trees unbound the interdict which the Colossus of the Fall had held over the lower land. The ravers were unleashed. A release which led with deft inevitability to the destruction of Doriander Koroshev's monarchy in the Great War of Beric Halfhand. And on the other hand, the loss of perhaps a hundred thousand square leagues of forest altered the natural balances of the earth. Every falling tree hammered home an ineluctable doom for the master place. As the trees died, the southern lands lost the watershed which had preserved them from the grey desert. Centuries after the ravage of the one forest became irreversible, these lands turned to dry ruin. But the city had been deserted since the time of Beric, the first lord. Now, after millennia of wind and dust, nothing remained of the master place except the standing shards of its walls and buildings, a kind of ground map formed by the bloodless stumps of its grandeur. Warmark Troy could have hidden his whole army in its labyrinthian spaces and ways. Behind fragmentary walls that reached meaninglessly into the sky, the warriors could have fought guerrilla war for days against an army of comparable size. Troy trusted that Flesh Harrower knew this. His plans relied heavily on his ability to convince the giant that the war ward chose to make its last stand in Doriander Koroshev, rather than under the certain death of Garroting Deep. He marched his army straight up the long hillside and into the toothless gate of the master place. Then he took the warriors through the city and out its western side, where they were hidden from Flesh Harrower by the ridge on which the city stood. There he gave Quan all the instructions and encouragement he could. Then he saluted the hiltmark and watched as the main body of the war ward marched away down the slope. When it was gone, he and his volunteers returned to the city with the two lords, first half Tamarine, all the blood guard, and every horse still strong enough to bear a rider. Within the ruined walls he addressed the eight eel ward that had offered to buy the war ward's escape from Doriando Koroshev. He had a taut, dry feeling in his throat as he began. You're all volunteers, so I'm not going to apologize for what we're doing but I want to be sure you know why we're doing it. I have two main reasons. First, we're going to give the rest of the warriors a chance to put some distance between them and Flesh Harrower. Second, we're going to help squeeze out a victory in this war. I'm preparing a little surprise for Fowl's army, and we're going to help make it work. Parts of that army move faster than others, but if they get too spread out, they won't all fall into my trap. So we're going to pull them together here. He paused to look over the warriors. They stood squarely before him with expressions colored by every hue of grimness and fatigue and determination, and their very bones seemed to radiate mortality. At the sight, he began to understand Moram's statement that they deserved to know the truth. They were serving his commands with their souls. Roughly he went on, But there's one more thing. Flesh Harrower may be planning a surprise or two for us. Many of you were with Hiltmark Quan during that storm. You know what I'm talking about. That giant has power, and he intends to use it. We're going to give him a chance. We're going to be a target so that whatever he does will hit us instead of the rest of the war ward. I think we can survive it, if we do things right. But it's not going to be easy. Abruptly he turned to Armorine and ordered her to deploy the Eoward in strategic positions throughout the east side of the master place. 
Make sure of your lines of retreat. I don't want people getting lost in this maze when it's time for us to pull out. Then he spoke to the blood guard, asked them to scout beyond the city along the ridge. I've got to know right away if Flesh Harrower tries to surround us. Carol nodded, and a few of the blood guard rode away. First half our marine took her eoward back across Doriander Koroshev. They left all their horses, including the Ranahin, at the west gate under the care of several blood guard. Accompanied by the rest of the blood guard, Troy and the two lords made their way on foot to the east wall. While they passed through the ruins, Lord Moram asked, Warmark, do you believe that Flesh Harrower will not attempt to surround us? Why would he do otherwise? Instinct, Troy replied curtly. I think you'll be very careful to let us escape on the west side. You heard him laugh back at Doom's retreat when he saw where we were going. I think that what he really wants is to trap us against Garroting Deep. He's a raver. He probably thinks the idea of using that forest against us is hilarious. Then he was grateful that Moram refrained from asking him what his own ideas about Garroting Deep were. He did not want to think about that. Instead, he tried to concentrate on the layout of the city so that he could find his way through it at night if necessary. But his heart was not in the task. Too many other anxieties occupied him. When he reached the east wall and climbed up on some rubble to peer over it, he saw Flesh Harrower's army. It approached like a great discoloration, a dark bruise on the pale ground of the wastes. Its front stretched away both north and south of the ruins. It was less than a league away. And it was immense beyond comprehension. Troy could not imagine how Lord Fowl had been able to create such an army. It came forward until it reached the foot of the hill upon which Doriandor Koryshev stood. As he watched, Troy gripped the handle of his sword as if it were the only thing that kept him from panic. Several times he reached up to adjust the sunglasses he no longer possessed. The movement was like an involuntary prayer or appeal. But neither of the lords observed him. Their faces were set toward Flesh Harrower. Troy almost shouted with elation when the giant raver stopped his army at the foot of the hill. The halt ran through his hordes like a shock, as if the force which drove them had struck a wall. The wolves smelled prey. They sent up a howl of frustration at the halt. Irviles barked furiously. Warped humans groaned, and cave whites hopped hungrily from foot to foot. But Flesh Harrower's command mastered them all. They spread out until they formed a ready arc around the entire eastern side of the hill, then set themselves to wait. When he was satisfied with the position of his army, the raver took a few steps up the hill, placed his fists on his hips, and shouted sardonically, Lords! Warriors! I know you hear me. Listen to my words. Surrender! You cannot escape. You are ensnared between the desert and the deep. I can eradicate you from the earth with only a tenth of my strength. Surrender! If you join me, I may be merciful. At the word merciful, a yammer of protest and hunger went up from his army. He waited for the outcry to pass before he continued. If not, I will destroy you. I will burn and blast your homes. I will make rebel wood a charnel and use rebel stone for an awful ground. I will wreck and ravage the land until time itself breaks. Hear me in despair. Surrender or die. At this, an irresistible impulse caught hold of the war mark. Frustration and rage boiled up in him. Without warning, he leaped onto the wall. He braced his feet to steady himself and raised his fists defiantly. Flesh, however! he shouted. 
Vermin. I am Warmark Heil Troy. I command here. I spit in your face, Raver. You're only a slave, and your master is only a slave. He's a slave to hunger, and he gnaws his worthlessness like an old bone. Go back. Leave the land. We're free people. Despair has no power over us. But I'll teach you despair if you dare to fight me. Flesh Harbor snapped an order. A dozen bowstrings thrummed. Shafts flew past Troy's head as Rule snatched him down from the wall. Troy stumbled as he landed, but Rule upheld him. When the warmark regained his balance, Moram said, You took a grave risk. What have you gained? I've made him mad, Troy replied unsteadily. This has got to be done right, and I'm going to do it. The madder he gets, the better off we are. Are you so certain of what he will do? Yes. Troy felt an odd confidence, a conviction that he would not be proved wrong until the end. He's already doing it. He stopped. If he's mad enough, he'll attack us first himself. His army will stay stopped. That's what we want. Then I believe that you have succeeded, Lord Collendrill inserted quietly. He was gazing over the wall as he spoke. Moram and Troy joined him and saw what he meant. Flesh Harrower had retreated until there was a flat place of ground between himself and the hill. Around him the army shifted. Several thousand Irviles moved to form wedges with their lore masters poised on both sides of the space. There they waited while the giant raver marked out a wide circle in the dirt using the tip of one of the lore master's staves. Then Flesh Harrower ordered all but the Irviles away from the circle. When the space was cleared, the lore masters began their work. Chanting in arrhythmic unison like a mesmerized chorus of dogs, the Irviles bent their might forward into the hands of their lore masters. The lore masters thrust the points of their staves into the rim of Flesh Harrower's circle and began to rock the iron slowly back and forth. A low buzzing noise became audible. The Irviles were singing in their own Roynish tongue, and their song made the flat, hard ground vibrate. Slowly the buzz scaled upward, as if a swarm of huge, mad bees were imprisoned in the dirt and the earth in the circle began to pulse visibly. A change, like an increase of heat, came over the rock and soil. Hot red gleams played through the circle erratically, and its surface seethed. The buzz became fiercer, sharper. The process was slow, but its horrible fascination made it seem swift to the onlookers. As daylight started to fall out of the stricken sky, the buzz replaced it like a cry of pain from the ground itself. The raver's circle throbbed and boiled as if the dirt within it were molten. The sound tormented Troy. It clawed at his ears, crawled like lice over his flesh. Sweat slicked his eyeless brows. For a time he feared that he would be compelled to scream. But at last the cry scaled past the range of his senses. He was able to turn away, rest briefly. When he looked back toward the circle, he found that the Irviles had withdrawn from it. Flesh Harrower stood there alone. A demonic look clenched his face as he stared into the hot red boiling soil. In his hands he held one of the lore masters. It gibbered fearfully, clung to its stave, but it could not break his grip. Laughing, Flesh Harrower lifted the lore master over his head and hurled it into the circle. As it hit the ground, its scream died in a flash of fire. Only its stave remained, slowly melting on the surface. As the sun set, Flesh Harrower began using his fragment of the stone to reshape the molten iron, forge it into something new. Softly, as if he feared that the giant raver might hear him, 
Troy asked the lords, What's this for? What's he doing? He makes a tool, Moram whispered, some means to increase or concentrate his power. The implications of that gave Troy a feeling of grim gratification. His strategy was justified, at least to the extent that the main body of the war ward would be spared this particular attack. But he knew that such justification was not enough. His final play lay like a dead weight in his stomach. He expected to lose command of the war ward as soon as he revealed it. It would appall the warriors so much that they would rebel. After all his promises of victory, he felt like a false prophet. Yet his plan was the war ward's only hope, the land's only hope. He prayed that Lord Moram would be equal to it. With the sunset, his sight failed. He was forced to rely on Moram to report the raver's progress. In the darkness he felt trapped, bereft of command. All that he could see was the amorphous, dull glow of the liquid earth. Occasionally he made out flares and flashes of lurid green across the red, but they meant nothing to him. His only consolation lay in the fact that Flesh Harrower's preparations were consuming time. All along the wall on both sides of him, First Half Darmarine's Eoward kept watch over the raver's labors. No one slept. The poised threat of Flesh Harrower's army transfixed everyone. Moonrise did not ease the blackness. The dark of the moon was only three nights away, but the raver's forge work was bright enough to pale the stars. During the whole long watch, Flesh Harrower never left his molten circle. Sometime after midnight, he retrieved his newly made scepter and cooled it by waving it in a shower of sparks over his head. Then he affixed his fragment of the stone to its end. But when that was done, he remained by the circle. As night waned toward day, he gestured and sang over the molten stone, weaving incantations out of its hot power. It lit his movements luridly, and the stone flashed across it at intervals, giving green glimpses of his malice. But this was indistinct to Troy. He clung to his hope. In the darkness his calculations were the only reality left to him, and he recited them like counters against the night. When the first slit of dawn touched him from the east, he felt a kind of elation. Softly he asked for Armorine. Warmark. She was right beside him. Armorine, listen. That monster has made his mistake. He's wasted too much time. Now we're going to make him pay for it. Get the warriors out of here. Send them after the war ward. Whatever happens, that giant won't get as many of us as he thinks. Just keep one warrior for every good horse we have. Perhaps all should depart now, she replied, before the raver attacks. Troy grinned at the idea. He could imagine Flesh Harrower's fury if the giant's attack found Dorian or Korishev empty. But he knew that he had not yet gained enough time. He answered, I want to squeeze another half day out of him. With the blood guard and a couple hundred warriors, we'll be able to do it. Now get going. Yes, Warmark. She left his side at once, and soon he could hear most of the warriors withdrawing. He gripped the wall again and stared away into the sunrise, waiting for sight. Shortly, he became aware that the dry breeze out of the south was stiffening, then the haze faded from his mind. First he became able to see the ruined wall, then the hillside. Finally he caught sight of the waiting army. It had not moved during the night. It did not need to move. Flesh Harrower still stood beside his circle. The fire in the ground had died, but before it failed, he had used it to wrap himself in a shimmering, translucent cocoon of power. Within the power he was as erect as an icon. 
He held his scepter rigidly above his head. He did not move. He made no sound. But when the sunlight touched him, the wind leaped suddenly into a hard blow like a violent exhalation through the teeth of the desert, and it increased in ragged gusts like the leading edge of a sirocco. Then a low cry from one of the warriors pulled Troy's attention away from Flesh Harrower. Turning his head, he looked down the throat of the mounting gale. From the southeast, where the southern range met the grey desert, a tornado came rushing toward Dorian or Koryshev. Its undulating shaft ploughed straight across the wastes. It conveyed such an impression of might that several moments passed before Troy realized it was not the kind of whirlwind he understood. It brought no rain or clouds with it. It was as dry as the desert, and it carried no dust or sand. It was as clean as empty air. It should not have been visible at all, but its sheer force made it palpable to Troy's sight. He could feel it coming. It was so vivid to him that at first he could not grasp the fact that the tornado was not moving with the wind. The gale blew straight out of the south, tearing dust savagely from the ground as it came, and the tornado cut diagonally across it, ignored the wind to howl straight toward Dorian or Koroshev. Troy stared at it. Dust clogged his mouth but he did not know this until he tried to shout something. Then, coughing convulsively, he wrenched himself away from the sight. At once the Sirocco hit him. When he stopped looking at the tornado, the force of the wind sent him reeling. Ruel caught him. He pivoted around the blood guard and threw himself toward Lord Moram. When he reached Moram, he shouted, What is it? Creator, preserve us, Moram replied. The yowling wind whipped his voice from his lips, and Troy barely heard him. It is a vortex of trepidation. Troy tried to thrust his words past the wind to Moram's ears. What will it do? Shouting squarely into Troy's face, Moram answered, It will make us afraid. The next moment he pulled at Troy's arm and pointed upward toward the top of the tornado. There a score of dark creatures flew, riding the upper reaches of the vortex. The tornado had already covered more than half the distance to Dorian or Koroshev, and Troy saw the creatures vividly. They were birds as large as Kreesh. They had clenched satanic faces like bats, wide eagle wings and massive barbed claws. As they flew, they called to each other, showing double rows of hooked teeth. Their wings beat with lust. They were the most fearsome creatures Troy had ever seen. As he stared, he tried to rally himself against them, judge their speed, calculate the time left before their arrival, plan a defense. But they staggered his mind. He could not comprehend an existence which permitted them. He struggled to move, regain his balance enough to tell himself that he was already tasting the vortex of trepidation. But he was paralyzed. Voices shouted around him. He had a vague impression that Flesh Harrower's hordes greeted the vortex with glee. Or were they afraid of it too? He could not tell. Then Ruel grabbed his arm, snatched him away from the wall, shouted into his ear, Warmark, come, we must make a defense. Troy could not remember ever having heard a bloodguard shout before. But even now Rule's voice did not sound like panic. Troy felt that there was something terrible in such immunity. He tried to look around him, but the wind lashed so much dust across the ruins that all details were lost. Both lords were gone. Warriors ran in all directions, stumbling against the wind. Bloodguard bobbed in and out of view like ghouls. Rule shouted at him again. We must save the horses. They will go mad with fear. For one lorn moment, Troy wished High Lord Elena were with him, so that he could tell her this was not his fault. 
then abruptly he realized that he had made another mistake. If he were killed, no one would know how to save the war ward. His final plan would die with him, and every man and woman of his army would be butchered as a result. The realization seemed to push him over an edge. He plunged to his knees. The Sirocco and the dust were strangling him. Rule shouted, Warmark! Corruption attacks! At the word corruption, a complete lucidity came over Troy. Fear filled all his thoughts with crystalline incisiveness. At once he perceived that the blood guard was trying to undo him. Rule's impenetrable fidelity was a deliberate assault upon his fitness for command. The understanding made him real, but he reacted lucidly, adroitly. He took one last look around him, saw one or two figures still surging back and forth through the livid anguish of the dust. Rule was moving to capture him. Overhead the dark birds dropped toward the ruins. Troy picked up a rock and climbed to his feet. When Rule touched him, he suddenly gestured away behind the blood guard. Rule turned to look. Troy hit him on the back of the skull with a rock. Then the war mark ran. He could not make progress against the wind, so he worked across it. The walls of buildings loomed out of the dust at him. He started toward a door. Without warning, he stumbled into first half Darmarine. She caught at him, buffeted him with cries like fear. But she, too, was someone faithful, someone who threatened him. He lunged at her with his shoulder, sent her sprawling. Immediately he dodged into the maze of the master place. He fell several times as the wind sprang at him through unexpected gaps in the walls, but he forced himself ahead. The clarity of his terror was complete. He knew what he had to do. After a swift chaotic battle, he found what he needed. With a rush, he lurched out into the center of a large open space the remains of one of Dorian or Koryshev's meeting halls. In this unsheltered expanse, the force of the wind belabored him venomously. He welcomed it. He felt a paradoxical glee of fear. His own terror delighted him. He stood like an exalted fanatic in the open space and looked up to see how long he would have to wait. When he glanced behind him, his heart leaped. One of the birds glided effortlessly toward him, as if it were in total command of the wind. It had a clear approach to him. The ease of its movement thrilled him, and he poised himself to jump into its jaws. But as it neared him, he saw that it carried Rule's crumpled body in its mighty talons. He could see Rule's flat, dispassionate features. The blood guard looked as if he had been betrayed. A convulsion shook Troy. As the bird swooped toward him, he remembered who he was. The strength of terror galvanized his muscles. He snatched out his sword and struck. His blow split the bird's skull. Its weight bowled him over. Green blood spewed from it over his head and shoulders. The hot blood burned him like a corrosive, and it smelled so thickly of atter that it asphyxiated him. With a choked cry, he clawed at his forehead, trying to tear the pain away. But the acid fire consumed his headband, burned through his skull into his brain. He lost consciousness. He awoke to silence and the darkness of night. After a long lapse of time, like an interminable scream, he raised his head. The wind had piled dust over him, and his movement disturbed it. It filled his throat and mouth and lungs. But he bit back a spasm of coughing and listened to the darkness. All around him, Dorian Dorkorishev was as still as a cairn. The wind and the vortex were gone leaving only midnight dust and death to mark their path. Silence lay over the ruins like a bane. 
Then he had to cough. Gasping, retching, he pushed himself to his knees. He sounded explosively loud to himself. He tried to control the violence of his coughing, but he was helpless until the spasm passed. As it released him, he realized that he was still clutching his sword. Instinctively, he tightened his grip on it. He cursed his night blindness, then told himself that the darkness was his only hope. His face throbbed painfully, but he ignored it. He kept himself still while he thought. This long after the vortex, he reasoned, all his allies were either dead or gone. If the vortex and the birds had not killed them, they had been swept from the ruins by Flesh Harrower's army, so they could not help him. He did not know how much of that army had stayed behind in the master place, and he could not see. He was vulnerable until daylight. Only the darkness protected him. He could not defend himself. His first reaction was to remain where he was, and pray that he was not discovered. But he recognized the futility of that plan. At best it would only postpone his death. When dawn came he would still be alone against an unknown number of enemies. No, his one chance was to sneak out of the city now and lose himself in the wastes. There he might find a gully or hole in which to hide. That escape was possible barely possible, because he had one advantage. None of Flesh Harrower's creatures except the Irviles could move through the ruins at night as well as he, and the Raver would not have left Irviles behind. They were too valuable. If Troy could remember his former skills, his sense of ambience, his memory for terrain, he would be able to navigate the city. He would have to rely on his hearing to warn him of enemies. He began by sliding his sword quietly into its scabbard. Then he started groping his way over the hot sand. He needed to verify where he was, and knew only one way to do it. Nearby his hands found a patch of ground that felt burnt. The dirt, which stuck to his fingers, reeked of atter, and in the patch he located Rule's twisted body. His sense of touch told him that Rule was badly charred. The dark bird must have caught fire when it died, and burned away, leaving the blood guard's corpse behind. The touch of that place nauseated him, and he backed away from it. He was sweating heavily. Sweat stung his burns. The night was hot. Sunset had brought no relief to the ruins. Folding his arms over his stomach, he climbed to his feet. Standing unsteadily in the open, he tried to clear his mind of Rule and the bird. He needed to remember how to deal with blindness, how to orient himself in the ruins. But he could not determine which way he had come into this open place. Waving his arms before him, he went in search of a wall. His feet distrusted the ground. He could not put them down securely, and he moved awkwardly. His sense of balance had deserted him. His face felt raw, and sweat seared his eye sockets. But he clenched his concentration and measured the distance. In twenty yards he reached a wall. He touched it at an angle, promptly squared himself to it, then moved along it. He needed a gap which would permit him to touch both sides of the wall. Any discrepancy in temperature between the sides would tell him his directions. After twenty more yards he arrived in a corner. Turning at right angles he followed this new wall. He kept himself parallel to it by brushing the stone with his fingers. Shortly he stumbled into some rubble and found an entryway. The wall here was thick but he could touch its opposite sides without stretching his arms. Both sides felt very warm, but he thought he discerned a slightly higher temperature on the side facing back into the open space. That direction was west, he reasoned. The afternoon sun would have heated the west side of a wall. 
Now he had to decide which way to go. If he went east, he would be less likely to meet enemies. Since they had not already found him, they might be past him, and their search would move from east to west after the war ward. But if any chance of help from his friends or Merrill remained, it would be on the west side. The dilemma seemed to have no solution. He found himself shaking his head and moaning through his teeth. At once he stuffed his throat with silence. He decided to move west toward Merrill. The added risk was preferable to a safe escape eastward, an escape which would leave him alone in the southern wastes, without food or water or a mount. He leaned against the unnatural heat of the wall for a few moments, breathing deeply to steady himself. Then he stood up, grasped his sense of direction with all the concentration he could muster, and started walking straight out into the ruined hall. His progress was slow. The uncertainty of his steps made him stagger repeatedly away from a true westward line, but he corrected the variations as best he could and kept going. Without the support of a wall, his balance grew worse at every stride. Before he had covered thirty yards, the floor reeled around him and he dropped to his knees. He had to clamp his throat shut to keep from whimpering. When he regained his feet, he heard quiet laughter. First one voice, then several. It had a cruel sound as if it were directed at him. It resonated slightly off the walls so that he could not locate it, but it seemed to come from somewhere ahead. He froze where he stood. Helplessly he prayed that the darkness would cover him. But a voice shattered that hope. Look here, brothers, it said, a man alone. Its utterance was awkward, thick and slavering, but Troy could understand it. He could hear the malice in the low chorus of laughter which answered it. Other voices spoke. A man, yes, slayer take him. Look, such pretty clothes, an enemy. Ha, look again, fool, that is no man. He has no eyes. Is it an Irvile? No, a man, I say, a man with no eyes. Here is some sport, brothers. All the voices laughed again. Troy did not stop to wonder how the speakers could see him. He turned, started to run back the way he had come. At once they gave pursuit. He could hear the slap of bare feet on stone, the sharp breathing. They overtook him swiftly. Something veered close to him, tripped him. As he fell, the running feet surrounded him. Go gently, brothers. No quick kill. He will be sport for us all. Do not kill him. Not kill. I want to kill. Kill and eat. The giant will want this one. After we sport. Why tell the giant, brothers? He is greedy. He takes our meat. Keep this one for ourselves, yes. Slayer, take the giant. His precious serviles. When there is danger, men must go first. Yes. Brothers, we will eat this meat. Troy heaved himself to his feet. Through the rapid chatter of the voices he heard go first, and almost fell again. If these creatures were the first of Flesh Harrower's army to enter the master place... But he pushed down the implications of that thought, and snatched out his sword. A sword! Ho, ho! Look, brothers, the man with no eyes wants to play. Play! Troy heard the lash of a whip. Cord flicked around his wrist. It caught and jerked, hauled him from his feet. Strong hands took his sword. Something kicked him in the chest, knocked him backward, but his breastplate protected him. One of the voices cried, Slayer! My foot! Fool! came the answer. There was laughter. Kill him! A metallic weapon clattered against his breastplate, fell to the ground. He scrambled for it in the dust, but sudden hands shoved him away. He recoiled and got to his feet again. He heard the whistle of the whip, 
and its cord lashed at his ankles, but this time he did not go down. Do not kill him yet. Where is the sport? Make him play. Yes, brothers, play. Play for us, man with no eyes. The whip burned around his neck. He staggered under the blow. The bewildering crossfire of voices went on. Play, slayer, take you. Sport for us. Why sport? I want meat, blood-wet meat. The giant feeds us sand. Play, I say. Are you blind, man with no eyes? Does the sun dazzle you? This jibe was met with loud laughter. But Troy stood still in his dismay. The sun, he thought numbly. Then he had chosen the wrong direction, east instead of west. He had walked right into these creatures. He wanted to scream, but he was past screaming. He could feel the light of his life going out. His hand shook as he tried to straighten his sunglasses. Dear God, he groaned. Numbly, as if he did not know what he was doing, he put his fingers to his lips and gave a shrill whistle. The whip coiled around his waist and whirled him to the ground. Play! The voices shouted raggedly together. But when he stumbled to his feet again, he heard the sound of hooves. And a moment later, Merrill's whinny cut through the gibbering voices. It touched Troy's heart like the call of a trumpet. He jerked up his head and his ears searched, trying to locate the Rani Hin. The voices changed to shouts of hunger as the hooves charged. Rani Hin! Kill it! Meat! Hands grabbed Troy. He grappled with a fist that held a knife. But then the noise of hooves rushed close to him. An impact flung his assailant away. He turned, tried to leap onto Merrill's back, but he only put himself in Merrill's path. The shoulder of the Rani Hin struck him, knocked him down. Then he could hear bare feet leaping to the attack. The whip cracked, knives swished. Merrill was forced away from him. Hooves skittered on the stone as the Rani Hin retreated. Howling triumphantly, the creatures gave chase. The sounds receded. Troy pushed himself to his feet. His heart thudded in his chest. Pain throbbed sharply in his face. The noises of pursuit seemed to indicate that he was being left alone. But he did not move. Concentrating all his attention, he tried to hear over the beat of his pain. For a long moment, the open space around him sounded empty, still. He waved his arms and touched nothing. But then he heard a sharp intake of breath. He was trembling violently. He wanted to turn and run, but he forced himself to hold his ground. He concentrated, bent all his alertness toward the sound. In the distance, the other creatures had lost Merrill. They were returning. He could hear them. But the near voice hissed, I kill you. You hurt my foot. Slayer, take them. You are my meat. Troy could sense the creature's approach. It loomed out of the blankness like a faint pressure on his face. The rasp of its breathing grew louder. With every step he felt its ambience more acutely. The tension was excruciating, but he held himself still. He waited. Interminable time passed. Suddenly he felt the creature bunching to spring. He snatched Main Thrall Rue's cord from his belt, looped it around the neck of his attacker, and jerked as the creature hit him. He put all his strength into the pull. The creature's leap toppled him, but he clung to the cord, heaved on it. The creature landed on top of him. He threw his weight around, got himself onto the creature. He kept pulling. Now he could feel the limpness of the body under him. But he did not release his hold. Straining on the cord, he banged the creature's head repeatedly against the stone. He was gasping for breath. Dimly he could hear the other creatures charging him. He did not release his hold. Then power crackled through the air. Flame burst around him. 
He heard shouts and the clash of swords. Bowstrings thrummed. Creatures screamed, ran, fell heavily. A moment later, hands lifted Troy. Rue's cord was taken from his rigid fingers. First half Darmarine cried, Warmark, Warmark, praise the Creator, you are safe. She was weeping with relief. People moved around him. He heard Lord Moram say, My friend, you have led us a merry chase. Without Merrill's aid, we would not have found you in time. The voice came disembodied out of the blankness. At first, Troy could not speak. His heart struggled through a crisis. It made him gasp so hard that he could barely stand. He sounded as if he were trying to sob. War, Mark, Amarine said. What has happened to you? Sun, he panted. Is the sun shining? The effort of articulation seemed to impale his heart. War, Mark? Ah, War, Mark! What has been done to you? The sun, he retched out. He was desperate to insist, but he could only stamp his foot uselessly. The sun stands overhead, Moram answered. We have survived the vortex and its creatures, but now Flesh Harrower's army enters Doriend or Koroshev. We must depart swiftly. Moram! Troy coughed hoarsely. Moram! Stumbling forward, he fell into the Lord's arms. Moram held him in a comforting grip. Without a word, the Lord supported him until some of his pain passed, and he began to breathe more easily. Then Moram said quietly, I see that you slew one of the despisers' birds. You have done well, my friend. Lord Colendril and I remain. Perhaps seventy of the blood guards survive. First half Tamarine has preserved a handful of her warriors. After the passing of the vortex, all the Ranihin returned. They saved many horses. My friend, we must go. Some of Moram's steadiness reached Troy, and he began to regain control of himself. He did not want to be a burden to the Lord. Slowly he drew back, stood on his own, covering his burned forehead with his hands as if he were trying to hide his eyelessness. He said, I've got to tell you the rest of my plan. May it wait. We must depart at once. Moram, Troy moaned brokenly, I can't see. Chapter 20 Garroting Deep Two days later, shortly after noon on the day before the dark of the moon, Lord Moram led the warward to Cravenhaw, the southmost edge of Garroting Deep. In noon heat, the army had swung, stumbling and lurching like a dying man around the foothills, and had marched northward to a quivering halt before the very lips of the fatal deep. The warriors stood on a wide, grassy plain, the first healthy green they had seen since leaving the South Plains. Ahead was the forest. Perhaps half a league away on either side, east and west, were mountains, steep and forbidding peaks like the jaws of the deep. And behind was the army of Moksha Flesh Harrower. The giant raver drove his forces savagely, Despite the delay at Dorian or Koryshev, he was now no more than two leagues away. That knowledge tightened Lord Moram's cold, weary dread. He had so little time in which to attempt Warmark Troy's plan. From this position, there were no escapes and no hopes, except the one Troy had envisioned. If Moram were not successful, successful soon, the war ward would be crushed between the raver and garroting deep. Yet he doubted that he could succeed at all, regardless of the time at his disposal. In a year or a score of years he might still fail. The demand was so great. Even the vortex of trepidation had not made him feel so helpless. Yet he shuddered when he thought of the vortex. Although Troy had saved virtually all the war ward, the men and women who had remained in the master place had paid heavily for their survival. Something in Lord Colendrill had been damaged by Flesh Harrower's attack. 
The strain of combat against bitter ill had humiliated him in some way, taught him a deep distrust of himself. He had not been able to resist the fear. Now his clear, soft eyes were clouded, pained. When he melded his thoughts with Lord Moram, he shared knowledge and concern, but not strength. He no longer believed in his strength. In her own way, first half Damarine suffered similarly. During the raver's onslaught, she had held the collapsing remains of her command together by the simple force of her courage. She had taken the terror of her warriors upon herself. Every time one of them fell under the power of the vortex or died in the talons of the birds, she had tightened her grip on the survivors. And after that, when the Sirocco had passed, she began a frantic search for Warmark Troy. The perverted, man-like creatures that rushed into the ruins, some with claws for fingers, others with cleft faces and limbs covered with suckers, still others with extra eyes or arms, all of them warped in some way by the power of the stone, steadily brought more and more of the city under their control. But she fought her way through them as if they were mere shades to haunt her while she hunted. The idea of following Merrill was hers. But the war mark's blindness was too much for her. The cause of it was clear. The slain bird's corrosive blood had ravaged his face, and that burning had undone the land's gift of sight. Neither of the lords had any hurt loam, rillen lure, or any other arts of healing with which to counteract the hurt. When she understood Troy's plight, she appeared to lose herself. Independent will deserted her. Until she rejoined the war ward, she followed Lord Moram's requests and instructions blankly, like a puppet from which all authority had evaporated. And when she saw Hiltmark Kwan again, she transferred herself to him. As she told him of Troy's plan, she was so numb that she did not even falter. The Warmark himself had said nothing more after describing his final strategy. He wrapped himself in his blindness and allowed Moram to place him on Merrill's back. He did not ask about Flesh Harrower's army, though only the speed of the Ranihin saved him and his companions from being trapped in the city. Despite the scream of frustration which roared after the riders, he carried himself like an invalid who had turned his face to the wall. And Lord Moram also suffered. After the battle of the Master Place, fatigue and dread had forced tenacious fingers into the crevices and crannies of his soul, so that he could not shake them off. Yet he helped the first half and Lord Colandrill as best he could. He knew that only time and victory could heal their wounds, but he absorbed those parts of their burdens which came within his reach and gave back to them all the consolation he possessed. There was nothing he could do to ease the shock which Amarine's report of the war mark's final plan gave Quan. As she spoke, the hilt mark's concern for her gave way to a livid horror on behalf of the warriors. His expression flared and he erupted, Madness! Every man and woman will be slain! Troy, what has become of you? By the seven! Troy! Warmark! He hesitated awkwardly before uttering his thought. Do you rave? My friend, he breathed, gripping Troy's shoulders. How can you meditate such folly? Troy spoke for the first time since he had left Dorian or Koroshev. I'm blind, he said in a hollow voice, as if that explained everything. I can't help it. He pulled himself out of Quan's grasp, sat down near the fire. Locating the flames by their heat, he hunched toward them like a man studying secrets in the coals. Quan turned to Moram. Lord, do you accept this madness? It will mean death for us all, and destruction for the land. Quan's protest made the Lord's heart ache. But before he could find words for any answer, Troy spoke suddenly. 
No, he doesn't, the warmark said. He doesn't actually think I'm a raver. Inner pain made his voice harsh. He thinks Fowl had a hand in summoning me, interfered with Patiaran somehow so that I showed up instead of somebody else who might have looked less friendly. He stressed the word looked, as if sight itself were inherently untrustworthy. Fowl wanted the lords to trust me because he knew what kind of man I am. Dear God, it doesn't matter how much I hate him. He knew I'm the kind of man who backs into corners where just being fallible is the same thing as treachery. But you forget that it isn't up to me anymore. I've done my part. I've put you where you haven't got any choice. Now Moram has to save you. It's on his head. Quan appeared torn between dismay for the war ward and concern for Troy. Even a lord may be defeated, he replied gruffly. I'm not talking about a lord, Troy rasped. I'm talking about Moram. In his weariness, Lord Moram ached to deny this, to refuse the burden. He said, Warmark, of course I will do all that lies within my strength. But if Lord Fowl has chosen you for the work of our destruction, ah, then, my friend, all aid will not avail. The burden of this plan will return to you at the last. No. Troy kept his face toward the fire, as if here reliving the acid burn which had blinded him. You've given your whole life to the land, and you're going to give it now. The despiser knows me well, Moram breathed. He ridicules me in my dreams. He could hear echoes of that belittling mirth, but he held them at a distance. Do not mistake me, Warmark. I do not flinch this burden. I accept it. On Kevin's watch I made my promise, and you dared this plan because of that promise. You have not done ill, but I must speak what is in my heart. You are the Warmark. I believe that the command of this fate must finally return to you. I'm blind. There's nothing more I can do. Even Fowl can't ask any more of me. The heat of the fire made the burn marks on his face lurid. He held his hands clasped together, and his knuckles were white. In distress, Quan gazed at Moram with eyes that asked if he had been wrong to trust Troy. No, Lord Moram answered. Do not pass judgment upon this mystery until it is complete. Until that time, we must keep faith. Very well, Quan sighed heavily. If we have been betrayed, we have no recourse now. To flee into the desert will accomplish only death. And Craven Hall is a place to fight and die like any other. The war ward must not turn against itself when the last battle is near. I will stand with Warmark Troy. Then he went to his blankets to search for sleep among his fears. Amarine followed his example dumbly, leaving Colindrill and Moram with Troy. Colindrill soon dropped into slumber, and Moram was too worn to remain awake. But Troy sat up by the embers of the campfire. As the Lord's eyes closed, Troy was still huddled toward the flames like a cold cipher, seeking some kind of remission for its frigidity. Apparently the Warmark found an answer during the long watch. When Lord Moram awoke the next morning, he found Troy erect, standing with his arms folded across his breastplate. The Lord studied him closely, but could not discern what kind of answer Troy had discovered. Gently, he greeted the blind man. At the sound of Moram's voice, Troy turned. He held his head with a slight sideward tilt, as if that position helped him focus his hearing. The old half-smile which he had habitually worn during his years in Revelstone was gone, effaced from his lips. Call Quan, he said flatly. I want to talk to him. 
Quan was nearby. He heard Troy and approached at once. Fixing the hilt mark with his hearing, Troy said, Guide me. I'm going to review the war ward. Troy, my friend, Quan murmured, do not torment yourself. Troy stood stiffly, rigid with exigency. I'm the war mark. I want to show my warriors that blindness isn't going to stop me. Boram felt a hot premonition of tears, but he held them back. He smiled crookedly at Quan, nodded his answer to the old veteran's question. Quan saluted Troy, bravely ignoring the war mark's inability to see him. Then he took Troy's arm and led him away to the Eo ward. Lord Moram watched their progress among the warriors, watched Quan's respectful pain guiding Troy's erect helplessness from Eo man to Eo man. He endured the sight as best he could and blinked down his own heart hurt. Fortunately, the ordeal did not last long. Fresh Harrower's pursuit did not allow Troy time for a full review of the war ward. Soon Moram was mounted on his Ranahin, Drinny, son of Hinneril, and riding on toward Cravenhaw. He spent most of that day watching over the war mark. But the next morning, while the war ward made its final approach to Garroting Deep, he was forced to turn his attention to his task. He had to plan some way in which to keep his promise. He melded his thoughts with Lord Colendrill, and together they searched through their combined knowledges and intuitions for some key to Moram's dilemma. In his dread, he hoped to gain courage from the melding, but the ache of Colendrill's self-distrust denied him. Instead of receiving strength, Moram gave it. With Colendrill's help, he prepared an approach to his task, arranged a series of possible answers according to their peril and likelihood of success. But by noon he had found nothing definitive. Then he ran out of time. The war board staggered to a halt at the very brink of Garroting Deep. There, face to face with the one forest's last remaining consciousness, Lord Moram began to taste the full gall of his inadequacy. The deep's dark, atavistic rage left him effectless. He felt like a man with no fingers. The first trees were within a dozen yards of him. Like irregular columns, they appeared suddenly out of the ground, with no shrubs or bushes leading up to them, and no underbrush cluttering the green sward on which they stood. They were sparse at first. As far back as he could see, they did not grow thickly enough to close out the sunlight. Yet a shadow deepened on them. Mounting dimness spurned the sunlight. In the distance, the benighted will of the forest became an almost tangible refusal of passage. He felt that he was peering into a chasm. The idea that any bargain could be made with such a place seemed to be madness, vanity woven of dream stuff. For a long time he only stood before the deep and stared, with a groan of cold dread on his soul. But Troy showed no hesitation. When Quan told him where he was, he swung Merrill around and began issuing orders. All right, Hiltmark, he barked. Let's get ready for it. Food for everyone. Finish off the supplies, but make it fast. After that, move the warriors back beyond Bowshot and form an arc around Lord Moram. Make it as wide as possible, but keep it thick. I don't want Flesh Harrower to break through. Lord Colendrill, I think you should fight with the war board. And Quan, I'll speak to the warriors while they're eating. I'll explain it all. Very well, Bormark. Quan sounded distant, withdrawn into the recessed stronghold of his courage, and the lines of his face were taut with resolution. He returned Troy's blind salute, then turned and gave his own orders to Armorine. Together they went to make the war ward's final preparations. Troy pulled Merrill around again. He tried to face Moram, but missed by several feet. Maybe you'd better get started, he said. You haven't got much time. I will wait until you have spoken to the war ward. Sadly, Moram saw Troy grimace with vexation at the discovery that he had misjudged the Lord's position. I need strength. 
I must seek it a while. Troy nodded brusquely and turned away as if he meant to watch the war ward's preparations. Together they waited for Quan's signal. Lord Colindrill remained with them long enough to say, Moram, the High Lord had no doubt of your fitness for the burden of these times. She is no ordinary judge of persons. My brother, your faith will suffice. His voice was gentle, but it implicitly expressed his belief that his own faith did not suffice. When he walked away from the deep to take his stand with the warriors, he left Moram wrestling with insistent tears. A short time later, Quan reported that the war ward was ready to hear Troy. The war mark asked Quan to guide him to a place from which he could speak, and they trotted away together. Lord Moram walked after them. He wished to hear the war mark's speech. Troy stopped within the wide-seated arc of warriors. He did not need to ask for silence. Except for the noises of eating, the warriors were still, too exhausted to talk. They had marched and ached in blank silence for the last three days, and now they chewed their food with a kind of aghast lifelessness. Ate as if compelled by an old habit, unassoiled by any remaining endurance, desire. Moving their jaws, staring out of moistureless eyes, they looked like dusty skeletons. Bare, dry bones animated by some obsession not their own. Moram could not hold back his tears. They ran down his jaw and spattered like warm pain on his hands where he held his staff. Yet he was glad that Troy could not see what his plans had done to the war ward. Warmark Heil Troy faced the warrior squarely, held up his head as if he were offering his burns for inspection. Sitting on Merrill's back, he was stiff with discipline, a rigid refusal of his own objection. As he began to speak, his voice was hoarse with conflicting impulses, but he grew steadier as he continued. Warriors, he said abruptly, we are here for victory or defeat. This is the end. Today the outcome of this war will be decided. Our position is desperate, but you know that. Flesh Harrower is only a league away by now. We're caught between his army and Garreting Deep. I want you to know that this is not an accident. We didn't panic and run here out of fear. We didn't come here because Flesh Harrower forced us. You aren't victims. We came here on my order. I made the decision. When I was on Kevin's watch, I saw how big Flesh Harrower's army is. It's so big that we wouldn't have a chance in Doom's retreat. So I made the decision. I brought us here. I believe we're going to win today. We are going to cause the destruction of that horde. I believe it. I brought you here because I believe it. Now let me tell you how we're going to do it. He paused for a moment and became even stiffer, more erect, as he braced himself for what he had to say. Then he went on. We are going to fight that army here for one reason. Lord Moram needs time. He's going to make this plan of mine work and we have to keep him safe until he's ready. When he's ready, Troy seemed to clench himself, we're going to run like hell into Garreting Deep. If he expected an outcry, he was surprised. The warriors were too weak to protest. But a rustle of anguish passed among them, and Moram could see horror on many faces. Troy went on promptly. I know how bad that sounds. No one has ever survived the deep. No one has ever returned. I know all that. But foul is hard to beat. Our only chance is something that seems impossible. I believe we won't be killed. While we fight, Lord Moram is going to summon Caroyle Wildwood, the Forestall. And Caroyle Wildwood is going to help us. He's going to give us free passage through Garreting Deep. He's going to defeat Flesh Harrower's army. I believe this. I want you to believe it. 
It will work. The Forestall has no reason to hate us. You know that. And he has every reason to hate Flesh Harrower. That giant is a raver. But the only way Carroyal Wildwood can get at Flesh Harrower is to give us free passage. If we run into Garroting Deep, the Flesh Harrower sees that we aren't harmed. Then he'll follow us. He hates us, and he hates the Deep too much to pass up a chance like this. It will work. The only problem is to summon the Forestall, and that is up to Lord Moram. He paused again, weighing his words before he said, Many of you have known Lord Moram longer than I have. You know what kind of man he is. He'll succeed. You know that. Until he succeeds, the only thing we have to do is fight. Keep him alive while he works. That's all. I know how tough it's going to be for you. I... I hear how tired you are. But you are warriors. You will find the strength. I believe it. Whatever happens, I'll be proud to fight with you. And I won't be afraid to lead you into garroting deep. You are the true preservers of the land. He stopped, waiting for some kind of answer. The warriors gave no cheers or shouts or cries. The extravagant grip of their exhaustion kept them silent. But together they heaved themselves to their feet. Twelve thousand men and women stood to salute the war mark. He seemed to hear their movement and understand it. He saluted them once, rigidly. Then he turned his proud Ronnie in and went trotting back toward where he had left Lord Moram. He caught Moram by surprise, and the Lord failed to intercept him. He moved as if he were held erect by the stiffness of extreme need. His voice rocked as he said to the empty air where Moram had been, I hope you understand what'll happen if you fail. We don't have any choice. We'll still have to go into the deep. And pray the Forestall doesn't kill us until Flesh Harrower follows. We'll all die that way, but maybe the Raver will too. Moram hastened toward Troy, but Terrell was closer to the war mark, and he spoke before Moram could stop him. That we will not permit, he said dispassionately. It is suicide. We do not speak of the war ward, but we are the blood guard. We will not permit the lords to enact their own death. We fail to prevent High Lord Kevin's self-destruction. We will not fail again. I hear you, Moram replied sharply. But that moment has not yet come. First, I must work. Turning to Troy, he said, My friend, will you remain with me while I make this attempt? I need... I have need of support. Troy seemed to totter on Merrill's back, but he caught hold of the Ronihan's mane, steadied himself. Just... Tell me if there's anything I can do. He reached out his hand, and when Moram clasped it, he slipped down from Merrill's back. Moram gripped his hand for a moment, then released him. The Lord looked over at the war ward, saw that it was preparing to meet Flesh Harrower's charge. He turned his attention to the deep. Dread constricted his heart. He was afraid that Carroyal Wildwood would simply strike him where he stood for the affront of his call, strike all the army. But he was still his own master. He stepped forward, raised his staff high over his head, and began the ritual appeal to the woods. Hail, garroting deep, forest of the one forest, enemy of our enemies. Garroting deep, hail. We are the lords, foes of your enemies, and learners of the Lillian Rill lore. We must pass through. Hearken, Caroyle Wildwood. We hate the axe and flame which hurt you. Your enemies are our enemies. Never have we brought edge of axe or flame of fire to touch you, nor ever shall. 
Forestall, hearken, let us pass. There was no answer. His voice fell echoless on the trees and grass. Nothing moved or replied in the dark depths. He strained his senses to listen and look for any sign, but none came. When he was sure of the silence, he repeated the ritual. Again there was no reply. After a third appeal, the silent gloom of the deep seemed to increase, to grow more profound and ominous as he beseeched it. Through the forest's unresponsiveness, he heard the first gleeful shout of Flesh Harrower's army as it caught sight of the war ward. The hungry cry multiplied his dread. His knuckles whitened as he resisted it. Planting his staff firmly on the grass, he tried another approach. While the sun arced through the middle of the afternoon, Lord Moron strove to make himself heard in the heart of Garroting Deep. He used every forestall name which had been preserved in the lore of the land. He wove appeals and chants out of every invocation or summoning known to the lore's rot. He bent familiar forms away from their accustomed usage, hoping that they would unlock the silence. He even took the summoning song which had called Covenant to the land, altered it to fit his need, and sang it into the deep. It had no effect. The forest remained impenetrable, answerless. And behind him the last battle of the war ward began. As Flesh Harrower's hordes rushed at them, the warriors raised one tattered cheer like a brief pennant of defiance. But then they fell silent, saved the vestiges of their strength for combat. With their weapons ready, they faced the ravening that charged toward them out of the waste. The raver's army crashed murderously into them. Firing their arrows at close range, they attempted to crack the momentum of the charge. But the horde's sheer numbers swept over slain irviles and cave whites and other creatures, trampled them underfoot, drove into the war ward. Its front lines crumbled at the onslaught. Thousands of ill beasts broke into its core, but Hiltmark Quan rallied one flank, and first half Dormarine shored up the other. For the first time since she had left Dorian or Korishev, she seemed to remember herself. Throwing off her enervation of will, she brought her eel ward to the aid of the front lines, and Lord Colendrill held his ground in the army's center. Verding his staff about his head, he rained blue, fiery force in all directions. The creatures gave way before him. Scores of unorganized Irviles fell under his fire. Then Quan and Amarine reached him from either side. From a place deep within them, beyond their most bereft exhaustion, the men and women of the land brought up the strength to fight back. Faced with the raw malevolence of Lord Fowl's perverse creations, the warriors found that they could still resist. Bone-deep love and abhorrence exalted them. Passionately they hurled themselves at the enemy. Hundreds of them fell in swaths across the ground, but they threw back the raver's first assault. Flesh Harrower roared his orders. The creatures drew back to regroup. Irviles hurried to form a wedge against Lord Colendrill, and the rest of the army shifted brought cave whites forward to bear the brunt of the next charge. In an effort to disrupt these preparations, Quan launched an attack of his own. Warriors leaped after the retreating beasts. Lord Colendrill and one Eoward ran to prevent the formation of the Irvile Wedge. For several furious moments, they threw the black demon dim spawn into chaos. But then the giant raver struck, used his stone to support the Irviles. Several blasts of emerald fire forced Colendrill to give ground. At once the wedge pulled itself together. The Eoward had to retreat. It was a grim and silent struggle. After the first hungry yell of the attack, Flesh Harrower's army fought with dumb, maniacal ferocity, and the warriors had no strength for shouts or cries. Only the tumult of feet and the clash of weapons and the moans of the maimed and dying and the barking of orders punctuated the mute engagement. 
Yet Lord Moron felt these clenched sounds like a deafening din. They seemed to echo off his dread. The effort to ignore the battle and concentrate on his work squeezed sweat out of his bones, made his pulse hammer like a prisoner against his temples. When traditional names and invocations failed to bring the forestall, he began using signs and arcane symbols. He drew pentacles and circles on the grass with his staff, set fires burning within them, waved eldritch gestures over them. He murmured labyrinthian chants under his breath. All were useless. The silence of the deep's gloom sounded like laughter in his ears. Yet the sounds of killing came steadily nearer. All the valiance of the warriors was not enough. They were driven back. Troy heard the retreat also. At last he could no longer contain himself. Dear God, Moram, he whispered urgently. They are being butchered. Moram spun on Troy, raging. Do you think I am unaware? But when he beheld the war mark, he stopped. He could see Troy's torment. The sting of sweat made the war mark's burns flame garishly. They throbbed with pain. His hands groped aimlessly about him as if he were lost. He was blind. For all his power to plan and conceive, he was helpless to execute even the simplest of his ideas. Lord Moram wrenched his anger into another channel. With its strength, he made his decision. Very well, my friend, he breathed heavily. There are other attempts to be made, but perhaps only one is perilous enough to have some hope of success. Stand ready. You must take my place if I fall. Legends say that the song I mean to sing is fatal. As he strode forward, he felt a new calm. Confronting his dread, he could see that it was only fear. He had met and mastered its kindred when a raver had laid hands on him, and the knowledge he had gained then could save the war ward now. With peril in his eyes, he went toward the deep until he was among the first trees. There he ignited his staff and raised it over his head, carefully holding it away from any of the branches. Then he began to sing. The words came awkwardly to his lips, and the accents of the melody seemed to miss their beats. He was singing a song to which no former lord had ever given utterance. It was one of the dark mysteries of the land, forbidden because of the hazard it carried. Yet the words of the song were clear and simple. Their peril lay elsewhere. According to Kevin's lore, they belonged, like cherished treasure, to the forestalls of the one forest. The forestalls slew all mortals who profaned those words. Nevertheless, Lord Moram lifted up his voice and sang them boldly. Branches spread and tree trunks grow through rain and heat and snow and cold. Though wide world's winds untimely blow and earthquakes rock, and cliff unseal. My leaves grow green and seedlings bloom. Since days before the earth was old and time began its walk to doom, the forest's worlds bear rock and eel. Forbidding dusty waste and death, I am the land's creator's hold. I inhale all expiring breath and breathe out life to bind and heal. As his singing faded into the distance, he heard the reply. Its music far surpassed his own. It seemed to fall from the branches like leaves bedewed with rare melody, to fall and flutter around him so that he stared as if he were dazzled. The voice had a light, high, clear sound, like a splashing brook, but the power it implied filled him with awe. But axe and fire leave me dead. I know the hate of hands grown bold. Depart to save your heart saps red. My hate knows neither rest nor wheel. A shimmer of music rippled his sight. When it cleared, 
he saw Carroyle Wildwood walking toward him across the greensward. The forestall was a tall man with a long white beard and flowing white hair. He wore a robe of purest samite and carried a gnarled wooden rod like a scepter in the crook of one arm. A garland of purple and white orchids about his neck only heightened his austere dignity. He appeared out of the gloaming of the deep as if he had stepped from behind a veil, and he moved like a monarch between the trees. They nodded to him as he passed. With every step he scattered droplets of melody about him as if his whole person were drenched in song. His sparkling voice softened the severity of his mien, but his eyes were not soft. From under his thick white brows a silver light shone from orbs without pupil or iris, and his glances had the force of physical impact. Still humming the refrain of his song, he approached Lord Moram. His gaze held the Lord motionless until they were almost within arm's reach of each other. Moram felt himself being probed. The sound of music continued, and some time passed before he realized that the forestall was speaking to him, asking him, Who dares taint my song? With an effort, Lord Moram set aside his oar to answer, Caroyle Wildwood, forestall and servant of the tree soul, please pardon my presumption. I intend no offense or taint, but my need is urgent surpassing both fear and caution. I am Moram, son of Variol, lord of the Council of Revelstone, and a defender of the land in tree and rock. I seek a boon, Caroyle Wildwood. A boon? The forestall mused musically. You bring a fire among my trees, and then ask a boon? You are a fool, Moram, son of Variol. I make no bargains with men. I grant no boons to any creature with knowledge of blade or flame. Be gone. He did not raise his voice or sharpen his song, but the might of his command made Moram stagger. Forestall, hear me. Lord Moram strove to keep his voice calm. I have used this fire only to gain your notice. Extinguishing his staff, he lowered it to the ground and gripped it as a brace against the forestall's refusal. I am a lord, a servant of the earth power. Since the lords began, all have sworn all their might to the preservation of land and forest. We love and honor the wood of the world. I have done no harm to these trees and never shall, though you refuse my boon, and condemn the land to fire and death. Humming as if to himself, Caroyle Wildwood said, I know nothing of lords, they are nothing to me, but I know men, mortals, the ritual of desecration is not forgotten in the deep. You hear me, Carroyle Wildwood. Moram could feel the sounds of battle beating against his back. But he remembered what he had learned of the history of the one forest, and remained steady, serene. I do not ask a boon for which I can make no return. Forestall, I offer you a raver. At the word raver... Carroyle Wildwood changed. The dewy, glistening aura of his music took on an inflection of anger. His eyes darkened. Their silver light gave way to thunderheads. Mist spread from his orbs and drifted upward through his eyebrows. But he said nothing, and Moram continued, The people of the land fight a war against the despiser, the ancient tree ravager. His great army has driven us here, and the last battle now rages in Cravenhaw. Without your aid, we will surely be destroyed. But with our death, the land becomes defenseless. 
Then the tree ravager will make war upon all the forest, upon the trees in beautiful Andalane, upon slumbering grimmered hoar and restless moran moss. In the end, he will attack the deep and you. He must be defeated now. The forest all appeared unmoved by this appeal. Instead of replying to it, he hummed darkly, You spoke of a raver. The army which destroys us even now is commanded by a raver, one of the three decimators of the one forest. Give me a token that you speak the truth. Lord Moram did not dare hesitate, though the ground he trod was completely trackless, unmapped by any lore but his own intuition, he answered promptly, He is Moksha Raver, also named Jahanam and Flesh Harrower. In ages long past, he and Turiya, his brother, taught the despising of trees to the once friendly demon dim. Samadhi, his brother, guided the monarch of Doriendor Koreshev when that mad king sought to master the life and death of the one forest. Moksha Raver, Caroyle Wildwood trilled lightly, dangerously. I have a particular hunger for ravers. Their might is greatly increased now. They share the unnatural power of the ill earth stone. I care nothing for that, the forestall replied almost brusquely. But you offered a raver to me. How can that be done when he defeats you even now? The sounds of battle came inexorably nearer as the war ward was driven back. Lord Moram heard less combat and more slaughter with every passing moment, and he could feel Warmark Troy panting behind him. With all his hard-won serenity, he answered, That is the boon I ask, Caroyle Wildwood. I ask safe passage for all my people through garroting deep. This boon will deliver Moksha Raver into your hands. He and all his army, all his Irviles and cave whites and creatures, will be yours. When the Raver sees that we flee into the deep and are not destroyed, he will follow. He will believe that you are weak, or that you have passed away. His hatred for us and for the trees will drive him and all his force into your domain. A moment that throbbed urgently in Moram's ears passed, while Caroyle Wildwood considered. The battle noise seemed to say that soon there would be nothing of the war ward left to save. But Moram faced the forestall and waited. At last the forestall nodded. It is a worthy bargain, he sang slowly. The trees are eager to fight again. I am prepared, but there is a small price to be paid for my help and for the tainting of my song. The upsurge of Moram's hope suddenly gave way to fear, and he spun to try to stop Warmark Troy. But before he could shout a warning, Troy said fervidly, Then I'll pay it. I'll pay anything. My army is being slaughtered. Moram winced at the irrevocable promise, tried to protest. But the forestall sang keenly, Very well. I accept your payment. Bring your army cautiously among the trees. Troy reacted instantly. He whirled, leaped for Merrill's back. Some instinct guided him. He landed astride the Rani Hin as securely as if he could see. At once he went galloping toward the battle, yelling with all his strength, Quan, retreat, retreat! The war ward was collapsing as he shouted. The ranks of the warriors were broken, and flesh harrowers creatures ranged bloodily among them. More than two-thirds of the Eo ward had already fallen. But something in Troy's command galvanized the warriors for a final exertion. Breaking away, they turned and ran. 
Their sudden flight opened a brief gap between them and Flesh Harrower's army. At once Lord Colendrill set himself to widen the gap. Protected by a circle of bloodguard, he unleashed a lightning fire that caught in the grass and crackled across the front of the foe. His blast did little damage, but it caused the raver's forces to hesitate one instant in their pursuit. Using that instant, he followed the warriors. Together the survivors, hardly more than ten year ward, ran straight toward Moram. When he saw them coming, Lord Moram went out to meet Troy. He pulled the war mark from Merrill's back. It was not safe to ride under the branches of the deep, took his arm and guided him toward the trees. The fleeing warriors were almost on their heels when Moram and Troy strode into garroting deep. Carroyal Wildwood had vanished, but his song remained. It seemed to resonate lightly off every leaf in the forest. Moram could feel it piloting him, and he followed it implicitly. Behind him he heard the warriors consummating their exhaustion in a last rush toward sanctuary or death. He heard Quan shouting as if from a great distance that all survivors were now among the trees. But he did not look back. The forestall's song exercised a fascination over him. Gripping Troy's arm and peering steadily ahead into the gloom, he moved at a brisk walk along the path of the melody. With Colindrill, Troy, Quan, Amarine, two-score bloodguard, all the Ranihin, and more than four thousand warriors, Lord Moram passed for a time out of the world of humankind. Slowly the music transmuted his conscious alertness, drew him into a kind of trance. He felt that he was still aware of everything, but that now nothing touched him. He could see the onset of evening in the altered dimness of the deep, but he felt no passage of time. In openings between the trees he could see the western mountains, by the changing positions of the peaks, he could gauge his speed. He appeared to be moving faster than a galloping Ranihin, but he felt no exertion or strain of travel. The breath of the song wafted him ahead, as if he and his companions were being inhaled by the deep. It was a weird, dreamy passage, a soul journey, full of speed he could not experience, and events he could not feel. Night came. The moon was completely dark. But he did not lose sight of his way. Some hint of light in the grass and leaves and song made his path clear to him, and he went on confidently, untouched by any need for rest. The forestall's song released him from mortality, wrapped him in careless peace. Sometime during the darkness he heard the change of the song. The alteration had no effect on him, but he understood its meaning. Though the forest swallowed every other sound, so that no howls or screams or cries reached his ears, he knew that Flesh Harrower's army was being destroyed. The song described ages of waiting hate, of grief over vast tracts of kindred lost, Ages of slow rage, which climbed through the sap of the woods until every limb and leaf shared it, lived it, ached to act. And through that melodic narration came whispers of death, as roots and boughs and trunks moved together to crush and rend. Against the immense deep, even Flesh Harrower's army was small and defenseless, a paltry insult hurled against an ocean. The trees brushed aside the power of the Irviles and the strength of the cave whites and the mad, cornered, desperate fear of all the other creatures. Led by Caroyal Wildwood's song, they simply throttled the invaders. Flames were stamped out. Blade-wielders were slain. Lore and force were overwhelmed. Then the trees drank the blood and ate the bodies, eradicated every trace of the enemy in an apotheosis of ancient and exquisite fury. When the song resumed its former placid wafting, it seemed to breathe grim satisfaction and victory. 
soon after that, Moram thought it was soon, a rumble like thunder passed over the woods. At first he thought that he was hearing Flesh Harrower's death struggle, but then he saw that the sound had an entirely different source. Far ahead into the west, some terrible violence occurred in the mountains. Red fires spouted from one part of the range. After every eruption, a concussion rolled over the deep, and a coruscating exhaust paled the night sky. But Moram was immune to it. He watched it with interest, but the song wrapped him in its enchantments and preserved him from all care. And he felt no concern when he realized that the war ward was no longer behind him. Except for Lord Colandrill, Troy, Amarine, Hiltmark Kwan, and two blood guard, Terrell and Morrill, he was alone. But he was not anxious. The song assuaged him with peace and trust. It led him onward and still onward through a measureless night into the dawn of a new day. With the return of light, he found that he was moving through a woodland profuse with purple and white orchids. Their soft, pure colors fell in with the music, as if they were the notes Caroyle Wildwood sang. They folded Moram closely in the consolation of the melody. With a wide, unconscious smile, he let himself go, as if the current which carried him were an anodyne for all his hurts. His strange speed was more apparent now. Already through gaps in the overhanging foliage, he could see the paired spires of Melancholian Skyweir, the tallest peaks of the western mountains. He could see the high, sheer plateau of Riven Rock as the struggle it concealed continued. Eruptions and muffled booms came echoing from the depths of the mountain, and red bursts of force struck the sky at irregular intervals. But still he was untouched. His speed, his exhilarating easy swiftness, filled his heart with gay glee. He had covered thirty or forty leagues since entering the deep. He felt ready to walk that way forever. But the day passed with the same timeless evanescence that had borne him through the night. Soon the sun was close to setting, yet he had no sense of duration no weary or hungry physical impression that he had travelled all day. Then the song changed again. Gradually it no longer floated him forward. The end of his wafting filled him with quiet sadness, but he accepted it. The thunders and eruptions of Riven Rock were now almost due southwest of him. He judged that he and his companions were nearing the Black River. The song led him straight through the forest to a high, bald hill that stood up out of the woodland like a wen of barrenness. Beyond it, he could hear a rush of water, the Black River. But the hill itself caught his attention, restored some measure of his self-awareness. The soil of the hill was completely lifeless, as if in past ages it had been drenched with too much death ever to bloom again and just below its crown on the near side stood two rigid trees like sentinels, witnesses, ten yards or more apart. They were as dead as the hill, blackened, bereft of limbs and leaves, sapless. Each dead trunk had only one bough left. Fifty feet above the ground, the trees reached toward each other, and their limbs interwove to form a crossbar between them. This was Gallows How, the ancient slaying place of the Forestoles. Here, according to the legends of the land, Caroyle Wildwood and his brethren had held their assizes in the long past ages when the one forest still struggled for survival. Here the ravers who had come within the Forestoles' grasp had been executed. Now Moksha flesh harrower hung from the gibbet. Black fury congested his face. His swollen tongue protruded like contempt between his teeth, and his eyes stared emptily. A rictus of hate strained and stretched all his muscles. His dying frenzy had been so extravagant that many of his blood vessels had ruptured, staining his skin with dark hemorrhages. 
as Lord Moram gazed upward through the thickening dusk, he felt suddenly tired and thirsty. Several moments passed before he noticed that Caroyle Wildwood was nearby. The forest all stood to one side of the hill, singing quietly, and his eyes shone with a red and silver light. At Moram's side, Warmark Troy stirred as if he were awakening, and asked dimly, What is it? What do you see? Moram had to swallow several times before he could find his voice. It is flesh harrower. The forestall has slain him. A sharp intensity crossed Troy's face, as if he were straining to see. Then he smiled. Thank God. It is a worthy bargain, Caroyle Wildwood sang. I know that I cannot slay the spirit of a raver. But it is a great satisfaction to kill the flesh. He is garroted. His eyes flared redly for a moment, then faded toward silver again. Therefore do not think that I have rescinded my word. Your people are unharmed. The presence of so many faithless mortals disturb the trees. To shorten their discomfort, I have sent your people out of Garroting Deep to the north, but because of the bargain and the price yet to be paid, I have brought you here. Behold the retribution of the forest. Something in his high, clear voice made Moram shudder, but he remembered himself enough to ask, What has become of the raver's stone? It was a great evil, the forest all hummed severely. I have destroyed it. Quietly, Lord Moram nodded. That is well. Then he tried to focus his attention on the matter of Carroyle Wildwood's price. He wanted to argue that Troy should not be held to the bargain. The Warmark had not understood what was being asked of him. But while Moram was still searching for words, Terrell distracted him. Silently, the blood guard pointed away upriver. The night was almost complete. Only open starlight and the glow of Caroyle Wildwood's eyes illumined Gallows Howe. But when the Lord followed Terrell's indication, he saw two different lights. Far in the distance... Riven Rock's fiery holocaust was visible. The violence there seemed to be approaching its climacteric. The fires spouted furiously, and dark thunder rolled over the deep as if great cliffs were cracking. The other light was much closer. A small, grave, white gleam shone through the trees between Moram and the river. As he looked at it, it moved out of sight beyond the howl. Someone was travelling through garroting deep along the Black River. An intuition clutched Lord Moram, and at once he found he was afraid. Glimpses and visions which he had forgotten during the past days returned to him. Quickly he turned to the forestall. Who comes? Have you made other bargains? If I have, sang the forestall, they are no concern of yours. But these two pass on sufferance. They have not spoken to me. I allow them because the light they bear presents no peril to the trees, and because they hold a power which I must respect. I am bound by the law of creation. Melancholian, Moram breathed. Creator, preserve us. Catching hold of Troy's arm, he started up the bald hill. His companions hastened after him. He passed the gibbet, gained the crest of the howl, and looked down beyond it at the river. Two men climbed the hill toward him from the river bank. One of them held a shining stone in his right hand and supported his comrade with his left arm. They moved painfully, as if they ascended against a weight of barrenness. 
When they were near the hilltop, in full view of all Moram's company, they stopped. Slowly, Bonor held up the oar crest so that it lighted the crest of the howl. With a nod, he acknowledged the lords. When Thomas Covenant realized that all the people on the hill were watching him, he pushed away from Bonor's support, stood on his own. The exertion cost him a sharp effort. As he stood, he wavered unsteadily. In the Yorkrest light, his forehead gleamed atrociously. His eyes held a sightless stare, a stare without object, and yet of such intensity that his eyes appeared to be crossed, as if he were so conscious of his own duplicities that he could not see singly. His hands clenched each other against his chest. But then a fierce blast from Riven Rock struck him, and he almost lost his balance. He was forced to reach his half-hand toward Bonor. The movement bared his left fist. On his wedding finger, the argent ring throbbed hotly.